The beginning of this story was laid in the expanses of Australia, where there was a furious devastation after a bloody battle. The man carefully placed his combat colleague on the ground. The last glimmers of life slowly left the girl. Tears came to the boy's eyes. He asked his colleague to hold on a little longer because help was about to arrive. But it was already too late and the girl understood it. The woman's last request was for her leader to take her teleportation power with him. The girl knew who her leader really was, but these words hit the man hard. Even on the verge of death, the girl found the strength to smile warmly. She asked that the leader survive by taking her power. The girl exhaled her last breath and sank into oblivion. The man proceeded to fulfill his colleague's last request and began to absorb her teleportation power. The guy pulled the girl's strength harder and harder. It seemed as if he was devouring her soul. In the end, it was all over. The man sat silently, slightly bent over the body of his dead colleague. Remains of magic flew around like pieces of a broken soul. With a heavy heart, the boy left the dead woman's body and went on his way. The girl's last words echoed in his head about her knowing the truth about his ability to absorb the abilities of other metahumans. Standing in the middle of the desert that was once a city, Song Wu swore to him that he would stay alive no matter what. Song Wu stood a little longer, adjusting to the wave he needed, and the next moment he had already dissolved into the air. Song Wu's life, like the rest of the people in his world, suddenly changed when a mysterious hole appeared in the night sky. A huge number of different monsters began to descend on the human world, bringing with them death and destruction. As a result of the invasion of monsters, many people were left without homes. Most remained orphans. There were many wounded, but even more many died. All the powerful countries tried to repel the invasion by throwing all possible forces to protect the planet, but it was all in vain. It didn't matter how hard the leaders of the states resisted the monsters. It seemed that they only made things worse for themselves, leaving only stones in the cities after their attacks. The enemies did not care about these unsuccessful attempts of people to defend themselves. Like an unstoppable stream of water, the monsters moved further and further across the planet, destroying everything in their path. Monsters chased all people. Those who survived hid wherever they could. Hunger and fear began to reign in the world. It seemed that the end of everything was not far off. Three years have passed since the invasion, and that's it. When it seemed that there was no hope left for the rescue, creatures came to the rescue, which over time began to be called metahumans. Metahumans became humanity's first and only hope for life. An unstoppable stream of metahumans began to destroy all monsters, driving them as far as possible. There were more and more people endowed with special abilities, but no one knew the true reason for their appearance. Metahumans combined their capabilities and created a safe zone, which they named the city. Inside the zone, people could enjoy life again, as it was before the invasion. Nevertheless, the danger zones still continued to exist. The dangerous areas were nicknamed the desert. The threat to humanity has not disappeared. Outside the walls of the safe zone, people still lived, continuing their existence alongside brutality and anarchy, suffering from fear in their hearts. The world was divided into safe and dangerous zones, in black and white. Meanwhile, in the danger zone, risking their lives, a group of people advanced through a strong blizzard. One of the people turned around and asked the guide how long they still had to go to their destination. The stranger was covered with a hood, hiding his identity. He put on his hood as a stranger and revealed his face to people. He was by no means an ordinary person, as he informed the refugees. Kim Sung Woo appeared in front of the people and told them his name. All around was a frenzied devastation that only reminded of a long-vanished civilization. A group of people, led by Song Wu, found themselves in the very center of the Copper Spider's lands. This was clearly evidenced by the countless remains of people hanging wrapped in webs. Song Wu gave a little tutorial on hunting spiders. Spiders were fairly easy prey. The main goal of the hunter was to remove the body from the monster by first cutting off all the spider's limbs. Song Wu only warned that you need to be careful with the front legs of the spiders because they attack with them. The men listened intently, but some were slowly becoming afraid. Song Wu tried to talk about the hunting methods in more detail, but they didn't want to listen to him anymore, and it made more than one of the meta-humans a little angry. 
While the men were talking, six shining eyes stared at them from the dark shadows of the caves. The spider wasted no time pouncing on people. Song Wu quickly reacted to the attack and even managed to pull one of the metahumans away from the web, saving his life. A healthy spider, clinging to the walls of the cave with its paws, towered over a group of people. The men raised their weapons in preparation to repel the attack. The commander's voice trembled a little. The monster took a closer look, choosing a new target to attack. But something was wrong. This spider didn't seem like a level 19 monster. He seemed much stronger. Song Wu realized that things were bad for them, so he shouted for the people to retreat. It seemed that something had chained the men to a place they could not move, but the spider wasted no time. In one fell swoop, the monster cut off the head of one of the metahumans. Song Wu tried to bring the men to their senses. However, it seemed to him that something was wrong. The people of the assault squad seemed to him to be too weak. This was definitely not part of his plans. The woman promising Song Wu a reward for guiding the men to their destination swore that this squad was highly trained. However, Song Wu had already realized that it was all a lie. Song Wu had no more time to think because the spider had already prepared for a new attack. The boy prepared to retreat. One of the metahumans regained consciousness after the last attack and directed his sword to counterattack the monster. The spider blocked the man's attack with its paws, but a strange light began to flash from where the sword strike had just occurred, blinding the man a little. The man successfully used his lightning strike. The blow blinded the spider and allowed the man to back away from the monster a bit. The light from the lightning was so blinding that even Song Wu had to cover his eyes. He was slightly amused by the thought that at least he had not been lied to in this and that this squad consisted of metahumans. As the spider lay unconscious from the blow, the metahuman attacking the monster shouted to the others to finish off the beast. The men completely forgot all the information given to them by Song Wu because they started attacking the spider's body first, not its legs. Song Wu yelled at them to cut off the spider's legs first, but it was too late. The spider came to his senses and with a sharp movement of his paws threw away everyone who was nearby. The impact was so strong that everyone nearby was thrown back several meters, but most were able to stand on their feet. However, they still lost one. The squad leader, enraged at the loss of his colleague, pounced on the spider with renewed vigor. The monster was ready to attack and repulsed it with ease. With one paw, he pierced the opponent through. The dazed man silently stared at the healthy claw sticking out of his body. The man screamed in indescribable pain, but the spider was not going to let him go. Gathering the last of his strength, the metahuman grabbed the tip of his claw and released a powerful stream of lightning. Blinding lightning burst from the man's body, hitting the spider again and again. The man screamed loudly, using all the remnants of his strength. But it seemed that this blow did not harm the monster. After dealing with one more enemy, the spider threw the metahuman's body away from him. The monster seemed to be gloating over the defeat of an entire squad of metahumans. The dead fighter's body stretched all the way to the far wall where Song Wu was standing. The boy could only helplessly contemplate the defeat of the metahuman squad. Having killed a whole squad of metahumans, the spider looked around and seeing the last survivor, slowly approached him. Song Wu stood still and looked the monster straight in the eyes. The spider stood up a little on its legs and growled loudly at Song Yu. The boy understood that he was in a hopeless situation. Song Wu understood that he was unlucky because his task was completely different. Meanwhile, life went on in the 17th zone of the desert. People on these fragile walls could not boast of a safe life, as the inhabitants of the city did, but they also tried to live an ordinary life. The buildings in this town were made of metal plates. A man was sitting in one of these houses and was talking on the phone with some concern. The branch manager always had a lot to do, especially in the danger zone. Having finished the conversation with the interlocutor, the man folded his hands on the table and sullenly lowered his head on them. In the next room sat the same girl who had given the task to Song Wu, looking worriedly into her mirror. Jamie was distracted from looking in the mirror by Kim Busick, who left his office to give the girl an assignment. Barrier appeared again on the agenda. Kim let out a desperate breath. He had no idea what was going on in Beatrice's head. The manager suddenly remembered Song Wu and asked the secretary where he had gone. Lowering her head, the girl answered that he was accompanying a new squad to the Copper Spiders. 
Kim was a little surprised that Song Wu was so late in returning, as the task was quite simple. Shrugging his shoulders, Kim returned to his office with a remark to the girl. Meanwhile, in the spider's lair, Song Wu was left alone with the monster. Everyone who was in the squad fell from the spider's paws. This whole situation did not bring any satisfaction to Song Wu. The boy took out a gun from under his jacket and pointed it at the enemy who was quickly approaching him. Song Wu hovered in the air for a few seconds, doing a brilliant somersault while dodging the spider's attack. All the rounds clearly hit the target, leaving many small wounds on the shell of the monster. But despite this, the spider continued to attack the boy. One of the fighters was still alive, clinging to life with his last strength. The man turned his head to Sun Wu and remarked with a slight chuckle that bullets wouldn't hurt such a monster. In an indifferent tone, the boy told the man to shut up and take a closer look at the situation. The cartridges were not ordinary. They looked like little bombs. In a moment, there was an explosion and a great cloud of dust rose up. When the smoke cleared after the explosion, it was clear that the spider was badly injured. Green blood flowed like a river from the monster's neck. The man was very surprised that the cartridges had cores. He angrily asked Song Wu why he hadn't used them sooner, before a whole squad of people died. Song Wu looked reproachfully at the dying man. If those people had not lied about their rank, then this situation could have been avoided altogether. Song Wu slowly began to approach the mortally wounded spider. Taking out a small sword, the boy approached the monster closely to deliver the last blow. Song Wu quickly ran up to the monster and brought the sword over his head. The boy wanted to prove to the man that even an ordinary person without any abilities could easily defeat a monster of the 19th rank. With a quick movement, Sun Wu wrapped his sword in one of the spider's legs. The monster howled in pain. The boy pressed harder on the weapon and cut off one of the spider's front legs in one fell swoop. Green blood gushed forth with renewed vigor. Without wasting time, Song Wu moved quickly and with a second blow cut off another of the spider's legs. After the wounds inflicted on him, the spider fell powerlessly to the ground. Song Wu, not looking at the spider, said to the man that this was the way to defeat the monster from the very beginning. The spider squealed softly. Song Wu took cover and approached the monster to deliver the final fatal blow and finish the job. Song Wu brought his sword high above his head and, lowering the weapon, cut off the spider's head with one stroke. The guy commented on all his actions without ceasing to demonstrate the skills of an ordinary person. The monster was killed. Sun Wu sat silently on his knees next to the monster's body for some time and tried to catch his breath. The man watching the battle barely grimaced. When Song Wu regained consciousness, he wiped the spider blood from his face and turned to face his husband. Song Wu asked the man why he lied about his rank, bringing as proof of his talents the skin of a salamander, which he changes himself every year. The man looked into the boy's eyes, but did not answer anything. Sun Wu hung over the dying man. The guy angrily remarked that instead of forging documents, it would be better for them to train more. However, Song Wu was still surprised by the bravery of the rookie squad. Song Wu pointed his weapon at the man, regretting that he had no right to take that man's life himself for deceiving Nod. Song Wu's dialogue was suddenly interrupted by someone's voice, even though there was no one else around. The voice seemed to come from the depths of Song Wu himself. The man tried to say something else to Song Wu, but he didn't hear him. The boy could not understand where he heard this strange voice. Taking one last look at the dead warrior, Song Wu remembered the reason for his rage. The name of the secretary who framed not only the squad but also himself almost sent Song Wu to death flashed through his head. Wasting no time, Song Wu quickly returned to the 17th zone. Slamming the door hard, he went into the room where Jamie was sitting and began to scold the girl for her imprudence. Song Wu was like a wild beast that had been cornered. Jamie, with a trembling voice, tried to justify herself by presenting herself as a victim. Song Wu didn't want to hear anything. He deprived the girl of payment for this situation and ordered that she now inform him in advance of all information about clients. The girl was still trying to explain to Song Wu that she was unable to bypass Nod's rules. Song Wu had already returned to the exit. If it weren't for Kim, Song Wu would have severed all ties with the 17th zone a long time ago. Jamie tried to stop the boy, but the girl's words made him even more angry. He was disgusted to hear about metahumans, although he envied them 
because he would also like to have at least a part of their power. While Song Wu was seething with anger, someone's hand suddenly appeared near his head. With a strong blow, the boy was thrown against the wall. The stranger was enveloped in a barely transparent shell. The man squeezed Song Wu's neck tightly and lifted him almost to the ceiling and pressed him against the wall. The stranger's eyes lit up like a cat's. The man looked ominously at Song Wu with an irresistible urge to kill him here and now. The stranger squeezed Song Wu's throat so hard that he almost suffocated. Song Wu still had some strength left, and he rewarded the meta-human with a cheeky look. His colleague came into the room, right behind the boy, quoting Noda's rules in parallel. This somewhat stopped the boy from further conflict. Nod was the only guild that after the end of the world continued to fight to preserve peace in the wastes and create safe places for people. Kim Shang hu only clicked in response. He had nothing to say. He understood that Puck was right. For an attack on an ordinary person, Kim could be punished. After waiting for a moment, Kim let go of Song Wu and he fell heavily to the floor, gasping for air. Park In Jong leaned over to the boy and sympathetically asked how he was feeling. She reproachfully turned to Song Hu, why did he constantly arrange such scenes? Pushing back the curtain, the leader of the hunting team, Zhang Chang Su, entered the room. Song Wu was very surprised when he realized that all the team members were in the meeting. It seems that something happened. Everyone gathered in one room. The topic of conversation touched the barrier again. The woman feeding the barrier fainted again, so she sent a group of metahumans to protect it for the time being. The rumors were very disturbing. The situation regarding the barrier became more and more difficult every day. Kim Song Hu was very unhappy with the situation and the fact that he was sent to guard the barrier. However, Busik reported that they were in a difficult situation because they were promised citizenship for completing tasks. Such news shocked everyone in the room. Song Wu also wanted to go help in the defense of the barrier. The rest of the hunters also agreed to go because citizenship was at stake, which was not easy to obtain, and therefore the reward was worth the risk. The team agreed to perform at six in the morning, and although it was already deep into the night, sleep did not come to Song Yu. The boy painstakingly wrote down all the information he possessed in a notebook. Kuang Muyan was the largest reconstructed city, around which a high-ranking hunter named I erected the same barrier. But health problems had a strong impact on the barrier as well. The problem was that while Beatrice was recovering her health, an S-rank monster could attack at any moment, which promised an instant loss. The team stood in the middle of the desert, wondering which way they would go. Song Wu, as always, played the role of guide. Recently, the desert has changed, and the team could no longer follow the old path, because there were creatures of the fifth morning which was beyond the power of even the leader. Song Wu chose the most suitable path where monsters of a lower rank, namely rank 15 stag beetles, were found. Having made a choice, the team continued on its way. A strong blizzard prevailed in the desert, sand covered the eyes, and there was little to see around. Despite the blizzard, something still caught Song Wu's attention. The boy gestured for the rest of the team to stop. Bending down, Song Wu saw several small footprints that did not look like human footprints at all. The boy asked Park to look around the area with her enhanced vision, and she quickly got down to business. The girl carefully examined the place, where Song Wu pointed, but she didn't find anything worth paying attention to. Song Wu quickly realized that a horde of hobgoblins had passed through this road recently and informed the team. The metahumans were a little wary. These monsters were highly developed, so despite the fact that the horde was going the other way, they definitely already felt where the team was. Park In Jong used her enhanced vision once more and took a closer look. The girl's eyes suddenly became round, because the same horde of hobgoblins was quickly approaching them. The team needed to quickly change position to limit the path of the hobgoblins. The best option was the bridge located in the north. It was necessary to act immediately, so the team quickly ran to the bridge. And although the team was moving at maximum speed, a huge pack of hobgoblins was already running in their footsteps, following on the team's heels. The team almost reached the bridge. Song Wu only looked with one eye to see how quickly the hobgoblins would reach them, and how much time they had to prepare for battle. A single hobgoblin did no harm by itself because it was weaker than a copper spider, but these monsters had a strong sense of complicity in the event of danger. Therefore, the hobgoblin horde was considered rank 18. Song Wu took a look at their team and quickly assessed their chances of victory. 
The boy understood that even with rank 17 hunters and a rank 10 leader at home, the battle would be difficult. The bridge on which the team ran was long and not very wide, which in such conditions should have brought the team an easy victory. But the problem was in two variables. The team stopped a little further than the very beginning of the bridge, and Song Wu began to give orders, placing people in places. When Sung Wu finished with Kim and Chang Su, Park spoke up asking about her role in this battle. It was here that Song Wu encountered the first variable, because he knew that Park would be a ballast in the battle. The second variable was the leader and Kim, because Song Wu was completely unaware of their skills and teamwork skills, which could become a problem. In addition, the team was very young. When Song Wu placed everyone in battle positions, the team prepared and silently waited for the hobgoblins who began to steadily approach. Chan Su entered the battle first. With the impact of his hammer, he pushed the front row of hobgoblins away from him. Wasting no time, Chan Su once again charged his weapon with his power and jumped into the thick of the enemies to finish them off. Enemies' heads flew off their shoulders. Kim did not give himself time to relax. With one stroke of his sword, he cut the hobgoblin in half and immediately went to the others. A new wave of hobgoblins rushed towards Kim, but he used force to push them all away from him. Song Wu watched with great surprise as the two metahumans effortlessly destroyed their enemies one after another. It seems the guy was wrong about the second variable in his plan. One hobgoblin still managed to get past the team unnoticed. The monster brought the weapon above his head and was already preparing to strike Puck. The girl did not immediately understand that the enemy was behind her. The girl screamed out of surprise rather than fear. Hearing this, the rest of the hunters turned away from the battle for a moment. Song Wu understood that if Kim and Chang Su were to distract him and Park, they would be in danger of death. Therefore, he decided to help Pak himself so as not to distract the rest of the team. The hobgoblin was already preparing to lower the weapon to the girl's neck, but Song Wu managed to throw the girl away in time, so the hobgoblin's axe only clipped a bit of hair. Xiong Wu and Park rolled sideways onto the dangerous part of the bridge. A little more and they could fall. The monster stared at them. Song Wu quickly rose to his feet and prepared to repel the attack. Hobgoblin quickly approached the boy with his weapon raised. Song Wu deflected the monster's first attack by hitting it on the head, but the helmet blocked the attack. With his next strike, Song Wu nimbly removed the hobgoblin's helmet and the monster was knocked back a bit. But the monster turned out to be quite clever. The hobgoblin immediately prepared for another attack, but Song Wu managed to retreat at the last moment. The hobgoblin suddenly found himself behind Song Wu. A little more and the boy would have lost his life. But Puck managed to divert attention to herself in time when she stuck a knife into the hobgoblin's shoulder and he was distracted for a moment. While the hobgoblin was distracted by Park Sung Wu, meanwhile, he quickly set the monster's footstool and took the monster's head off his shoulders with one blow of his sword. The battle was over and Kim of Changsu quickly ran over to the rest of the hunters to check if they were all right. Song Wu dropped to his knees heavily. The boy's hands were shaking wildly from overexertion and fear. Kim wanted to yell at the guide for being so careless, but Park stood up for the boy and the metahuman calmed down a bit. But this situation also hit Song Wu hard on his self-esteem because his task was to protect Park, and it turned out that the girl also had to help the guide. The team decided to leave the place as soon as possible because there could be other monsters nearby. But Song Wu reassured them by saying that only weak enemies were here. The team continued their journey through the desert. Outside, a strong blizzard rose again. The team has been silent for quite some time and decided to vote for Kim first. The boy asked the guide how long they still had to go. Ignoring Kim's question, Song Wu quickly jumped to the stage and told the rest of the team to stand up as well. Behind a small hill, the team did not immediately see a huge dome glowing in the distance. The team slowly approached the dome. Everyone looked at this strange magic with mild surprise. Puck slowly brought her hand closer to the dome. The metahumans thought the dome would not miss them or electrocute them on contact, but nothing happened. The barrier only affected monsters. The team slowly began to move outside the dome. Everyone began to look at the city with interest. An officer came out to meet the team to meet the guests. At the checkpoint, all team members were asked to show their identity documents. Chansu stepped forward and showed his document. 
After him, all the rest repeated. Each of the team was also given a bracelet, which made it clear to the townspeople who the strangers were. The bracelets had a small core. The team was given temporary housing and a place to practice, but was warned that they were not allowed to leave their rooms after sunset because the townspeople might worry the people of the desert. The rules were quite strict regarding the inhabitants of the desert. Kim asked what would happen if they broke one of the rules. The officer's answer was even a little frightening, because the team actually had bombs in their hands. Song Wu understood that the inhabitants of the desert were not happy in the city, because only a barrier was enough against the monsters. The inhabitants of the desert were definitely not happy here. Kim and Park opened their mouths with delight. High-rise buildings rose before the eyes of the team. Kim and Park began to look around enthusiastically. Life in the city flowed on. People lived here as if no disaster had happened. The team decided to split temporarily. Song Wu left to explore the city and find something interesting and useful for their future work. While walking through the city, Song Wu realized with sadness that life here is completely calm, and it was a little unusual for him. On the way, Song Wu saw an antique shop and decided to go there. Opening the door, he almost bumped into a girl who was loaded with various boxes up to the top of her head. Passing by Song Wu, the girl dropped a document, but she did not notice it. Song Wu bent down to pick up the item and return it to its owner, but the girl quickly left the place. In the store, Song Wu decided to buy some glasses. The seller politely asked the boy what they were for, but he hid the answer. For a moment, Song Wu's attention was drawn to one thing that was behind the window, and the boy asked the seller about it. It was a magic bomb that was similar in effectiveness to a light bomb. Such a thing helped to stun the enemy for a short time when necessary. Song Wu was somewhat surprised that weapons were allowed to be sold in the city. But the seller objected and pointed out that the bomb was not lethal and was not considered a weapon. The same girl that Song Wu encountered suddenly burst into the store. The girl was very worried. After all, she lost her pass. Song Wu returned the lost item to the girl. The girl thanked for returning the pass and introduced herself. Marie was a senior scientist in the research and development department. Marie examined Song Wu and assumed that he was a metahuman, so she offered individual help if needed. But Siong Wu denied her guess. Marie began to examine Song Wu. She definitely understood that she could not be mistaken, but she could not find any abilities in the boy. Song Wu angrily took away his hand, which was grabbed by Marie. Annoyed, Song Wu reiterated that he wasn't a metahuman, but Mari was more surprised by this, since her radars said the exact opposite. Marie received a call and, stopping the dialogue, quickly runs away on business, leaving Song Wu with strange feelings. In the lounge, Song Wu lay quietly on the bed and pondered Mari's words. In his hands, he held the same light noise bomb. Worrying thoughts plagued Song Wu. He spent his whole life striving to become a metahuman, but eventually gave up trying to awaken his powers and became an ordinary guide. Song Wu closed his eyes and went to sleep. He would have a difficult day tomorrow, and thinking about Marie's words did nothing. It seemed that the boy was even slightly offended by the girl's assumption about his strength. The next day, the important task of protecting the city began. A large number of metahumans gathered near the dome. The Marlin team was there too. There was a loud noise all around. Everyone who was here seemed to be a little nervous because the task was not an easy one. Ten seconds later, the barrier was removed and the operation to defend the city began. Several dozen mate humans of various ranks rushed forward. While the time was still counting down to the start of the task, the Marlin team discussed their actions. Song Wu, it seemed, was not the first time on such a task, so he knew that the main goal was to survive. Dozens of metahumans started running everywhere. Each of them was confident in their abilities because they wanted to win the main prize. Monsters were already flying to the meeting. Self-confidence played a bad joke with one of the teams and it paid with a loss. One of the metahumans had his head torn off. Mari's team noticed that the first casualties had already begun, but the leader of Chansu ordered his men not to be distracted and to run forward without looking back. Song Wu has already proven himself well to his team as a good guide. He turned the team away from the monsters and the team trusted him. Panic broke out in the ranks of the other metahuman teams. People started running back to the city to escape from the monsters. They did not care about obtaining citizenship 
because the price was their lives. But they were not going to let anyone back into the city. It was as if the city's security itself was together with the monsters. The guards restrained the poor people while the monsters killed them. Pack noticed this brutality and wanted to inform her team about it. But it seemed that the leader himself already knew and understood everything. So he ordered them not to look back and continue running. Terrible thoughts came to Sun Wu. The boy understood that all these meta-humans were not called because there were no strong hunters in the city. All these poor people became just bait. The city authorities only needed people who would become bait until the barrier was lowered, and most of these innocent people coped with the task by giving their lives. Puck used her eyesight to survey the area. Her eyes opened even wider as she noticed a herd of beasts quickly approaching in their direction. Song Wu abruptly stopped everyone. He already knew which of the monsters was approaching them. Judging by the prophecies, a crowd of Rank 9 lizards was approaching the team. Kim thought they were going to fight them, but Song Wu quickly put the boy down on the ground. Only one lizard was rated as a ninth rank monster. Against a whole crowd, they will surely come to an end. Park was very scared and didn't know what to do next, but Xiong Wu took matters into his own hands and gave the team masks that he bought at an antique shop. Putting on his diving gear, Song Wu dove into the small swamp that was near where they were staying. Everyone repeated after him without objection. Song Wu knew that the knowledgeable people from the city would be able to deal with the lizards, but the same cannot be said about the rest of the meta-humans who remained outside. In the end, sounds were heard that announced the approach of lizards. The Marlin team, hiding under the water, quietly waited for the end of the various things that were happening outside. Unfortunately, they could not help. When all the sounds finally died down, Song Wu was the first to come out of the shelter. A terrible picture appeared before his eyes. Countless innocent metahumans littered the field with their dead bodies. When Song Wu made sure that none of the enemies were already there, he gave the command to the rest so that they too could get out of the reservoir. Song Wu took out a map to find the path the team would take next. Foot and mouth disease was a very aggressive monster in itself, so there would be few left after them. The team followed the tracks left behind by mountains of corpses, looking for a place to shelter. When the team finally found a place to rest outside, it was already deep night. The heroes were sitting in a ruined building around a fire. Everyone was in a very unhappy mood. Kim was the first to break the silence. He was on such a task for the first time, so he wondered when it would finally end. Chan Su calmly replied that they should wait for the signal. In all this silence, Song Wu suddenly felt something. The boy was very worried, which did not go unnoticed by the rest of the team. Song Wu got up from his seat and slowly approached the place, which seemed strange to him. Park turned off the lamp, and Kim began to take out his weapon, watching the guide. Song Wu stared into the dark passage, and although he did not see anything there, all this seemed suspicious to him, although the leader noticed that everything was calm. A faint buzzing sound was heard from the dark alley, and the entire team became alert. Someone's eyes lit up from the darkness with a bright purple glow. The hum became stronger. The team silently tried to make out the unknown creature that began to appear in front of them. Chansu was the first to realize what kind of monster was hiding in the shadows of the building. The leader quickly ordered everyone else to quickly retreat away. A skinny monster's paw appeared from the shadows. Song Wu no longer hid his fear. His voice rose to a scream when he saw a familiar monster in front of him. The black praying mantis flew up slightly on its wings, the source of which was now clearly audible. The monster screeched and slowly began to approach the team, examining them with its huge eyes. Song Wu's eyes were wide with fear. With undisguised horror, he shouted to the team because he understood the horror they faced. The leader was surprisingly very calm. He was not at all surprised by the appearance of such a monster as the Black Mantis, and it was very strange. Song Wu was still very anxious. The boy knew only one monster which was similar to the Black Mantis, but he did not know how to resist it, how he did not know the true rank of the monster. Chansu wanted to fight to find out the rank of the monster, what was standing in front of them, but Song Wu quickly stopped him. The guide assumed that the monster that entered the foot and mouth area was even more dangerous. The black praying mantis suddenly jumped up and flew up, bypassing the team. 
The monster disappeared into the shadows and lurked, looking for a moment to attack. Chansu ordered to build battle positions, and the team quickly began to carry out the order. Each of the team members carefully began to look like a monster, but the room was too dark. Puck quickly used her vision to find the monster, but it was nowhere to be found no matter how hard the girl looked for it. There was a soft buzzing around. The team came closer to each other, trying to understand from which side the sound came from. Song Wu listened and heard the sound of the enemy approaching. While the guide was trying to figure out where the enemy could be, the Black Mantis quietly approached behind the boy. After changing the monster behind his back, Song Wu was very scared. At the last moment, the boy repelled the monster's attack, but he could not stay on his feet and flew off to the side. The boy rolled back, but managed to stop before he reached the wall. While Sung Wu was trying to find the sword he lost after falling, the monster meanwhile jumped onto the ceiling and prepared to attack. Chansu quickly rushed to help the guide and at the last moment managed to cover him by repelling the monster's attack with his weapon. The leader kept the monster's attention on him and gave the boy time to retreat. Song Wu didn't even think of saying anything against it because he understood that he definitely couldn't handle him by himself. Chansu swung his weapon and hit the monster's paw with it. The leader threw blow after blow, but the monster was faster and parried the metahuman's attacks effortlessly. Song Wu retreated to the rest of the team, leaving the leader alone with the monster. The boy found his weapon and joined the rest. The team wanted to help the leader, but it was very dark around. Song Wu took out small balls that glowed dimly from his pockets and threw them at Chang Su's feet to illuminate the area at least a little. Thanks to this, the leader was able to find the monster that was lurking nearby. Kim ran to help the leader, but he stopped him. Chan Su wanted to be alone with the Black Mantis. Song Wu understood why the leader did this. Because there was not enough lighted space for two. But the boy understood that Chan Su could have big problems against the Black Mantis. Song Wu knew that the leader had issues with lizards, so how he was going to fight against a monster that was possibly stronger than a rank 9... The boy didn't know. The leader, meanwhile, unleashed his maximum power. Without wasting any more time, the black praying mantis quickly flew at the enemy. Chansu tightened his grip on the weapon, putting all his strength into it, and also pounced on the opponent. The first blow was heard, and the monster and the metahuman began their battle. Chansu hit the monster hard, and it flew away, blocking the blow. The black praying mantis pushed away from the wall and flew towards Chansa with new strength. The leader took a new battle position and again prepared to repulse the attack. The monster swung and swung its sharp paw hard at the leader, but he noticed the attack in time and successfully evaded it. The monster's paw got stuck in the wall. While the praying mantis was trying to free its paw, Chansu noticed this and quickly started charging at the monster to strike back. Chansu struck with all his might at the immobile paw of the praying mantis, but the monster successfully blocked the attack. Chansu did not expect this at all. The leader suddenly found himself defenseless after his move. The black praying mantis realized that now was the best moment for a counterattack. The monster released its paw and struck the leader with it. The walls were suddenly painted red. Kim's scream could be heard in the distance. The black praying mantis put more pressure on Chansa and continued to press him against the wall. The leader understood that if this continued, the monster would defeat him. Chansu was not going to give up and tried his best to restrain the enemy. One of the praying mantis's paws slipped and pierced the leader's leg through. Kim, not having the strength to simply contemplate anymore, ran to help the leader. The boy hit the monster hard, and it briefly distracted the monster from the leader. The next moment, the praying mantis raised its paw high and hit Kim back. The poor guy's breath caught and he was flung aside. A thump against the wall was heard. Kim was pushed against the wall and fell unconscious. The team turned their gazes in his direction. They were greatly alarmed. The black praying mantis pulled its paw from Chansu's leg and swung to strike again. Chansu was distracted for a moment and did not notice how the monster cut him on the shoulder. The pain was indescribable. Chansu let out a loud cry. But it didn't matter. The monster wasn't going to let him go. The leader gradually began to lose consciousness from the pain. The black praying mantis waited until its victim was completely unconscious and pushed the leader away to finish it off. Chansu collided with the wall with a thud. 
The monster looked around for the rest of the team. The praying mantis's eyes caught the only people left. Song Wu stood in front of Park, realizing that their end would soon come. Song Wu tightened his grip on his weapon. The boy tried to assess the enemy and realized that the monster in front of them was at least eighth rank with strong front legs. Song Wu wanted to find the monster's weak points. Only the head or torso remained, but even in this case, they had no chance of victory. The praying mantis began to slowly approach Song Wu. The boy took a closer look at the monster and eventually found its weak spot, which was near its stomach. Song Wu prepared to strike. Song Wu thought he hit the target exactly, but when the sword reached the enemy, the monster's body seemed to turn into steel. Song Wu realized that he had lost his last chance. The praying mantis immediately threw the boy away from him and Song Wu flew to the wall, hitting his back hard. In one jump, the monster reached the spot where Song Wu lay moaning in pain. The praying mantis raised two paws up to deliver a final blow, but stuck its paws close to Song Wu's head. Song Wu had already closed his eyes, saying goodbye to life, but the monster was in no hurry to kill him. Leaning over the boy, the praying mantis simply looked into his eyes. Song Wu closed his eyes, waiting for death, but it never came. The boy could not understand what he saw in the monster's eyes. He thought for a moment that the monster was either crying or mocking. In a moment, a strange sound was heard, and the black mantis turned his head to meet him, completely forgetting about the boy. Song Wu didn't lie still and just watched the monster's actions. The praying mantis only raised its head and just stood listening to the sound coming from an unknown direction. Song Wu looked at the strange behavior of the monster with undisguised surprise. The black praying mantis stretched out its paws, freeing the boy, and took off sharply. The monster turned in the other direction and flew at the sound, destroying all the walls in front of it. Song Wu lay there, overwhelmed with happiness that he had managed to survive. Song Wu tried to understand what had happened in the end, but his head was completely empty. Pak ran up to the boy and asked in a worried voice if everything was okay with the guide. Park thought that Xiong Wu must have hit his head hard because he was just looking ahead for a while. Song Wu, meanwhile, was just trying to understand what that pecking sound was, to which the praying mantis reacted so strangely. From this whole situation, Song Wu completely forgot about the main task of protecting the city. While the team was trying to fight the black mantis, the bracelets on their hands started to glow brightly. Song Wu asked Park if she knew how long the bracelets had been glowing, but she didn't pay attention. The light on the bracelets meant that the barrier had already been restored and it was possible to return back to the city. Park turned her head to the side where Kim and Chan Su lay unconscious. Kim had already begun to regain consciousness, but the leader was still too badly wounded. Park and Song Wu walked over to where Chan Su was lying. The guide bent down to examine the leader. The man was very lucky because no important organs were affected. Song Wu lifted Chang Su on his shoulders and asked Park to help Kim. The team needed to get back to safety quickly. Park obeyed the guide without objection and turned to help Kim, who was barely standing. Song Wu understood that they had a difficult road ahead of them, and it was all a matter of time. A new day has begun, and the sun was shining brightly outside. The barrier was successfully restored, but behind it was a terrible picture from the mountain of bodies of innocent people. With terrible indifference, the guards walked and counted the number of participants who were on the task. There were a total of 86 participants on the task, and 58 of them died in battle. But for the security, it was a trifle. One of the guards saw something strange approaching the dome. In a moment, bypassing the barrier, the Marlin team entered the city. And although their appearance was not the best, they were all alive. The entire Marlin team was sent for treatment. Leader Chang Su regained consciousness and slowly began to recover. The only one who wasn't chained to the bed was Puck. The deputy administration visited the team room. This alarmed Chan Su somewhat. The leader responded coldly to Bei Jinsen's greeting and asked what the administration wanted from the team. Jeanson was happy to see the team on the mend thanks to his treatment, but the conversation was supposed to be very serious, so Chang Su asked Kim, Song Wu, and Park to leave the room. Kim, Song Wu, and Park left the ward and went to warm up a bit. The team guessed that the deputy and the leader were discussing their reward. Only Song Wu was a bit worried about this situation. 
The conversation in the chamber was in full swing. Jeanson was glad that the entire Marlin team survived, but it also put the city administration in a difficult position. When the rest of the group turned back, the leader had to break the bad news to everyone. Kim was very angry. The city administration could not provide more than two places for obtaining citizenship, and the choice was not in favor of Kim, which actually made him so angry. For unknown reasons, only Song Wu and Park were granted citizenship rights. Chang Su tried to calm Kim down, but he did not respond to the leader's attempts to calm him down. Kim didn't treat Song Wu too well before, but after he found out, he openly started insulting him. But Song Wu didn't fall for his provocations and calmly ignored everything. Kim did not want to calm down. The boy couldn't understand why he, as the second strongest metahuman in the team, was denied citizenship status, instead granted it to Song Wu. The leader did not stop trying to calm Kim down, because a little more and a real fight could have happened between him and Song Wu. Kim eventually guessed that Chang Su had influenced the administration's decision. It was he who asked to give the right to citizenship to Song Wu and Park, but did not give the real reason. Anger and resentment did not leave Kim, so the boy simply left the room, leaving his team in a depressed state. Chang Su understood that all the team members survived because of the guide, so he told Song Wu to accept this choice without hesitation. Song Wu did not even think of giving up, because from the very beginning, he only wanted this. But Song Wu did not leave the anxiety that Kim would not leave it all that easily. The leader calmly replied that Kim would calm down quickly. Sun was not persuaded by the leader's words. There was silence in the ward. Everyone slept peacefully in their beds. Song Wu hadn't had time to fall asleep yet, so he heard a strange rustling and turned his head slightly to the bed where Kim was lying. Kim got up from the bed and quietly approached the bed where Chan Su was sleeping. Anger and resentment have not disappeared, and Kim will decide to take revenge on the leader. Song Wu heard everything but pretended he was still asleep. Even with great desire, the boy couldn't do anything to the metahuman. Kim raised his hand with the knife and increased his blow. The boy pierced his leader's ribs with one swing. Everything happened as if in a terrible dream. Chansu, of course, woke up feeling a sharp pain. The leader grabbed Kim by the throat, trying to push him away from him. The battle was uneven. Kim was stronger this time. The boy put all his strength into one more blow, which had already finally finished off Chan Su. Song Wu continued to lie quietly on the bed, pretending to be asleep. But Kim's revenge was not over yet. The boy desperately did not want to return to the desert again. Kim understood that Song Wu was awake and heard everything. The boy wanted to take revenge not only on the leader. Preparing to strike, Kim opened the curtain, but Song Wu had disappeared somewhere. Song Wu managed to prepare a trap for Kim in advance and he successfully fell into it. A light noise bomb exploded, blinding Kim for a while. While Kim was trying to recover from the explosion, Song Wu meanwhile took a small knife and lunged at the boy from behind. Song Wu pounced on Kim while he was still blinded by the bomb. Song Wu swung and stabbed Kim in the neck with all the force he could muster. In Song Wu's subconscious, he heard that strange voice again, which wanted the boy to kill the enemy and take away his power. The unknown voice only momentarily distracted Song Wu, but it was enough for Kim. Kim threw Song Wu off him, slamming him hard onto the floor. While Song Wu was trying to regain consciousness, Kim once again elbowed him in the chest. Blood spewed from Song Wu's mouth. Song Wu closed the distance with Kim as much as he could. Kim pulled out the knife from his neck that was left after Song Wu's blow. Blood started to flow out of Kim's neck in a fountain, and Song Wu was very scared. Kim slowly began to approach Song Wu but suddenly stopped and fell down. A pool of blood spread across the floor. Song Wu suddenly realized what he had done. The boy's hands shook from fear. Song Wu's body lit up with a bright light. The boy felt a sudden awakening of his strength. It seemed that Song Wu would faint now, but the boy could not afford to lose consciousness. Song Wu barely found the strength to get up. He grabbed the knife he used to kill Kim and forcefully threw him away. Suddenly, the leader's voice was heard, in which life was barely burning. Song Wu turned to Chan Su, who called out to him softly. The words echoed in the ward, and they filled Song Wu with something bordering on horror and shock. Song Wu wakes up the very next day and finds himself in an interrogation room. The crimes were obvious because there was a murder. Park was the only witness. In the middle of the room, 
Jin Sung was standing and presenting the evidence of the crime, but Xiong Wu was not among the accused. Rather, he was considered one of the victims. Jinsen began the interrogation and asked Song Wu what he remembered from the events of the night of the tragedy. Song Wu knew that he couldn't tell the truth, so he said that an unknown person entered the ward. Song Wu continued to make up a story in which he couldn't blame anyone on the team. Besides, Song Wu himself was not without sin, but there were holes in his story that began to be noticed. Jinsen was about to ask new questions, but he was stopped. For the townspeople, this whole situation was not worth much attention because it concerned people from the desert. Paying attention to the photo, Jinsen noticed that there were traces of blood only in the ward itself, and the outside was clean. This, of course, raised questions. Song Wu never let himself be doubted for a moment, so when he was almost accused of a crime, he also had an argument in his defense. Song Wu assured that a mere human would not be able to defeat a metahuman. Song Wu's words really sounded convincing and at a certain point, Jin Xiong really agreed with him. Song Wu also recalled his status as a citizen of the city. Jin Xian seemed to finally believe Song Wu's words, so there was almost no doubt left that one of the metahumans attacked the team to take away the status of a citizen. Jin Xian also said that there was a big fight in the ward, and Song Wu, like a normal person, should have had more serious injuries. These words somewhat alarmed Song Wu. However, Song Wu still got a lot, and the blow that Kim inflicted on him was quite serious. If Song Wu's body hadn't woken up later, the blow could have been fatal. All the words sounded convincing, so the rest of the people who were at the meeting could not understand why the case would not be closed. However, Jin Sung couldn't close the case, because Song Wu's whole defense was based on the fact that he wasn't a meta-human. Jin Sun invited one more witness to the hearing. The door to the room opened and the witness entered with a slow step. Song Wu did not expect Mari to be him at all. Jinsen invited the witness into the room and asked him to introduce himself. When Marie finished speaking, Song Wu knew in his heart that he might have serious problems. At Jinsen's request, Marie began to tell what her credentials were for the job. Marie evaluated the abilities of the metahumans when she gave them tasks. Jinsung asked Mari to stand in front of Xiong Wu and check if he was really an ordinary person. Marie took Song Wu by the hand and immersed herself in the events that happened last night. The girl was able to see the real picture of what happened. Mari also saw Song Wu absorb his leader's powers and then pass out. Song Wu narrowed his eyes and didn't say a word. He understood that now Marie would tell the truth and then he would definitely be accused of murdering his comrades. Marie just informed. That completed the procedure. Everyone in the room waited nervously for Marie's verdict. The girl turned her head to Jin Xion and said that Song Wu was not a metahuman. Jin Sun couldn't believe his ears. He was absolutely certain that Song Wu was a metahuman and hoped that Marie would confirm his guess. Jin Sun thought that Marie might be mistaken. Song Wu sat almost passed out from excitement. The boy knew for sure that his body had awakened. He was already ready for life behind bars. Mari's words were completely incomprehensible to him. After listening to all the evidence, the panel at the meeting decided not to detain the girl anymore, so she was released. Jensen had nothing more to say. The judge decided to further consider this case as a murder by another metahuman for the purpose of stealing the status of a citizen. When it came to Song Wu again, he voted and decided to renounce his citizenship status. It was a surprise to everyone in the room. Song Wu believed that he did not deserve this status from the beginning. Jin Sung warned Sung Wu that he would have to go through the ordeal again to regain his status. Jin Sun asked to tell the true reason for the refusal. The boy almost had tears in his eyes because the status meant that he would become a suspect in the murder of his comrades with whom he stayed for three years. Song Wu was no longer detained. The boy returned to the city and gathered his things to return to the desert. Park said goodbye to Song Wu for the last time, her heart full of regret. Song Wu was on his way when Marie called out to him. The girl tried with all her might to catch up with the boy and he slowed down a little. Marie was glad that the panel did not guess about Song Wu's abilities, but the boy himself wondered why the girl hid his power from the judge, even though she knew about it. Song Wu told Marie that it was most likely the incident that caused him to wake up. Knowing the whole story, Marie reassured Song Wu because she understood that he had no other choice.
Song Wu did not miss the opportunity to find out from Mari the real reason why she hid the truth from the board. Marie was just very interested in his abilities. There were completely different impulses coming from Song Wu, unlike the rest of the metahumans. So she, as a researcher, was interested in learning more about the boy's hidden abilities. Marie smiled enigmatically and asked Song Wu if he knew about the categories into which metahumans are divided. Of course, Song Wu knew about it because he studied it many times while dreaming of his own power. Most metahumans fell into one of six categories, physical enhancement, supernatural powers, magical technology, evil taming, psychopathy, and magic. But there were also metahumans who were not classified. Song Wu thought that Beatrice had a category of supernatural powers, and although Marie partially confirmed it, Beatrice's supernatural power was only related to the creation of a barrier. But Beatrice's power was much stronger, because only she could keep the barrier active for so many years, so that the people who lived behind it could be safe. Marie still wanted to know more about Song Wu's abilities, so she asked him if he felt anything strange after waking up. Song Wu remembered the unknown voice he heard. Marie assumed that Song Wu had psychopathic abilities, as metahumans with this ability often heard orders in their heads. Marie wanted to know what Song Wu had heard, but he remained silent. Although Marie behaved in a friendly manner towards Song Wu, he could not fully trust her. It seemed strange to Marie that Song Wu did not remember what the voice was telling him about. Marie finally realized that she felt the same impulses that Beatrice had. And even though Song Wu was happy about it, he didn't understand at all it seemed to him, that his power worked as an enhancement to his abilities. Marie dispelled Sung Wu's doubts a little because he had just woken up. The girl suddenly wondered what would happen if unusual metahumans joined forces. The girl's tone became sad for a moment. She was troubled by the fact that Beatrice had been holding back the barrier for so many years alone. In recent years, she sacrificed a lot for her health. The female figure looked at Song Wu, Beatrice looked at the boy for a moment, but immediately returned. Some wires were screwed into her body, extending from the large core. Song Wu was sure that their eyes met. Marie took Song Wu by the hand and said that he is an unusual person. This boy was destined for a great deal. She was sure of it. Maybe even Song Wu can finish this battle. For Song Wu, these words were a shock that he did not dare to show. A lot has happened to him in recent days. The death of his team members, the awakening of his power, all this greatly disturbed the boy. Song Wu was walking along a deserted road that had once been a beautiful city. Thoughts about saving humanity floated in the boy's head, but Song Wu knew for sure that he was not yet ready for such a thing. Song Wu understood that he was not the savior of mankind. Like everyone else at the time when this tragedy befell the world, he was just an ordinary person. All who lived in the desert wanted only to survive. And Song Wu was no exception because he chose just such a path. The only thing Song Wu wanted right now was to find out the nature of his powers. The ruins of what were once high-rise buildings loomed before the boy. There were broken cars on the road. Song Wu slowly made his way to his destination. The place Song Wu came to was called Mokdong. It was the best place to train young awakeners, so Song Wu decided to try his hand at it. The boy slowly made his way through the broken streets of the ruined city. Passing by a dark alley, he heard a menacing roar and stopped abruptly. Two eyes burning with red fire looked at the boy from the darkness. A demonic beast slowly emerged from its hiding place. Green saliva dripped from his mouth. Song Wu did not expect to see one of the demonic beasts so soon. Besides, it wasn't the weakest monster. Judging by the boy's knowledge, it was a poisonous cat of the 16th rank. The monster wasted no more time and quickly attacked Song Wu. The cat was very fast, but Song Wu easily dodged the first blow, but the beast caught the bag and all the cores spilled out. Song Wu slowly began to retreat in search of a better position, but he didn't know how best to approach the beast to attack back. The monster roared loudly and attacked Song Wu again, but this time the boy managed to avoid death. Cat only hit the car. Song Wu again ran away from the monster but he understood that until he dealt with it, he would not be able to take back the cores. A sewer hatch caught Song Wu's eyes, and the boy realized what he needed. Song Wu grabbed the hatch handles and strained his whole body to lift the lid. The boy had to use his strength to lift such a lever. Song Wu covered himself with the lid like a shield. 
At that moment, Cat charged towards him, but only hit Song Wu's improvised shield. A bright light poured out, blinding Cat slightly. Seeing that this was the perfect moment to respond, Song Wu used all his strength to strike. Having hit the monster on the face, it was thrown a good couple of meters away from the boy. As the beast regained consciousness, Song Wu spun in place, spinning for the next strike. Using his power, Song Wu let go of the hatch cover and it flew straight into Cat's eyes. The blow severely stunned the cat, so while the cat was still standing, Song Wu raised the hatch again and jumped up high to pounce on the monster again. Song Wu's entire body was enveloped in lightning. The monster grabbed the hatch with its teeth, trying to repel the blow, but Song Wu pressed harder, and the cat's teeth could not withstand this force. A brittle sound was heard, and the monster's teeth broke. The animal fell on its back, and he could no longer do anything. Song Wu lifted the hatch cover above him and hit the monster hard on the head several times. The animal was no longer breathing. Song Wu let out a calm sigh of understanding that the battle is over. The boy knelt down and took out a small knife. With a sharp movement, Song Wu cut open the monster's stomach. White cores the size of a small apple were hidden inside the monster. Song Wu twisted one in his hand and smiled with satisfaction. It seemed he got what he wanted. From the entrails of the monster, Song Wu made a bag in which he put the kernels obtained in battle. After defeating the 16th rank enemy, Song Wu thought to himself that he must now be a 16th rank metahuman. Song Wu didn't linger any longer and continued to explore the place. He continued to advance deeper into the city. On the way, he met old signs and some things, but there was no inhabitant. Song Wu was very surprised that the city was so empty. Song Wu walked a little further and a pool of blood caught his attention. The guy slowly approached and examined her. The blood was still fresh. Song Wu rose to his feet and took a closer look around. It was very strange because there were many traces of blood, but there was no body. Someone quickly slipped behind Song Wu. Song Wu quickly turned at the sound, but there was no one behind. The boy quietly began to draw his sword, preparing to meet the enemy. Song Wu slowly began to approach the gate behind which, as he thought, the enemy was hiding. The guy ran up sharply and pushed the door open. Song Wu did not expect to see three small children outside the gate. While Song Wu was looking at the only people who lived in this city, Someone slowly began to approach behind the boy. Song Wu heard the soft click of a weapon. Song Wu turned sharply and saw the attacker. The stranger pointed the knife at Song Wu and quickly began to approach. At the last moment, Song Wu managed to bounce back from the blow, trying to strike back. The enemy jumped back sharply. The stranger deftly jumped onto the wall again, dodging Song Wu's punch. The boy was surprised by the flexibility of the stranger. He did not expect that he would try to overpower him. The enemy raised their weapons overhead preparing to strike, but Song Wu easily dodged. At the moment when the stranger was defenseless, Sun bent his arms at the elbows and hit the enemy hard. The stranger flew a good few meters away, but Song Wu allowed him to recover from the impact. The enemy took a gun from his belt and pointed it at Song Wu. The stranger forced Song Wu to lower his weapon and turn to face the wall. The children that Song Wu found quickly ran up to the stranger and hid behind him. Song Wu didn't wish these people any harm, he just wanted to speak as Nod's representative, but this only seemed to infuriate the stranger. The enemy told Song Wu to leave all his belongings and get away. Song Wu was furious that he, a meta-human from Nod, was being robbed. The stranger was greatly surprised by this. The boy couldn't believe that Song Wu was a meta-human. As proof, Song Wu only increased his punch a little, but it was enough to break the wall in front of him. Song Wu slowly turned back to the strangers, quoting Nod's rules. It had a certain effect. The enemy began to doubt a little. Besides, Song Wu knew that the boy wouldn't shoot him. The weapon that the boy had in his hands was not simple. The gun fired core charges, which was a very expensive pleasure that the boy could not easily afford. Song Wu remained calm, he just wanted to find a quiet place to hide for a few days, after which he promised to disappear. The stranger still pointed the gun at Song Wu, but he tried to believe it. The boy asked Song Wu to give the kernels he had as collateral for his stay in the city. The stranger suddenly loaded his gun and fired into the wall next to Song Wu. Song Wu did not expect this, although he knew that the shot was not aimed at him. The stranger just wanted to show the power of a simple shot. 
It finally dawned on Song Wu that there was more than just a person in front of him. The ability to strengthen the core in the weapon, which allowed it to be used more than once, could only be done by the owner of magical technology. The stranger eventually removed his mask. The young man called his name and, still aiming the gun at Sun Wu, ordered him to follow him. Aaron was from McDonough's asylum. That's where the young man was led by Sun Yu. The shelter was in one of the high-rise buildings. As they climbed the stairs, Song Wu wondered why they lived so high up. In this cruel world, enemies were not only monsters, there were also many murderers around. Aaron replied that being on high ground was a great advantage against humans. When the group reached the very top, a picture opened before Song Wu's eyes that he had never expected to see. There were quite a few women and children in the small room. Aaron ran up to one of the women and whispered something softly in her ear. It was the leader of Reina's shelter. Apparently, she was also a metahuman, but Song Wu still didn't know her abilities for sure. People from the shelter treated the stranger with distrust. Reina apologized for that, but she couldn't help it because they were fighting the assassins. Assassins were a problem not only for Reina's asylum, but for all of Nod. Song Wu offered a deal. Song Wu first wanted to clarify the situation, so he asked the number of enemies and their location. Reina didn't seem to mind the deal, so she told everything. Song Wu was somewhat surprised when he heard that there were only ten enemies. It wasn't that much for such a group of people. Reina assured the boy that before there were more than a hundred enemies. Song Wu found this strange, almost funny, because with so many enemies it would be difficult to feed oneself, especially in the desert. But Reina surprised Song Wu even more with her next request. The enemies were cannibals, but that was not the biggest problem either. The assassins were metahumans, which made it much more difficult to fight them. Reina only wanted to win the fight against her enemies, and although the assassins weren't strong in themselves, their leader caused a lot of trouble. Song Wu wanted to take on the task of exterminating enemies, and although Reina was glad for such an initiative, she could not give anything in return. Song Wu asked to be shown a local magic technician. This request somewhat surprised Aaron. Reina didn't show any emotion, but she also seemed a little taken aback by this, because they didn't expect Song Wu to guess about it. Aaron's disbelief was still on his face. The young man didn't even think to take his eyes off Song Wu, but it didn't matter because of that. Reina decided to show Song Wu their magic technician. They went upstairs and entered a small room that looked like a kind of workshop. A young girl named Minnie turned out to be a magical technician. All this time, Minnie was diligently tinkering with something, but without the cores, she had no way to check the functionality of the artifacts. Song Wu didn't expect that the magical technician would turn out to be almost a child. Song Wu turned his attention to the artifacts lying on the table. The girl made them on her own, although she did not consider her works to be unusual. Song Wu mentally praised Minnie for her modesty. Song Wu asked permission to look at Minnie's work. The guy was surprised at the high level of artifacts, although the girl herself noticed a lot of blunders behind them. Song Wu began to examine the weapon with admiration. While Song Wu was looking through each artifact, an unusual-looking sword caught his eye. The boy carefully took the blade in his hands. Minnie also considered this artifact a failure. First of all, the girl wanted to use cores on the sword for protection and to increase strength, but she realized that one section was not enough, and if you added more, the balance of the weapon was disturbed. This blade was also not suitable for simple use. Even despite Miley's warning, Song Wu decided to buy a gun from the girl. Mili was conscientious. She didn't want to take any money for the weapon and said that Song Wu could just take the blade if he liked it that much. At first, Song Wu wanted to take the weapon as payment for the task, but changed his mind. The guy laid out a whole pile of kernels on the table. Everyone's breath was taken away by such an amount of priceless goodness. Song Wu wanted the girl not to stop her experiments. He knew Mili would find better uses for those cores. Song Wu accidentally touched Min's hand and felt familiar impulses. Information regarding magical technologies began to flow into Song Wu. Sleep. For a certain time, he stood in a stupor holding the girl's hand. But Reina and Aaron misunderstood Song Wu. In a moment, the already familiar voice sounded in Song Wu's head again, but this time it sounded louder than usual, and Song Wu grabbed his head as if from a sharp pain. 
The blade fell from the boy's hands with a clang. Everyone noticed the boy's strange behavior. Reina suggested that he go and rest. Song Wu understood that he had better leave now so as not to show his condition to others. Sleep did not come to the boy. Song Wu was lying on the bed staring at the night sky. His thoughts were filled with thoughts about that strange voice that was telling him to kill again and again. Song Wu remembered Marie's words that the voice should disappear after a while after waking up, but the voice only got stronger. This worried Song Wu a lot. The dream came to the boy unexpectedly for himself. Wild and bloody scenes haunted Song Wu all night until the morning. Dawn has come. The boy woke up in a heavy sweat. The next day, Song Wu set about the task. Aaron volunteered to go with him to lead the assassins to the base. The boys found shelter and began to inspect the base. Song Wu asked Aaron about the abilities of the enemy leader. Last time, Aaron barely escaped from him, so he didn't have time to notice, but he was sure that the metahuman was very fast. Song Wu understood that he agreed to this deal to test his abilities, but it was dangerous to lose caution. Aaron approached the box in which lay the rifle made by Minnie. The girl did not manage to complete this project, but thanks to the cores that Song Wu brought her, Minnie brought the rifle to a good end. The weapon fired rounds from cores and was fairly silent. The boys prepared their weapons for battle. Aaron folded the rifle and loaded it with pellets. Song Wu took out the blade and looked at it. The boy sincerely hoped that the weapon would cope with its task. Aaron was a little worried about using the blade, as Minnie had warned him about it. Song Wu was sure that everything would be fine and took out a small core that was glowing blue from his pocket. This small core had the power of several cores. Song Wu inserted it into the empty core compartment and the blade began to extract energy from the core. Aaron watched in fascination as the core began to glow brightly inside the blade. The boy had never been to the city, so it was strange for him to hear about such developments. Before the invasion of monsters, Mok Dong was a part of the great city of Seoul, but now there is nothing left of it, only ruins. Aaron did not remember anything because he was still very young. Aaron would really like to live in a big city and asked Song Wu if he would like to become a city dweller. But Song Wu knew at what price this middle class was given to him. Song Wu stood up without answering the question. The boy loaded the weapon and made several test shots on the bricks. The blade coped with the task without any problems. Aaron's breath was taken away by this bright sight. The boys began to wait for the right time to attack. It was late at night and Aaron woke up Song Wu while he was dozing off. Sun asked what was happening in the enemy camp. It was quite quiet around. There were several guards in the camp spread over the entire perimeter. Song Wu asked Aaron to cover him as soon as he reached the gate. Aaron readied himself by aiming his weapon. Song Wu got down to business. There were only half-asleep guards in the boy's way, so it was worth nothing to him to gasp for a few. The man who was at the barricade noticed that one of their men was killed, but he did not have time to raise the alarm, because Aaron at the same second shot him in the head with one well-placed shot. The bodyguard caught the lamp with his body, and it turned and stopped in place, illuminating the building in the room of which someone was sleeping. The man's sleep was disturbed. The man got up from the bed, sleep had taken him away as if by hand. He had a rather powerful build, but what stood out the most were his legs. Song Wu and Aaron accidentally unleashed the same metahuman. Meanwhile, Song Wu continued to clear his way. One by one, he slaughtered everyone in the camp. Worrying thoughts began to fill the boy's head. Someone quietly crept up behind Song Wu. Sun Yu did not expect this at all. He was almost caught off guard. Song Wu took out a blade from behind his back and prepared for battle. He understood that he was not an ordinary person. The enemy began to approach Song Wu with inhuman speed. The stranger easily dodged the blade and crouched down to strike Song Wu in the leg. Song Wu fell, hitting his back hard. The enemy pinned Song Wu to the ground with his foot, preventing him from moving. The stranger was distracted for a moment, examining Song Wu below him. The boy took advantage of the moment and using his strength pushed the enemy away and he flew away for a good couple of meters. Song Wu quickly rose to his feet and pointed his sword at the enemy. The man realized that Song Wu was a meta-human and it even amused him somewhat. The stranger was too fast. Song Wu didn't have time to react as he was thrown out of the window with a strong blow. Song Wu flew down and landed on the car. Blood flowed from the wound covering one eye. In a moment, 
The killer jumped out the window behind Song Wu and landed on top of the car the boy was sitting on. Song Wu managed to bounce back from the blow in time. The rest of the assassins started pouring in from other buildings, but the metahuman stopped them. He wanted to defeat Song Wu himself. Meanwhile, Song Wu slowly began to release his strength while holding on to the weapon. From his cover, Aram took aim at the metahuman, but missed. The enemy easily found the building in which Aran sat. The boy still fired several rounds, but the enemy easily avoided them. The metahuman ordered his team to take out the sniper in the building. The men quickly obeyed the order and ran to Aran. While the enemies were trying to get to the building, Aran cleverly got rid of one of them, but the men still reached the place and began to storm it. Meanwhile, the battle between the stranger and Song Wu continued. The enemy continued to attack the boy and Song Wu tried to fight back, but all his blows missed. The killer threw a tire from a wheel at Sung Wu and the boy easily repelled this attack. But it was only a diversionary maneuver on the part of the enemy. The pieces of tire did not even have time to fall to the ground when the enemy instantly approached Song Wu again. This caught the boy off guard and he did not even have time to react to the next attack of the enemy. Song Wu tried to deflect the blow, but the enemy was much faster. The assassin easily knocked the weapon out of Song Wu's hands, and it flew away in an unknown direction. Song Wu was completely defenseless, but the enemy was in no hurry to attack. Song Wu had the only weapon left, which he slowly began to pull out from his belt. The guy understood that the situation was very difficult. The enemy saw that Song Wu had potential and offered him to join his team, promising to teach him how to use the force properly. Song Wu just smiled at this suggestion. And although the boy was going through difficult times, he did not want to become a thief, as two streams of unstoppable metahuman power once again met in a duel. None of them wanted to yield to the other. This battle was not for life, but for death. The team of the metahuman has already entered the building where Aran sat. The men broke into groups and began to inspect the high-rise building. Two of the assassins quickly started up the stairs that led to the roof where they thought Aran was sitting. But they could not reach it. One of the men stumbled upon the trap and it exploded. While the metahumans were looking for Aran, he managed to climb up to the roof, but before that he set many traps, so it was not so easy to get Aran. Song Wu tried his best to resist the enemy, but all his blows were useless. Song Wu only fought off the killer's attacks with his last strength. Song Wu missed one shot, and the enemy knocked the guy back a couple of meters. Song Wu managed to slow down a bit. Song Wu understood that he needed to change his tactics because his opponent was more experienced in combat. Song Wu tried to change his view of the fight. The boy had very little experience in fighting humans, but a lot with monsters. Song Wu decided to look at the metahuman as a monster. Aran tried to help Song Wu in the battle. The young man tried to aim the rifle at the metahuman. Behind Aran, someone was trying to break down the door, but the boy didn't care. Aran relentlessly followed Song Wu's battle. The young man purposefully held his rifle next to Song Wu, but he could not find the enemy. The killer jumped out sharply and quickly. The man swung his leg and aimed at the place where Song Wu was standing leaning against the car. The boy barely managed to dodge the blow. The enemy tried again and again to get Song Wu, but he avoided his blows with all his might. However, the boy understood that he would not be able to hold out for long. There had to be a way out, but he had almost no strength left. While Song Wu continued to dodge, he also tried to determine his opponent's fighting ability. The boy saw that the basis of the killer's fight was his legs, so he decided to close the distance. But this decision was not very successful. The enemy easily dodged Song Wu's attempt to hit him and quickly parried the blow. Song Wu was thrown back. The boy barely managed to block the blow. However, Song Wu's efforts were in vain. The enemy's blow was too strong and blood poured out of Song Wu's mouth. The boy fell to the ground, hitting his back hard. The assassin quickly began to advance. He wanted to finish Song Wu with a final kick, but Aran hurt him. Although the boy missed, the shots that rang out next to the enemy made him stop. Aran continued to shoot at the killer, but the man almost immediately ducked behind the cars, avoiding the shots. Aran managed to divert the metahuman's attention to himself, which saved Song Wu. One of the bullets still hit the killer. The man was covering a wound from which bright blood was flowing. 
This made the metahuman quite angry, so he decided to take out the sniper first. The metahuman started climbing towards Aaron in a flash. The guy was not jokingly scared, because in close combat he had absolutely no chance against the killer. Aaron started to panic a lot. Even before that, it was very difficult for him to hit the enemy, because he was too fast. But now the rifle did not want to listen at all, and the bullets flew by. Aaron used up almost all of the core's energy, and there was very little room for shots. Meanwhile, the killer had almost climbed to the roof. The enemy prepared and made the last jump. The assassin flew high into the air and landed right in front of Aaron. The boy was shocked. He could not believe in such capabilities of the killer. The killer swung his leg and attacked Aaron, but he managed to take cover from the rifle blow at the last moment. The weapon flew into small pieces. Aaron nimbly jumped away from the assassin and retrieved the crossbow hanging from his back. The boy took aim and fired several shots at the metahuman. The man stood silent and motionless for a couple of minutes. He just stood and looked at the boy, but he already knew where he was from. Blood flowed from the killer's open wound. Aaron fired his crossbow again, but it was all in vain. The man didn't even try to dodge. It was too easy for him. The boy's hands began to shake more. He began to load the crossbow again, but he could not keep up with the killer. The metahuman decided to finally end this fight and charged at Aaron with lightning speed. While Aaron was trying to load his crossbow, the enemy was already in front of his eyes. The boy panicked a lot. His hands began to shake even more, but he tried to control himself. Aaron took an arrow and aimed it straight into the killer's eyes. Aaron was sure that he had taken the enemy by surprise, but he was very wrong. The killer dodged the blow without any problems. The enemy caught the arrow and broke it like a thin twig. But Aaron did not want to give up. The boy swung his crossbow hard in the hope of hitting the enemy at least a little. But it was all in vain. Not only did the blow miss the assassin, it left Aaron open to the enemy. The killer quickly oriented himself and was behind the boy in a second. With one light blow, Aaron was on the ground. Aaron screamed as hard as he could and tried to get up. But the metahuman grabbed the boy's arms with all his might and pulled them behind his back. Aaron was completely immobilized. The assassin took part of an arrow that was lying nearby and with the sharp end made a hole in the boy's light armor and caught him in the back. Aaron screamed in pain. For the killer, the boy's suffering was nothing but joy. The killer couldn't wait to quickly start his meal, the basis of which was Aaron. The boy was lying on the ground, speechless with fear. Although Aaron was scared, he did not want to show this weakness to the enemy, and instead tried even harder to escape, shouting the killer's threats. Someone was desperately trying to break open the door leading to the roof. This sound distracted the killer for a moment. With a sharp movement of a blade, someone cut down the boards blocking the door, and Song Wu burst onto the roof. Aaron was genuinely happy to see Song Wu, now the boy was safe. Song Wu looked at the enemy. The wound on his forehead was still bleeding, but he ignored it. The killer released Aaron, and he quickly retreated a couple of steps without losing a moment. The enemy was no longer paying attention to the boy. Now his target was Song Wu. On the way to the roof, Song Wu met the meta-human team. Song Wu left behind only mountains of corpses. But the killer was not impressed at all. It was not a problem for him to lose the team. Song Wu successfully distracted the killer. Meanwhile, Aaron quickly jumped on the enemy's back and pierced his neck with an arrow from a crossbow. The killer felt a sharp pain, but became even more angry. While the assassin's attention was on Aaron, Song Wu ran up to the metahuman at top speed and slashed at his leg. The killer's leg flew a little to the side and the man fell to the ground. Suppressing the indescribable pain, the killer still tried to do something, but he could no longer stand on his feet. Song Wu stood behind him. Blood flowed from the blade. Song Wu used all his strength and put it into a final blow, which he used to slash the assassin's back. The metahuman was no longer making a sound. The battle ended in victory. When the killer breathed his last in Song Wu's head, this strange voice awoke again, telling him to take the power away from the metahumans. Song Wu let out a loud cry as strange lightning enveloped him. Song Wu woke up already in the car. The boy did not understand at all what happened and why he lost consciousness. Song Wu shook his head, trying to regain consciousness. Aaron approached the car. In his hands, 
The boy held a box with things that belonged to Mokden. Song Wu was a little surprised at how energetic Aaron remained, despite his tired appearance. Aaron continued to put things in the back of the car. He even managed to find gasoline, which in those times was worth its weight in gold. Having finished packing, Aaron went to the car and sat down in the driver's seat. The boy was a little worried about whether the car was still working, so when he inserted the key, a characteristic sound was heard. Aaron couldn't contain his happiness. The car started and the boys set off back to the Mockton shelter. Aaron turned on the radio and music filled the car. The guys did not expect to hear pop music, which was popular before the disaster. And although the boys were slightly shocked by such a taste in the music of a whole group of killers, Aaron even liked it. The boys had already traveled quite far from the enemy's camp, when red smoke suddenly lit up in front of them, signaling an alarm. The signal came from the side of the Mockton shelter. Aaron pressed harder on the gas pedal and the car almost flew over the bridge. The boys tried hard to get to the shelter. Anxiety gripped both of them. A girl ran up to Reina. She looked very worried. At first, the woman thought that some news from Aaron had become known, but everything was much worse. The girl reported that for no reason the demonic beasts began to flee somewhere as if from fire. Raina quickly caught up and decided to see what the matter was. Minnie stood on the balcony and looked at the monsters through binoculars. The girl was terribly frightened. She pointed to the place where the horde of demonic beasts was. Raina looked through the binoculars and saw a whole crowd of monsters fleeing in an unknown direction. But this horde wasn't the problem. Minnie told Raina to look up. Pointing the binoculars higher, Reyna saw a strange beast. The monster soared high in the sky. He looked like a demon, holding a scythe-like weapon in his hands. A monster, as if from some kind of nightmare, was able to destroy the entire army of any country with a single flap of its wings. The demonic beast was an S-rank Belquist. Belquist soared impassively in the night sky. The moon illuminated the path before him. The monster swung his scythe and released a stream of magical power towards the shelter. A sharp crack was heard and the high-rise building began to slowly fall, and with it, all the residents who were in it. The nightmare is back again. As the boys drove closer, Song Wu suddenly asked to stop the car. The guy clarified the concept of the red signal, because if the monster was of medium level, Song Wu could help. Aaron squeezed the steering wheel hard. The boy understood that such a signal meant to run away as far as possible because it announced that a disaster rank monster had arrived. Song Wu wanted Aaron to turn the car in the other direction. He understood that there was nothing they could do against such a monster. But Aaron did not want to listen. The boy wanted to save at least someone. While the boys were trying to think of further actions, a horde of other monsters came at them. The boys noticed this late and one of the animals overturned the car and it rolled down. When Song Wu regained consciousness, Aaron was nowhere to be found no matter how much Song Wu called for him. Sun was somehow not too worried about it. Song Wu applied force and flipped the car backwards. The guy got behind the wheel and drove away, leaving his recent acquaintances to perish. In his mind, Song Wu asked Aaron not to take offense at him. For Song Wu, his survival in the desert always came first, but when he looked in the rearview mirror, Images of people desperately clinging to life flashed through his mind. When Aaron finally reached the shelter, a terrible picture opened before him. Dead bodies of his acquaintances and relatives lay everywhere. Behind Aaron, a terrible explosion was heard. Dust flew across the entire plain. The boy turned sharply and saw Raina lying in a pool of blood. The boy ran to the woman to help, but it was too late. Reina pointed one last time to something behind Aaron and lowered her hand. Aaron screamed as if his scream could bring Reina back. With tears in his eyes, Aram begged Reina not to leave him. At the boy's desperate cries, Belquist flew in. He slowly looked around. It seemed that he did not immediately notice Aaron. Belquist lowered his head sharply, finally noticing the boy. The monster's eyes lit up brightly. Aaron opened his eyes wide from the inevitable fear. In a low voice, he began to plead for salvation. Aaron could not even move. Belquist seemed to have the boy in chains from which there was no way out. Aram thought that this was the end of him, but suddenly there was a strange sound. 
The sound became louder and more frequent and Belquis could not ignore the sound which was very similar to a summons. The monster raised its head to the sky. Something similar to a teleport appeared in the sky. Belquist rose sharply into the sky and disappeared into the teleporter. Aaron could not believe his luck. He managed to survive, so that it would not happen again. But Aaron almost fainted from happiness. Aaron turned his head to where Reyna lay. Tears glistened in the boy's eyes again. The boy approached Reyna and closed her eyes. He hoped she would forgive him. With a heavy heart, Aaron went on in the hope of finding someone alive. Descending on the floors below, the boy examined every crevice, lighting his way with a flashlight. All whom Aaron met on his way were dead. But suddenly he came across a refrigerator from which all the products had been thrown out. Aaron quickly ran up, begging that there was someone alive. Aaron opened the door and Minnie was behind it. The girl was terribly frightened but alive and well. Aaron could not believe his luck. The girl threw herself into Aaron's arms. Her body was shaking from silent sobs. Aaron barely restrained himself from crying. Aaron understood that they could not stay here any longer. Picking up Minnie on his back, the boy slowly began to climb out of the dungeon into the fresh air. When Aaron went outside, the morning sun blinded his eyes. Getting used to the bright light, Aaron saw a car in front of him and Song Wu, who was already waiting for him to return. Aaron was overjoyed to see Song Wu and did not hide his joy. It seemed to the boy that tears were about to flow from his eyes. Song Wu asked Aaron if there were any survivors, and although there were notes of hope in Song Wu's voice, he understood everything after looking at Aaron. Song Wu asked Aaron what exactly happened, that only he and Minnie survived. The boy barely came up with an answer. Aaron's eyes were still full of unspeakable terror before that monster. When Aaron finally said that Belquist simply disappeared after giving him a thorough look, Song Wu was somewhat surprised. He had already seen similar behavior when he met the Black Mantis. Song Wu asked Aaron if he had anywhere to go, but it was clear from the boy's appearance that his only home had been destroyed. Song Wu offered Aaron to be a guide. The boy was afraid that he would not make it. Nevertheless, Aaron wanted Song Wu to take him with him. Tears came to the boy's eyes again. The company was already on its way to the 17th zone. Sun Yu slowly introduced the children to the inhabitants of the desert. Minnie looked at everything with interest. When the company drove past the equipment for processing energy, the girl did not miss to ask about the mechanics in more detail. The girl's eyes lit up with delight. Minnie asked to go out and look around a little. Song Wu didn't mind at all because the 17th zone was already quite close. Aaron smiled softly to himself. The friends approached one of the mechanisms, and Minnie, touching it with her hands, began to study its operation with the help of her abilities. Song Wu looked at the girl with undisguised surprise. The boy was pleasantly surprised by Mina's abilities. Song Wu was glad that Aaron and Mina managed to survive. Little by little, the company began to move further, inspecting the area. A beautiful view of the wheat field opened before the friends, and although a catastrophe happened in the world, people tried to live on. Aaron suddenly listened. Something has moved in the wheat. Looking more carefully, Aaron noticed a huge deer. The boy loaded his crossbow in the hope of hunting prey. Aaron shot an arrow, but it flew past and landed next to the deer. The animal got scared and started to run away. Aaron was disappointed. Song Wu looked at the boy indifferently. Song Wu quickly ran past Aaron and took out his knife and rushed at the deer. Song Wu ran with inhuman speed. Song Wu pushed himself off the ground and reached the animal with one long lunge. He cut the animal's throat with one blow. Song Wu took the deer carcass on his back and brought it to the children. Minnie and Aaron were almost shocked by Song Wu's abilities like this, but Aaron was somewhat reminded of this lightning speed ability. Song Wu looked at Aaron and saw that the boy guessed where Song Wu could get such an ability. Song Wu promised to talk to him about it later and asked him to keep it a secret for now. Song Wu himself recently began to understand that his ability is to take the powers of other metahumans and make them his own. It seemed like an absurd ability to Song Wu. Meanwhile, Minnie continued to study the environment. Windmills stood on her road. The girl ran up to one of them and, touching the saliva, began to extract information from him. Song Wu never stopped being surprised by Min. The girl turned around and quickly walked in the direction of the 17th zone. 
She couldn't wait to meet the owner of the mills because she had an idea about them. The friends finally arrived at their destination. The 17th zone was located on a field that used to be a stadium. Aaron opened his mouth at such a large living space. Song Wu, Minnie, and Aaron went to the reception desk. The secretary greeted the team with a surprised look. The girl quickly informed Kim about Song Wu's return. The friends went inside and sat down to rest a little while they waited for the manager. The secretary gave all three a cup of hot drink. The girl's look was troubled. She was really glad to see Sun Wu safe and sound, especially after that call from Park where she explained everything in detail. The murder situation in which Xiong Wu was a suspect had been solved, and Xiong Wu was greatly surprised at how easily someone had managed to do this. Listening to the secretary's story, Song Wu could barely contain his great relief. But the boy understood that only one person, Marie, could disguise the truth about his involvement in the murder. Nevertheless, this whole situation scared Jamie a little, because after the call, Park Sung Wu should have returned to the zone a long time ago. Song Wu replied that he was delayed because of one case involving children. Sun Wu got up from the sofa and asked Jamie to follow him to the office. Song Wu wanted to tell the girl one piece of information that also related to his lateness. Song Wu looked around to make sure that no one followed them. The boy didn't want any more panic. Song Wu began his story with Mokden's shelter and its destruction. Jamie wasn't surprised at all by the fact that shelters were destroyed almost every day, until Song Wu said that Belquist was the culprit. The girl's face instantly turned white. Jamie panicked even more because no one had seen Belquist on the Korean peninsula since the disaster. Song Wu was absolutely certain that he had seen this particular monster. Jamie sat down at the laptop and began to quickly write down the information that Song Wu told her, but he slightly concealed the true truth by saying that even the group of assassins was dealt with by Belquist. The girl was very sorry for the death of people from Mokden. Song Wu had a theory about Belquist. Few remained alive after meeting Belquist, so the information became even more valuable. Song Wu thought that Belquist was tracking people by their body temperature. Jamie was surprised to hear this and asked for proof. Song Wu said that the children survived because they hid in the refrigerator. This was very valuable information, so Jamie was not stingy in paying for it. Forty cores should have been provided for Song Wu for this, which made the boy really happy. However, Song Wu was never interested in paying with kernels. The guy asked to provide him with relevant information. Song Wu is looking for a single metahuman to assemble a team. Jamie was very surprised by this request because Nod himself could have found the team for Song Yu. The boy admitted to Jamie that he had woken up. It almost shocked the girl. Song Wu told the girl that only she and the manager knew about his awakening, hinting at the secrecy of the information. Jamie congratulated Song Wu on his awakening and asked about his abilities and rank. When Jamie heard that Song Wu estimated his abilities in strengthening his body to be somewhere around the 15th rank, I was very surprised. This rank was equivalent to mid-level strength. After Xiong Wu's confession at his wake, Jamie finally understood why the boy wanted to create his team. Song Wu also wanted to take Min and Aaron into it. Kim Busik was also very happy to see Song Wu alive and well. On the manager's desk was a photo of Chang Su's Kim and Song Wu. Soom embraced Kim. The world had the ability to change quickly, and Kim eventually noticed it. He looked at Song Wu and was genuinely amazed at how quickly he had grown up. They laughed, remembering the good times. Kim accepted that Song Wu wanted to keep his awakening a secret. Alan did not quite understand such an intention because Noda was more loyal to metahumans. Kim had a momentary question about Song Wu Nod's loyalty, but the boy wanted to stay close to people he trusted. This pleasantly surprised Kim. Song Wu informed Kim that he would like to take Aaron and Min to his team, one of them a girl as a magic technician. Kim and Jamie were surprised by this confession. It slowly began to dawn on Kim what relation Song Wu had to Nodu, considering that Song Wu even wanted to take the children away to keep them away from Nodu. Song Wu had a great desire to take on the task of eliminating the killers. Song Wu had already had this experience, but Song Wu was not going to reveal his true intentions yet. Xiong Wu stood up from his chair, indicating that he would like to end the conversation. 
Song Wu had a request for Jamie to take all the people from Area 17. The girl was somewhat surprised by this. A whole crowd of people went outside. People were somewhat alarmed. There was a loud hum of dissatisfied voices. Song Wu asked everyone to line up and the guy checked each of them. One by one, people came and went. Jamie was also a little confused because she couldn't understand exactly what Song Wu was trying to find by checking people. The girl who was standing in the queue was finally upset by this whole situation. Jamie sincerely apologized for the inconvenience, but the stranger didn't care. She wanted to pass the test as soon as possible. When Song Wu took the girl's hand, they both felt strange impulses pass through them. The girl threw her hand away in fright and looked at Song Wu. The boy finally found what he wanted. Song Wu asked the girl to give him her hand again, but she hesitated for a moment because she felt quite strange. In the end, the girl offered Sun Wu a hand, and he took it and heard a voice in his head again. Song Wu was sure that the girl had the powers of a metahuman, so he asked her if she had ever been interested in hunting demonic beasts. The girl had no idea what Song Wu meant. Song Wu let the girl go, not daring to detain her any longer. The guy was somewhat disappointed because he hoped to find a team in the 17th zone, but in the end, he abandoned this idea. Song Wu looked disappointedly at the people he had asked to gather and thanking everyone let him go. But it seemed very strange to the girl because they were not even told the reason for which they were gathered. The girl's behavior began to annoy Xiong Wu because she behaved unworthily towards the representative of Nod. The girl retreated a little but her look remained arrogant. A strange uproar began again in the crowd. Unknown men quickly began to approach the girl, which attracted Song Wu's attention. Song Wu whispered to Jamie who these people were. Jamie reminded Song Wu of the hunter Kong Hyonsu, and the girl was his wife. But it seemed to Song Wu that Khan had been banished from the lands of Nod. Jamie confirmed this, but the manager pardoned Khan by giving him sanctuary in the zone. Song Wu seemed a little disappointed. The two sides were on edge. A strong conflict was brewing. One of the girls' team quickly reached Song Wu and grabbed him by his clothes. Song Wu could barely contain himself, but he did not want to continue the fight. The man suddenly let out a loud cry of pain and let Song Wu go. Someone shot the man's arm with an arrow and the rest of the bandits retreated in shock. Aaron's voice echoed through the neighborhood. The woman was sincerely surprised to see two children who dared to stand in her way and ordered her team to get rid of them. The men ran to carry out the order. Aaron fired another arrow, and it fell right in front of the bandits. Something flashed on the arrow and the men hurried to find shelter from the bomb, but it turned out to be a hoax. Aaron laughed merrily and warned that the next arrow would no longer be a trick. The woman continued to shout, ordering her men to continue the attack, but the men began to doubt a little. Aranu decided to put an end to this ridiculous situation. He asked Mina to get a new weapon, the development of which she had recently completed. Everyone around suddenly stopped with wide eyes. Minnie took out a huge bow, the arrow of which was almost the size of the girl herself. Minnie pointed her weapon at the bandits and they slowly started to retreat. The woman left the victory to the children, but only this time, she simply did not want to give up and remembered the girl's face, promising to pay her back. Aaron did not take this threat seriously. The woman turned and went on her way, but her whole inside was burning with anger and shame. Jamie wanted to say something to the girl, but remained silent. Song Wu raised his head to the roof where the children were standing and asked if they were all right. Aaron smiled sincerely in response. Song Wu sighed heavily, realizing that his path would not be easy. After this minor conflict, Jamie visited the manager to report the situation. This made Busik laugh a little. Jamie was still surprised that Song Wu was trying to find out. Kim guessed that Song Wu was trying to find metahumans to join his team, but Jamie found it strange that the boy could have asked her to do that. Kim knew that the metahumans felt the same way. Jamie was not very supportive of Song Wu's idea of such a quest. The girl was sure that inviting Khan's wife was a mistake because of her nasty nature. Kim hastened to reassure Jamie, because no one knew what trials all these people could go through, but his first priority now was to help Song Wu fully unleash his power. Meanwhile, Song Wu and his small team have already started preparing for a new training session. The team discussed all the details about starting to test the new weapon Minnie had prepared. While Song Wu was instructing Min, something caught Aaron's attention. 
The boy looked to the side and looked closely. Someone was slowly approaching the team. A small blizzard began in the yard, so the faces of strangers could not be seen. Song Wu frowned. He thought that their training place was not known to anyone. The team started to get a little nervous. Song Wu seemed to have given up. That he knows all the hunters from the 17th zone, but the people who went to them, he saw for the first time. Song Wu began to overcome his doubts. The team of strangers came closer to Song Wu. The boy stopped the strangers without letting them go any further. Song Wu asked the strangers to introduce themselves. One of the unknown men spoke first, but he was not going to give his name, because he and his team were already in the middle of a secret mission. The strangers already knew that Song Wu's team was new to the 17th zone. The boy froze for a moment, not understanding how the strangers knew this information. Aaron did not like the brash tone of the stranger and stepped forward to defend the honor of the team. But the man did not care. Suddenly he noticed an interesting thing on Aaron's belt and quickly approached the boy. The stranger was interested in the arrows hanging from Aaron's belt and wanted to touch them. But Aaron quickly pointed his knife at the man's throat and he stopped. The stranger quickly backed up, breaking the distance with Aaron. The man did not want this misunderstanding to develop into something more critical. Sun Wu watched silently all this time. The boy was alarmed by the fact that Aaron could be in danger in this situation. After taking a closer look at the strangers, Song Wu understood that they were not ordinary people. When the stranger addressed Song Wu a second time, his voice was already more polite. The man was surprised that Kim did not tell the boy anything about the hidden team, which included strangers. Song Wu was frankly shocked that there was another hidden team besides him. The strangers eventually gave their names and the name of the team, Code Blue. Song Wu was frankly surprised by the name. Not a trace remained of the animosity and Song Wu also introduced his team. Song Wu named his team Glutton, from the word Devourer, in honor of the name of his ability. Strangers liked Song Wu's team name better. They praised it pleasantly. Code Blue was more of a medical term, but Leader Lee's team didn't know about it right away. The new Zengayomi started making fun of the name of their own team. Song Wu was slightly amused by this, and it seemed to him that the tension between them had finally passed. Xiong Wu was suddenly reminded of a recent memory of him discussing his team's name with the manager. The sun was setting, pleasantly illuminating the building. Kim felt that Song Wu's team was not very balanced, the manager wanted the guy to have someone who specialized in close combat. The manager promised to find such a person. Song Wu didn't mind, as long as he could trust this person. Kim knew that in a month, the vault in Bushin would be destroyed and the right person would definitely be found there. The boy was shocked by Kim's words. He did not understand where the manager could have such information. Song Wu wanted to joke that Kim sometimes didn't have the ability to see the future. Kim just smiled sadly. If he had such an ability, he would not have sent Chansa to his death. For a moment, there was an oppressive silence. Kim decided to change the subject and asked about training. Kim spoke somewhat cryptic words, and Song Wu thought at one point that the manager already knew about Song Wu's awakening in advance. Kim pointed out that Song Wu should take advantage of his team's opportunity. The boy was even slightly alarmed by these words. He didn't quite understand what Kim meant that day. But everything fell into place when Lee Jae-sung announced that his team had come to help Sung Woo with training. But the stipulation was that if Song Woo fails, he will be forced to become part of Code Blue. Song Woo frowned slightly in thought as he accepted whatever Kim wanted from him. Lee was glad that Song Woo had accepted the deal with such zeal. Lee asked for a demonstration of the team's skills, and Song Woo got down to business without delay. Song Wu took a quick look at Aaron, and he already knew what was needed from him. The boy took out a small jar that was filled with the flesh of a demonic beast. The other team had unpleasant sensations from the smell of flesh and retreated away. Song Wu, Aaron, and Minnie also retreated a little, but stood closer, waiting for further action. Song Wu ordered to get ready and get into battle positions, but the Blue Code team could not understand what the Gluttony team wanted to show them. After a few minutes, a strange rumble was heard. The ground underfoot shook violently. Song Wu ordered everyone to run to their places. Lee began to watch carefully. 
Song Wu used his power and watched silently as something moved quickly underground to the smell of rotting flesh. Worm jumped out from under the ground with a wild roar. The Code Blue team was very wary of the unexpected. The monster eventually found its target and began to carefully examine its enemies. Song Wu and his team prepared for the attack. Song Wu took out his sword and looked closely at the monster, looking for a vulnerable spot. Sun Wu spent more than one year as a guide, so he knew almost every monster perfectly. The boy understood that it was impossible to allow the worm to hide underground again. Song Wu quickly began to approach the enemy. The monster opened its mouth and aimed at Song Wu, but the boy reacted quickly and slipped under the beast's mouth at the last moment. Song Wu found himself under the monster's body and injured it. Such dexterity of the boy impressed Blue Code. The team watched the battle with genuine amazement. The worm roared in pain and became very angry. The beast disappeared under the ground and suddenly jumped out from behind Song Wu. The monster prepared itself and opened its mouth and pounced on the boy. Song Wu managed to bounce back from the blow at the last moment. Song Wu jumped away from the monster and signaled to Aaron. The boy reacted instantly and, getting into a fighting stance, took out his bow and shot an arrow aimed at the worm. The arrow hit the monster in the side near the muzzle and exploded loudly. The animal screeched loudly. The Code Blue team watched the battle with delight. The arrow successfully stunned the monster, and Song Wu jumped up high, using the moment, pointing his sword at the beast. The sword hit the monster's body and inflicted another large wound. Aaron has already prepared for another shot. The boy took aim and fired an arrow. Another explosion was heard and the worm roared even louder. Lee liked Sung Wu's fighting tactics, but it could be a problem. Lee understood that such small attacks could only make the monster angrier. The worm lay motionless on the ground after the last blow, and Song Wu ordered Min to prepare for the attack. The girl pointed a small pistol and aimed at the monster. While Minnie was loading the weapon, the worm came to its senses and wanted to hide under the ground, but the girl managed to fire a shot. The charge flew and exploded just as the monster began to burrow into the ground. The team had already thought that they had managed to defeat the monster, but something was wrong. Song Wu quickly began to approach the monster to finish it off. Song Wu ordered Aaron to shoot the arrow again and the boy quickly began to aim, but his hands were shaking violently. An explosion was heard and the surrounding ground caught fire with a bright flame. The fire died down, and thick smoke remained around. Song Wu stopped trying to find the monster. When Song Wu ran to the place where the beast was supposed to lie, he noticed a huge hole in the ground. The monster managed to slip away, but Song Wu was sure that the beast was preparing to attack. While Song Wu looked around the area trying to find a place from which the beast could attack, the ground behind him began to move like a walker, but Song Wu didn't notice it. When Song Wu noticed strange movement behind him, he thought that the monster was going to attack him, but the worm suddenly changed its trajectory and quickly headed towards Minnie. Minnie started crawling away, but she was slower than the monster. Aaron ran to help the girl and grabbing her rolled away with her as far as he could. A monster jumped out from under the ground with a wild roar, almost hitting the children, but the beast missed. Instead, the monster grabbed the bomb that Minnie managed to plant. The bomb screeched loudly. Minnie paused for a moment, clearing her throat of dust. The girl began searching the ground around her for the small remote control that activated the bomb. The bomb exploded, tearing the beast to pieces. Song Wu quickly rushed at the monster to finish it off. The boy stuck his sword hard into the monster's body in the hope that the beast would die, but the monster was very tenacious. Lee quickly ran up to Song Wu. The man started shouting for Song Wu to let go of the sword and move away from the monster, because the situation was taking a dangerous turn. But Song Wu knew that if the monster escaped underground, it would be impossible to get it again. The boy gripped the sword harder, but at the same moment the ground shook and the monster began to slide into the hole. Song Wu did not have time to react, and the monster dragged the boy with him under the bowels of the earth. Lee stopped abruptly, watching Song Wu disappear underground. Song Wu held onto his sword tightly. It was his only chance of survival at the moment, but he had to act quickly. The dust and earth absorbed Song Wu more and more, and he could hardly see anything. Song Wu quickly considered his next course of action. 
Darkness eventually enveloped the boy. Song Wu used his power and lit up brightly, lighting his way. The core that was in the blade ignited with incredible power. The boy's eyes lit up brightly. Song Wu braced himself and pulled the weapon out of the monster's body with a sharp movement. On the surface, Li tried his best to dig Song Wu out, but the man's efforts were in vain. The hole was already completely filled with sand. While Li and the team and Aaron and Minnie were trying to dig up Song Wu, a strange sound was heard next to them. Minnie called everyone and pointed to the ground, which she began to slowly rise. Human fingers began to emerge from the ground. Li quickly ran to help Song Wu. Using force, Li grabbed Song Wu's arm and abruptly pulled the boy to the surface. Sun Wu began to spit out the remnants of sand and dust from his chest with all his might. Taking a chest full of air, the boy finally calmed down. Aaron quickly ran up to Song Wu. The boy's face was worried. Song Wu was able to survive thanks to an unknown skill that he was able to use. At that moment, a strange pulsation covered the boy's body. Quan approached Sun Wu and scolded the boy for being so imprudent. Song Wu sincerely apologized to everyone for causing him to worry, but the risk had somewhat paid off. From under his jacket, Song Wu took out a large core that glowed bright green. Li was not very impressed with the extracted core. It was foolish for a man to risk his life like that for a rank 13 core. Aaron wanted to engage Li in a fight again. Li continued to argue with Song Wu, but suddenly his attention was drawn to the artifacts belonging to the Devourer team. Minnie shyly admitted sarcastically that she was the one who created them. Song Wu felt a slight anxiety. The boy didn't want Nod to know that they had a magical technician. Li thought a little, because magical techniques were rare. Li approached Song Wu and asked him what his abilities were, but Song Wu remained silent. Li thought about it, because he had already met the abilities that the boy demonstrated in Chang Su. Li tried to understand what Song Wu's true power was. The man had never seen anyone possess so many skills with different natures of application. Song Wu didn't know how to say the right thing about his strength, but there was no time to think. The conversation between the two teams was interrupted by a sudden roar. Something was rapidly approaching the team. Another battle was fast approaching for the teams, but Song Wu was greatly weakened after the last battle, so he could not continue the battle at the moment. Song Wu slowly rose to his feet. Song Wu could barely stay on his feet. Aaron picked up the boy so he wouldn't fall. This time, Song Wu had to give in to the Code Blue team. Without objection, Li began to prepare for battle. Li Jae Seung and Kim Hyun started to prepare for battle, but Quan stepped away and Song Wu took notice. It seemed to him that Quan was not a fighting unit of her team. There was no more time for preparation. The monster was rapidly approaching its target. Li and Kim used their strength and stood in battle stances waiting for the enemy. The ground under his feet suddenly exploded. The men barely had time to jump back. A monster burst to the surface with a wild roar. Aaron and Minnie backed away with horror in their eyes. The children stared at the monster. This time the monster was much bigger than the previous one. The monster roared and jumping up high planned to hide under the ground again. Lee and Kim rushed after the beast to prevent it from escaping. Lee raised his sword high and, uttering a spell, released a wave of powerful magical power in the direction of the worm. The wave hit the monster hard, almost cutting it in half. The wound was strong and deep. The beast screamed in anger and pain. Song Wu's team watched the battle in fascination. The team couldn't figure out what kind of force Li used. Song Wu remembered that something similar had happened to him when the monster dragged him underground. This power was definitely not extracted from the core, so it came from the metahuman himself who used it. The worm paused for a moment and quickly began to dig a tunnel to escape. Minnie shouted, drawing the attention of Lee and Kim. The men quickly began to approach the monster to prevent it from escaping underground. The men thrust their weapons into the monster's body with all their might, piercing its armor without any problems. But this did not stop the monster, and the monster continued to sink into the ground. The monster tried hard to escape, but Lee and Kim strongly restrained the beast. The men's weapons cut the beast's body almost in half, making it vulnerable. The men cut the monster in the core section. Aaron was quite surprised by this. Lee shouted and ordered Kim to bring the beast to the surface. Lee and Kim tensed up and released even stronger streams of power. 
The men at one point pulled their weapons from the monster's body and tossed it high above the ground. Lee pointed the sword at the sharp end and aimed it at the monster. Song Wu already thought that Lee was preparing to use the same spell, but the sword suddenly glowed red. Lee uttered an explosive spell and dashed towards the monster. A wave of powerful force headed straight for the beast and the next moment it exploded with a powerful fire. The monster's body flew into pieces. The monster fell dead barely touching the ground. A huge wound was gaping on the worm's body, from which blood as black as pitch still flowed. Song Wu watched the battle in shock. It was a completely different level of strength. Li stood with his back to the monster and did not see how it suddenly began to move. The worm raised its mouth high and spat out black slime. Black goo washed over Li's head. Li suddenly began to spin and scream for help. The little creatures looked like maggots. They began to bite the man hard on every part of his body. Song Wu quickly ran to his friend's aid and began to remove the parasites from Li's body. The boy was very surprised that such an experienced hunter as Li made such a banal rookie mistake. Everyone knew that before killing the ugly worm, it was necessary to suffocate from the parasites. Song Wu turned his head to Kim and asked him why he was just standing there watching. Lee, bitten badly, raised his hand and called out to Sina. The girl didn't seem too worried about her leader. She looked at Lee indifferently. Lee turned over on his stomach and began to slowly crawl towards the girl, begging for help. Lee began to promise to give the girl all the special things. Dinners. The girl started mocking her leader even more. Song Wu stopped trying to help Lee. The boy silently watched the blue code without understanding what was happening here. The situation was completely absurd and Song Wu could see it. After Sina had heard all she wanted, she slowly rose to her feet. Sina asked Song Wu and Aaron to step aside a little. The look in the seine was as relaxed as possible. Sina put her hands in front of her and concentrated. A light breeze rose around and flew towards Li, healing his wounds. Li breathed a sigh of relief. Song Wu and Aaron could only watch in silence with their mouths open in surprise. Song Wu couldn't believe that the Code Blue team had a meta-human with healing skills. Song Wu didn't even know about the existence of such an amazing team as Code Blue. When Sina finished healing Li, everyone else stood in silence, not daring to break the silence. Song Wu was greatly impressed by the girl's ability, and she could do it from a distance, which made Sina's power invaluable, especially in the desert. Li jumped to his feet as if nothing had happened. Song Wu approached Li and asked if everything was okay. The guy couldn't stand it and asked the leader of Blue Code to explain what was happening here in the end. Li, in turn, was as calm as if he were a boogeyman. This whole situation, starting with the appearance of the monster, was planned. Song Wu couldn't believe it. Song Wu decided to change the subject and asked what kind of ability Li used in the battle against the monster. Li was slightly irritated by the question, as he had no idea that Song Wu knew nothing about nuclear energy. Li put his hand to his head as if it suddenly hurt. Song Wu still had a lot to learn, but the boy had proven himself worthy of mentors. Li did not waste any more time and began his studies immediately. Li decided to start with theory and invited Sina to help. The girl was the best in core management. Song Wu hoped that Arana and Minnie would also teach it, but Li didn't see the point. Aran wasn't a metahuman, and Minnie was still too young to be one. But they were not going to forget about Aran. Kim took up the boy's education. The man had to teach Aran the basic skills of close combat so that he could take part in real battles. For Aran, training was a real test. Kim put the boy on his back without too much trouble. All this time, Minnie was watching the training with undisguised surprise. While Aran trained in close combat, Li, meanwhile, continued the theory with Song Wu. Li asked if Song Wu knew what categories metahumans were divided into. The guy answered this question without any problems. The categories Song Wu named were internal characteristics of metahumans. Each metahuman's core energy varied according to their unique abilities. However, if the metahuman did not go through all these transformations, he could use pure core energy. The next moment, Li demonstrated this power by creating a small ball on his hand. Song Wu now knew exactly how Li used his skills in the battle against the worm. Song Wu was fascinated by the ability of the general characteristics. 
In addition to the ability for special techniques, general characteristics were also important in that they affected the growth of the core energy within the metahuman. Lee gave the example of games that were before the disaster. Cena also entered the dialogue to explain in more detail about the growth of core skills so that Song Wu would not get extremely confused. Quan explained that the capacity of the core was increased due to the use of common characteristics. Song Wu digested this information and realized that he would be able to combine the energy of all the absorbed abilities in himself, and if he continued to absorb the abilities of others, he would grow many times faster. Li decided to finish with theory and move on to practice. Li told Song Wu to hit the car with all his might. Song Wu completed the task, but Li expected something else. Li called Sina to explain. Sina took Song Wu a few meters away from the car. Sina wanted Song Wu to start feeling the energy she was using. Song Wu had to focus the energy on his fingers and release it. Quan understood that it was quite difficult to do it the first time. Song Wu looked intently at his hand, which began to glow with a faint glow. Song Wu made the gesture with his fingers that Sina told him to do, and at that moment, a small stream of energy shot out of his hand and hit the car next to Li. Li and Sina approached the car and looked at the hole that Song Wu Quan had made. Li and Li did not expect that the boy would be able to make this shot the first time. Song Wu was also surprised. Sina asked Song Wu if he really felt the energy he released, to which the boy replied in the affirmative. Li just looked at the boy in silence, trying to understand who was standing in front of him. After thinking about the situation a little, Li turned to Song Wu with the idea that he should think about joining Nod's headquarters. There, the boy could be provided with better conditions of study. Li could see that the boy had great abilities. And although it would be better for the 17th zone if Song Wu stayed, but if he wants to continue to develop, then he should consider this offer. The only thing Song Wu couldn't fathom was Li's and even Chief Manager Kim's disdain for top management, so Kim might be pissed if Song Wu joins them. Li cut off the conversation regarding headquarters for the time being. The leader shared this information because Song Wu was Kim's man, but he hoped the boy wouldn't waste it. The next training sessions were not so easy for Song Wu, but the boy coped with them. Song Wu stood in front of the ruined city and tried to concentrate. Song Wu collected the core energy in his sword and released it in a stream that cut through the air. The stream of energy collided with the stone beam and without problems cut it in half. Song Wu continued his training and concentrated and released a huge blast wave forward. The energy arrow left no trace of the former bridge. Returning to the zone, Song Wu entered the reception area and saw Minnie there. The girl seemed to be waiting for someone. Song Wu looked around for Aaron. Song Wu asked Mina where Aaron could be. But the girl didn't know anything. Aaron has been behaving quite aloof lately. Song Wu did not attach much importance to it. Minnie was still a little worried about Aaron because with his character he could get into trouble. Suddenly the sound of a door closing was heard behind the friends. Song Wu thought it was Aaron, but when Song Wu went out to catch up with the boy, he was nowhere to be seen. Instead, Song Wu noticed a note taped to the door. Song Wu's face twisted in anger. Aran lay bound in the middle of an abandoned warehouse. There was a whole bunch of bandits around him. Next to Aran on a chair sat a man who seemed to be the boss. Aran was in mortal danger, but bandits kidnapped the boy with one goal, to get to Song Wu. Song Wu stood in front of the abandoned warehouse. Jamie came with him. Song Wu was not going to leave Aran alone and was determined to save the boy at any cost. Song Wu let go of Jamie and continued on his way alone. The boy opened the warehouse door and went inside. Bandits were already waiting for his arrival. Aaron was sitting on his knees, badly beaten. Song Wu was not joking. One of the bandits wanted to say something, but the leader stopped him. The man had personal reasons for meeting Song Wu. The leader of the bandits got up from his chair. Song Wu did not take a single step back and asked the thugs to let the boy go. Aran barely restrained himself from crying. Song Wu stood in front of the bandit leader with his head held high. The man didn't like it very much and hit Song Wu hard and he fell down, but he wasn't going to give up just yet. Aaron shouted at the leader to stop beating Song Wu. The man turned to the boy and swung his leg hard. The impact was so strong that the boy flew to the wall. Song Wu stood up rubbing the affected area. The boy again asked the bandits to let the child go. 
Feeling superior to Song Wu, the leader tried to hit Song Wu with his saliva. Song Wu dodged without a problem and for good reason. Saliva fell on the gag and began to hiss. It was poison. The boy thought it was a special ability at first, but quickly realized it wasn't. Song Wu heard a voice in his head, but this time it didn't order him to take away his opponent's power, but only to kill him. However, Song Wu could not reveal his abilities in this place. The voice became more stubborn. The leader swung at the boy to strike again, but Song Wu easily stopped his hand. The bandits were very shocked that the boy was able to block the blow so easily. Song Wu was still trying to stop this senseless fight, but the leader was unwilling to calm down and wanted to teach the boy a lesson. Song Wu continued to hold back the leader's blow. The leader reached for the dagger hanging on his belt, and Song Wu understood that a fight was inevitable. But Aaron ran up and stopped the boy. With barely visible tears in his eyes, Aaron looked at Song Wu. Song Wu didn't want to see the boy's tears, so he let go of the leader's hand. Song Wu looked away, thinking that this would be the end of the conversation, but the ringleader swung his hand again and hit Song Wu hard. For several minutes, Song Wu stood in silence, holding back the anger that rose to the very core of his throat. When the anger passed, the boy bowed and apologized for everything to the hunter. The leader did not really understand such a sudden change in the boy's behavior, but he also understood that this fight should be stopped now. The hunter calmly said goodbye to the boys and asked them to be careful. The rest of the bandits looked at the boys in shock. They could not understand why their leader let the enemies go so easily. But the leader sharply ordered them to shut up. The hunter silently looked in the direction of the boys, rubbing his hand. The man was glad that the boy intervened in his fight with Song Wu, because a moment later and the boy would have just crushed his arm. When the boys left the warehouse, Xiong Wu quickly untied Aaron and thanked him for stopping the boy before he could cause trouble, for which Xiong Wu would be embarrassed in front of the manager. Song Wu asked Aaron how he fell into the hands of bandits. Aaron replied that he was walking around the neighborhood pretending to be looking for a task and accidentally ended up in the bandits' territory. Song Wu stopped abruptly. The boy realized that Aaron was actually gathering information and told the boy about his guesses. Song Wu asked Aaron not to put his own life as the price for the information, but Aaron could not do otherwise. A small resentment and sadness crept into the boy's soul. Aaron didn't want to be a burden to Song Wu and did everything to become at least something useful. After training with the Code Blue team, Aaron understood his place in the world with great sadness. Aaron knew that even Nod himself had set rules that metahumans would always have an advantage over normal humans. The boy did not want metahumans to look down on him. Song Wu lowered his head guiltily. The boy understood Aaron's pain because he himself had recently been a simple man. Song Wu realized that what he said was what Song Wu himself wanted to hear, not Aaron. The boys returned to the zone in mute silence. The unspoken words weighed heavily on Song Wu's soul. The boy was looking for Manager Kim. Minnie said the manager recently went somewhere with Jamie. Mina's appearance was somewhat alarmed and the atmosphere in the room was slightly depressing. Minnie saw Aaron's face and was not jokingly scared. Song Wu asked the girl to help Aaron heal his wounds. Xiong Wu wanted to talk to the manager about the bandit leader, but suddenly stopped. Hunter Hyon was sitting on a chair in the waiting room with his head down. Song Wu asked where the rest of his team had gone, but Kim only quietly asked for help. Song Wu sat down next to Hyun and asked him to calm down and tell him exactly what happened. Kim began to speak slowly. The man said Lee was attacked. This surprised Song Wu quite a bit. Song Wu guessed that the leader of the Code Blue team was no less than 7th rank. Who would dare to make such a reckless attack on a person of such high rank? Meanwhile, Kim continued the story. Hyun said that their team was recently assigned the task of hunting the assassins. After hearing that, Song Wu suddenly remembered the conversation he had with the manager just for this task. A few days ago, the manager offered Xiong Wu to take on the task of assassins, which he wanted so much. But the task was quite difficult. Song Wu carefully read the description. In the description of the task, it was about the leader of the team from the 14th zone. He fought against his subordinates who revolted. He killed two of them almost immediately, and then the rest of the rebels. Song Wu closed the assignment folder and placed it on the table. 
Song Wu refused this task because he understood that it was still too difficult for his team. Kim also understood that fighting against metahumans to gain experience and ultimately die for it was pointless. Song Wu froze for a moment. He did not tell anyone his true intentions. Song Wu saw that the task was very strange because there was very little information. Kim supported him, and Song Wu became calmer. But the boy did not expect that Lee's team would receive this task. Song Wu continued to listen carefully to Hyun's story. The man said his team accepted the assignment four days ago. On the same day, they appeared before its implementation. Hyun's story continued as he and his team walked across the desert to their destination. Kim walked a little ahead, looking for tracks. Sina and Lee had a dialogue about the task, and the girl asked the leader if he knew the commander of the maiden team who was killed. Lee met him at training in the center of Nodu. Lee spoke well of the man, saying he was a good and decent man, but Quan wondered why no one else had heard of him. Maiden was also a hidden team. Sina wanted to defuse the situation and joked with Lee, but he continued walking without even smiling. The girl changed the subject and drew attention to the fact that there was little information in the task description. Lee knew that Zone 14 had a hand in the stinginess of information. They wanted to keep information about the metahuman secret until the very end, because they were part of a secret team. The authorities were afraid of accusations of treason. That is why Nod forbade the creation of hidden fighting groups. Kim abruptly stopped the dialogue. He noticed the tracks of the killers. The team stopped, and Lee looked around for a spot from which to reconnoiter. A dilapidated high-rise building caught my eye. The team quickly started moving in that direction. According to Hyun, his team spent four whole days in that building, but during all this time, none of the killers made themselves known. But one day, everything changed dramatically. On the fourth day of the reconnaissance, the team began to get very tired. But eventually, the team spotted one of the killers walking down the street. The team hid behind one of the buildings and waited for the right moment to attack. Lee figured it was a patrol, so there shouldn't be any problems. The team managed to catch the criminal and tied him up to extract information from him. But everything turned out to be more complicated and somewhat strange. When Lee asked a question about the location of their base, the man answered the question with a question. It seemed that the conversation was already going in the wrong direction but Lee did not notice anything yet. Lee continued to ask questions, but the enemy did not answer any of them. And rather, he himself found out information about his captors. Hearing that the team was from the 17th zone, the man knew that Busick had sent them. Lee did not show his surprise. The leader was generally very calm regardless of anything, but the stranger suddenly used an unknown force and Lee was under his control. Lee's body stopped obeying him, even though the leader tried to resist. Sina noticed that Lee had somehow become strangely silent and moved a little closer to him. Kim turned his head at the strange noise and, noticing something bad, shouted at Sina to leave as soon as possible. Sina was distracted, turning her head to Kim, not understanding what was happening. The enemy took advantage of this delay and sent Lee to Seni. The knife that Lee was holding in his hand was in Sina's stomach the next moment. The girl widened her eyes in dumb shock. Kim continued the story. The man pondered and remembered that when Lee was not in control, his eyes were lifeless and unfocused. Kim also began to feel strange. After finishing off Sina on Lee's order, the leader attacked Hyun. The man managed to parry the blow and continued to defend himself, but he could not continue at this pace. When Lee took out his sword and began to attack with his skills, Hyun knew that he too would have to take up a weapon, even though he didn't want to. Hyun pulled out his weapon and prepared for battle. The man knew that if Lee started using his bombs, he wouldn't stand a chance, but he was no slouch in close combat. Kim didn't want to give Lee an advantage, so he started the fight first. The man jumped up high and caught on the ceiling. Hyun took aim and prepared to strike the leader. Lee noticed that Kim was quickly approaching him and parried the blow with one swing of his sword. Kim bounced back and landed on the sidewall. Lee pushed off the wall and landed behind Lee. Lee quickly turned and struck Kim with his sword, but Kim was able to block it. Energy flew around. Lee began to tighten his grip on the sword. Kim barely held back the onslaught. Kim understood that he was somewhat mistaken in his guesses. 
After all, I thought that Lee would not be so fast because of the mind control. But the leader did not give in. Kim saw the leader's sword wedged between his blades, and Kim quickly took advantage of this by deflecting Lee's sword. The leader's sword clattered heavily on the floor. As the leader stood motionless, Kim crouched down and kicked him in the ribs, hoping to knock him to the side and stun him. But Lee grabbed Kim's leg hard and pushed him against the wall. With his body and the force of recoil, Kim punched a hole in the wall and flew out, hitting the ground hard. Kim spat out some blood. Lee slowly approached the wall and looked down. Kim was still lying there, trying to regain consciousness as quickly as possible. Lee released the core energy again and brought the sword high above his head. Lee suddenly stopped. Someone grabbed his arm. Turning his head, he saw Sina. The girl begged the leader to come to his senses. Not a trace remained from the wound that Lee inflicted on her. Lee had already prepared to kill Sina, but the killer stopped him in order to capture the girl because healers were extremely rare. Lee obeyed the commands and stunned Sina. The assassin quickly moved to the hole in the wall and looked down for another member of the team, but Kim seized the moment and disappeared. By the time Hyun finished his story, it was evening on the street. The dawn slowly began to appear in the cloudless sky. Song Wu and the team stood discussing the next plan of action. Aaron didn't like that Hyun ran off like that, leaving his team to his own devices, but Song Wu knew he did the right thing. Otherwise, he too would have fallen under the metahuman's control. Aaron understood that the Code Blue team needed their help. Song Wu looked at the boy and wanted to say that as a guide, Aaron should put the safety of his team first. And although the principles of the guide still burned in Song Wu's body, he supported Aaron because he himself was inclined to the fact that Li and Sen needed to be saved. Aaron did not immediately understand this reason. Song Wu explained the reason for his intentions, as Li and Sina were strong metahumans. Leaving them under enemy control was too dangerous in the future. Song Wu realized with regret that the salvation of Code Blue rested only on their shoulders because they could not ask for official help at the risk of exposing themselves to the hidden team. Song Wu told Mina and Aaron to prepare everything they needed for the trip and take more weapons. The children did not say anything against it. The team silently looked at the night sky, waiting for dawn. Hyon led his comrades along a painfully familiar path. A blizzard was still walking in the desert. Everyone walked in silence, not saying a word. Hyon was the first to break the silence by turning his attention to Aaron's back. The boy was carrying a strange box on his back, filled with something unknown. But Aaron didn't want to reveal the secrets just yet. Song Wu looked at his friends while they were chatting happily about something, but Song Wu did not hear them. The guy lagged behind a little, and his thoughts were filled with the events of the past days. Song Wu recalled one day of training he spent with Li. And although the boy was not very good at using his skills at that time, Li did not interrupt him and waited patiently. At that time, Song Wu could not use the skill as needed, and the boy did not understand the reason. But Li did not give up. The leader once again demonstrated his skill. Li shouted the name of the skill and sent a beam of energy towards the ruins. For a while, nothing happened, and Song Wu thought that Li had fallen, but the next moment, there was no sign of the ruins. Li smiled contentedly at Song Wu. The boy looked at the ruins with a look full of surprise, but the boy did not understand what was the difference between his skill and Li's skill. But Song Wu didn't understand why he kept saying the name of the skill. Li told Song Wu that the core should be thought of as an extension of his body. When Li explained verbal commands to Song Wu, the boy finally understood that they were actually needed to make the battle process easier, because it was very difficult to use core power in emergency situations. Li could see that Song Wu didn't really believe him, but asked the boy to at least try. Song Wu agreed and focused on energy. The next moment, the boy let out energy as he spoke the name of the skill. Song Wu was greatly surprised when a skill shot out of his sword and struck the ruins, turning them into mere stones. Li patted the boy good-naturedly on the shoulder. Song Wu smiled. Song Wu returned to the cruel reality. The boy became even more determined. Song Wu had to bring Li back at all costs, because it was thanks to him that the boy developed so quickly. The team finally made it to their destination, and Hyun asked everyone to be careful. 
they went into the city and began to look around. Hian led the team to the same place where they held one of the assassins hostage, but there was no one there and the enemy left almost no traces behind. But friends were in no hurry to leave this place. Arun put his box on the floor and asked him to give him an unknown liquid. Her smell was terrible. Some unknown small animal was sitting inside the box, but Aaron was in no hurry to let it out. The boy pushed the stick into the small crack in the box, which had the pulp on it, and let the animal smell it. The little animal heard the track of the enemy. Song Wu asked everyone to move away from the box, and, releasing the energy of the core, fired at the box where the beast was sitting. The box broke apart and revealed the beast inside. It turned out to be a demonic beast. Kim was wary, but Aaron reassured him that it was only a level 20 rat. Song Wu and Kim were to go straight after the animal, while Aaron and Mina were ordered by Song Wu to follow behind and more slowly. The rat quickly spun around on the spot and took the trail and quickly ran to the smell. The beast ran as fast as it could in pursuit of its prey. Song Wu and Kim ran after the rat trying to keep up. The rat suddenly braked and ran into one of the destroyed buildings. The animal began to sniff something. Song Wu and Kim followed the beast and listened, but the building was too quiet. Hyun was beginning to doubt that they were in the right place, but Song Wu was sure that the beast had found the right place. Song Wu assured Kim that such rats were used precisely for tracking purposes. Song Wu and Kim split up and went in different directions to find their colleagues. Song Wu began to slowly move along the corridor, carefully looking into all the cracks. Suddenly, Song Wu heard Kim, who started calling him loudly. Song Wu jumped up and started running quickly through the corridors at the sound of the voice. Song Wu stopped abruptly. Kim and Song Wu stared in horror at the picture that appeared before them. The mouse eventually found its target, but it, like the crowd of people, was lying in a pool of blood. Song Wu approached the place differently and began to look around for Li and Sina. But fortunately, they were not found among the bodies, and the boy breathed a sigh of relief. Song Wu asked Kim to look around and try to recognize at least someone. Hian confirmed that in front of them were exactly the people they were looking for, but the puppeteer was not among them. Song Wu began to examine the scene of the carnage more carefully and determined that it was definitely not a demonic beast attack. Too clean a job. Apparently it was done by high-ranking metahumans. Hyun tried hard to find something, and Song Wu didn't fail to ask about it. Kim admitted that, in addition to the task of eliminating the killers, the manager gave them another job, to bring in the metahuman Lexi. Sun Yu didn't like it. The boy did not understand what was happening and what exactly was hidden behind this incident. What kind of double game were the different zones using hidden groups? Song Wu and Kim waited for the children to arrive and went to check suspicious places in search of the puppeteer. And the team found such a place in the subway dungeon. It seemed suspicious to Kim that someone could hide in the subway, where there could be an incredible number of demonic beasts. But at the entrance, human tracks were just visible, and this made Aaron suspicious. Song Wu was sure that the puppeteer was hiding in the subway dungeon. Kim decided to act immediately and drew his weapon, but Aaron stopped him. No one knew how many enemies there really were. Xiong Wu decided to lure the puppeteer out of hiding, so he asked Min to retrieve the weapon. The girl's eyes lit up. Minnie took out a homemade bazooka and aimed at the subway. Minnie launched a rocket and it flew into the very center of the dungeon. An explosion was heard, and the entrance to the subway was engulfed in flames. Immediately after the explosion, it was Song Wu and Kim's turn to join the plan to capture the puppeteer. The boys immediately took out their weapons and simultaneously moved towards the dungeon. The puppeteer managed to be lured out of the shelter, and he coughed up the dust and tried to regain consciousness. The metahuman heard someone's voice, but could not focus his gaze. Everything was swimming in front of his eyes. There were some blurry silhouettes in front of the man, but he tried to take control of one of them. Kim yelled at Song Wu so he wouldn't look at the puppeteer and closed his eyes to avoid being controlled. The puppeteer was still blind after the explosion, so he didn't notice Song Wu approaching him. The boy blinded the enemy with a quick movement, and he fell to his knees, covering his eyes with his hands. Song Wu managed to neutralize the enemy's control skill. Song Wu also cut the enemy's leg tendons to immobilize them. Song Wu left Aaron and Mina outside to look after the puppeteer. Song Wu and Kim prepared to go down to the subway to find Lee and Sung. 
Song Wu and Kim started to descend into the dungeon, but Song Wu suddenly stopped halfway. Someone came up to meet the boys, but it was impossible to see their faces because of the smoke. When the dust settled a little, a group of people dressed in black suits began to emerge from the dungeon. One of the team members held Sina in her hands. The girl smiled bitterly. A team of strangers thought they were being attacked by assassins, but it was only a team from Zone 17. Song Wu couldn't understand how these strangers knew about them. Song Wu didn't know what kind of team was in front of him and what they were capable of, but if they were the ones who defeated those assassins in the building so easily, then they were definitely not worth starting a fight with. Song Wu laid down his arms and tried to resolve the conflict calmly. Song Wu assumed that their tasks had crossed by chance. The red-haired stranger threw the ballast off her shoulder. An unconscious girl with blonde hair fell to the ground. All this seemed strange to the girl. Song Wu did not look much like a hunter. Song Wu did not understand what game the stranger was playing. Did these people really not know who his team was? Were they simply provoking Song Wu and the others to reveal themselves as soon as possible? Song Wu continued to calmly conduct the dialogue to avoid a fight. The guy asked which zone the strangers were from. One of the strangers responded rudely, which provoked Kim. Song Wu stopped Hyun so he wouldn't make any mistakes. Song Wu only wanted to take Sina and part ways peacefully. One of the team of strangers defiantly replied that everything was theirs from the beginning. Appeared behind everyone. The leader could barely stand on his feet, but told the strangers to return Sina to Song Wu's team. But the strangers were not going to let the girl go. The girl quickly approached Lee and pointed her sword at him. Kim could not stand it any longer and rushed to the rescue of his leader. Yu's sleep stopped. For Song Wu, this was the worst of all scenarios and one he tried his best to avoid. Song Wu grabbed his sword and called Aaron and Minnie for help. Aaron and Minnie fired arrows and Song Wu seized the moment and rushed at the enemies. The strangers blocked the arrow strikes with energy shields. Song Wu aimed at the stranger standing in front of him. Song Wu decided that this was the most suitable target, since the enemy could only use one hand. But all of Song Wu's plans were interrupted by someone grabbing the boy's leg with the tip of a whip. The red-haired girl grabbed Song Wu and slammed him hard against the wall. Song Wu picked up the sword and wanted to use the crescent sword skill, but he didn't have time to finish preparing the spell. The red-haired girl broke Song Wu's spell by ripping his weapon from his hands. Aaron noticed that Song Wu was in danger and to cover him together with many fired shells again. The strangers again covered themselves with shields. Song Wu hid under the smoke that rose from the impact. The enemies lost sight of Song Wu. The boy used this to get closer to one of the strangers. Song Wu swung to strike, but the man easily dodged the blow. The stranger casually threw Sina towards Song Wu, and she knocked the boy off his feet. Freeing his hand, the enemy rushed at Song Wu, trying to damage him, but Song Wu partially blocked it with his shield. The enemy prepared to finish what he started, but his attention was distracted by Minnie, who shouted at Song Wu. The girl pointed the bazooka and fired in the direction of the enemies. Aaron and Minnie managed to run away. The subway was once again engulfed in flames from a strong explosion. Song Wu used an energy shield and covered himself in Sen with it. Strangers also managed to survive this attack, although it was quite dangerous even for them. Minnie's missile seemed to hit the enemies a little. The man and the girl tried to regain consciousness. The girl took off her glasses and Song Wu looked shocked into the stranger's eyes, but he recognized her because he had already seen her once in the 17th zone. Minnie fired again and flames filled the dungeon again. The enemies covered themselves with shields from the impact, but when the fire subsided, dust rose up, which blinded the strangers. Song Wu took advantage of this. Song Wu grabbed the unconscious Siung and tried to run away, but one of the enemies ran to intercept him. The man quickly approached Song Wu. The boy didn't even have time to react. The stranger pushed off the wall to be in front of Song Wu and kicked him back hard. Song Wu flew away after hitting his back hard, but there was nothing more he could do. The boy understood that he would not be able to escape. Aaron and Minnie could only look at everything with great surprise. Song Wu came to his senses at the sound of battle. My whole body ached. I didn't even have the strength to stand up. Hyung was still trying to face the strangers. Looking around, Song Wu noticed a sword lying nearby. The boy rose to his feet with the last of his strength and grabbed the sword. The boy had already started to say the spell, 
but he was abruptly cut off. Una slowly descended the stairs. The girl asked why Song Wu did not want to give up. After considering his position, Song Wu threw his sword aside and still decided to surrender. Hyun looked at Song Wu and decided to put down his weapon as well. One of her team appeared behind Yuna, the man holding the unconscious Mina and Aran in his hands. This greatly alarmed Song Wu. The man put the children on the ground and asked Song Wu why he attacked them. Song Wu only wanted to free his colleague, but if the enemies had not attacked Li, they could have left peacefully. According to Song Wu's husband, it was necessary to insist on cooperation from the very beginning because it was clear that they were unequal in strength. If he wanted to, the man himself could easily defeat Song Wu's entire team. When the element of emotion subsided, the man finally presented his team. In front of Song Wu was Nodu's inspection team, sent by the 17th zone. Kim and Song Wu's faces were full of surprise. The room immediately became very quiet. Song Wu could not have imagined that he would meet official representatives of Noda in such a place. Maida Toshiro, the leader of the inspection team, introduced himself first. After him, Yuna introduced the rest of the team, Lee sung -wa and Jack Jr.'s other girl. Sun Wu was a little angry. He realized that there were spies in front of him. The inspection team was not going to hide the fact that they were spies. The Nodu team has come to this location to investigate the violations of the 14th zone according to the Nodu rules. Now Song Wu understood everything. Everything was planned by Nod from the beginning. He met Yunhua in the 17th zone for a reason. Maida interrupted the conversation and ordered Yunhui to put Xiong Wu and Kim to sleep. Yunhua proceeded to carry out the order without delay. The girl slowly approached Song Wu. Before falling asleep, Song Wu asked for the last time to let the children go. Yunhua responded indifferently to this request. They could not let the children go, but they promised not to harm them. With these words, Song Wu fell into a deep sleep. The boy dreamed of one of the conversations with Li when they sat down to rest by the homemade fire after another training session. Li then wanted to talk to Song Wu about Nod. Even then, Lee warned Song Wu not to trust Nod. They were not who they seemed. Nod's plan was that they selected talented children from the desert and taught them to drive away monsters. Song Wu understood Nod's plan, but he couldn't understand why Nod, with such powerful powers, wouldn't drive away the demonic beasts themselves. Lee had an answer to that, too. But the truth was much scarier. Nod did not create safe zones in the desert because they believed that more people would wake up in dangerous conditions. Nod specifically neglected safety so that more talents would awaken, and then they took those children and trained them. Song Wu understood that this way there would be no metahumans left in the desert. Li confirmed that Song Wu is thinking in the right direction because if there is no one else to protect the desert, then everyone else will simply die. After that, there was silence. In a dream, another memory suddenly came to Song Wu where he, still young, was hiding alone in the ruins. It was then that he met Kim Busik. In those distant times, Manager Kim worked in the city of Kuang Muen. Kim held out his hand and promised Xiong Wu to make him the best guide to Nodu's evil. The boy accepted the outstretched hand. Song Wu lay bound on the cold stone floor. His eyes were covered with a bandage and only one word, don't trust Nod, floated in his head. An unfamiliar voice brought Song Wu out of his deep sleep. Opening his eyes, the boy saw a strange man in front of him. Song Wu was sitting on a chair. His hands were tied. The man apologized for it. The stranger introduced himself as Risky Lee, temporarily acting as Nod's headquarters representative. Song Wu just clarified if Nod's intentions included killing his team. Risky Lee carefully looked at Song Wu and then asked strongly how Song Wu was so sure of this. But Song Wu knew that Nod punished anyone who went against their will. Li continued to speak in riddles. Besides, he considered Song Wu just a pawn in the chess reign of all the current events. Nod considered Manager Kim to be guilty and had already applied the appropriate punishment. Song Wu remained silent, but there was terror in the boy's eyes. Li continued to speak and read out the offenses involving the manager. In a calm tone, Li announced that the 14th and 17th zones had been cleared. Song Wu tried to restrain himself because he understood what clearing could mean. But Li couldn't say for sure because he didn't know for sure because it was under the jurisdiction of another team. 
Song Wu mentioned the leader of Code Blue and inquired about his fate. But Li reported that he was not killed, but released. Song Wu was very surprised by this. However, the leader Li did not actually manage to escape punishment. Nod took away his metahuman powers and released him into the desert to finish what he had started because there was no time for a trial at headquarters. Song Wu became even more angry. Nod crossed all possible boundaries. At the mention of the puppeteer, Song Wu almost lost control of himself. In the end, Risky Li cut off the unnecessary conversation for him. The man called Song Wu for his own purposes, because before taking certain duties, Li was an instructor at the training center. After a long and exhausting conversation, Song Wu was released. Aaron and Hyun were already waiting for him outside. The boy joyfully ran into Song Wu's arms. Li and Maida watched the happy reunion of friends from the window. Maida worriedly asked if Sun Yu was hiding something and looked at Nod. Li knew that it was difficult to hide anything from Nod's look, especially for a low-ranking metahuman like Song Wu. Li wanted to see what Song Wu could come up with after the stipulated 15 days. While the friends were leaving the unfortunate place, Aaron inquired about Sina and Mina. Song Wu reassured the two by saying that Sina would receive appropriate treatment, and Minnie decided to stay with her. Song Wu looked sadly at Aaron because he was not summoned for questioning and most likely because he did not have the strength. Song Wu wanted to protect the boy at all costs, even if he had to lie. When the friends had gone far enough into the cities, Song Wu stopped and said that they needed to go their separate ways. Aaron and Kim looked at him without understanding. Song Wu asked someone to find him. Song Wu returned to the 17th zone as the sun was already painting the sky a pinkish western color. Song Wu knew what could be waiting for him inside, and he thought he was ready for it, but it turned out not to be like that. Gritting his teeth, Song Wu made his way between the offices where his friends and colleagues used to sit, but now everything was completely destroyed. Traces of blood were visible everywhere. Song Wu looked at the terrible picture with pity and sadness. The boy remembered the manager and quickly ran to his office. When Sun Wu entered the room, he saw Jamie standing over the manager. Kim was lying on the bed. His body was covered with a blanket on which large bloodstains were visible. Song Wu ran up to Kim with great anxiety in his eyes, the boy's voice trembling. The manager turned his head to him and greeted him softly. Song Wu apologized to the manager for disappearing without saying a word. But Kim didn't hold a grudge against him. Rather, he wanted to apologize himself, but he couldn't even shake his hand. Sun Yu didn't immediately understand what was the matter. But when he raised his mask, his face was distorted by the mass of emotions he felt. Jamie looked away in pain. Anger filled Song Wu's whole body. The boy couldn't believe that Nod would dare to do this to the manager. But Kim only said that this was the price for going against such a large organization. Song Wu fell powerlessly to his knees. For Kim, the loss of limbs was not such a great price. Most of all, Kim felt sorry for the deaths of people who tried to protect their modest existence. Song Wu thought that the manager could see the future. The boy did not understand why Kim created secret teams and went against Nod, knowing the price he would pay for it. The manager was surprised by this assumption, so he wanted to dispel the boy's doubts before it was too late. Kim politely asked Jamie to leave him alone with Song Wu, and she complied. There was a sudden silence in the room. Kim was gathering with spirit to tell the whole truth to the boy whom he had raised since he was a child. Song Wu remained silent, not daring to break the silence. Kim broke the silence and began the story. The manager admitted that his ability had nothing to do with predicting the future, but only with memory. Kim remembered what humanity did not remember. Humanity is already extinct. Song Wu looked at the manager in confusion. Kim's words struck the boy like a thunderbolt. But Kim did not mean that the current world was only a dream and they did not become spirits. The manager will clarify that once humanity has already died out, the boy finally understood the meaning of these words. The extinction of humanity was related to Kim's past life. His ability was that he remembered everything that happened to him in past lives. When he died, he lived all over again. Manager Kim was a regressor, someone who was already living his life. Song Wu remembered all the conversations with Kim, and it finally dawned on him how the manager guessed everything so easily and knew in advance. Kim's present life was like the past, and demonic beasts appeared in the same place. 
But the events taking place now are different. The stronger the changes now, the more the future changes. Song Wu remembered Kim's words that if he could see the future, he wouldn't have sent Chang Su to his death. Then Song Wu understood the manager's words that one day the trajectory of this life would change. Kim did not know what exactly had caused all these changes. Maybe it all started when Kim took Song Wu to his house and hid him from Nod, even though he was supposed to stay in the city administration office. For Song Wu, it didn't matter much whether the future changed or not. The boy did not understand why the manager, knowing that the creation of secret teams would be treason, went against Nod. Kim understood Song Wu's anger, but he couldn't help but rebel because he wanted to prove that Nodu's actions were wrong. The manager asked Song Wu to listen to the story that happened before he died. Kim did not understand much about regression, but thanks to this ability he rose to high positions. Thoughts of the desert never crossed his mind. Kim wanted to believe then that life in the city would be the same as before the cataclysm. However, according to his memories, the events of his past life were supposed to happen in five years, the beginning of the extinction of humanity. Belquist, Malbas, and Saleos appeared at the same time and set their sights on that world. Nod could not hold them back because of his bottomless greed. Nod had to defeat them one by one at the moment of appearance. But Nod saw the invasion of monsters as an earthquake or a flood, ignoring their appearance. Caught in a power struggle and trying to protect the metahumans, Nod only invited trouble. That's how Kim died in his past life. And then he was reborn with memories of what happened in Kuang Muen and the names of active hunters. Kim did not know what desires were driving him then, but he was determined to prevent the disaster. But he could no longer trust Nod. That is why he united with Beatrice. Despite her youth, Beatrice was very intelligent. With her, Kim created an association against Nod and began to recruit people. This is how the 14th, 17th, and 19th zones appeared. The main goal of the plan was to prioritize the gathering of the Nine Keys ahead of Nod. Song Wu stopped the story for a moment because he did not know what the keys were. Nine Keys was the name given to the team consisting of exceptional metahumans capable of defeating the named demonic beasts. Kim planned to share information with the keys and provide the location of the demonic beasts. They would have enough time to deal with the monsters in turn. After the grouping, Kim planned to train the keys, and the actual attack on the named monsters was to take place three years later. But the problem was in Noda. But Kim's team was very wrong. Another branch manager caught Kim's team organizing secret teams. From that moment, Nod increased surveillance. Not so long ago, Kim's team found another one of Lexi's keys and entrusted her with the development of the 14th Zone. But inside the secret team of the 14th Zone, there was a spy, a puppeteer. The puppeteer's desire to get Lexi was so great that he began manipulating the metahumans from Area 14 and killed the leader of the strike team, taking the rest of the metahumans with him. After what happened to Lexi, Nod, who had already stepped up surveillance, learned about her and the secret teams. This moment flashed through Song Wu's memory, but he didn't attach any importance to it at the time. Lee finished the story. Song Wu knew everything that happened after that. Now the choice was up to the boy, but Sun Wu did not understand why everything depended on him. The manager will explain everything simply, because Song Wu had an absorbing ability and had unlimited potential. But Song Wu thought that Kim was stepping in for a Voss. Song Wu was somewhat angry at this, but Kim hurried to calm the boy down because the manager knew from the memories of his past life that it was Song Wu who caused the most damage to the monsters. Song Wu was the center of the Nine Keys. It was hard for Song Wu to believe this, but he quickly calmed down and accepted everything that Kim wanted and desired. But Song Wu still didn't know what to do. Kim was going to give Song Wu a special ability when their journey together was about to come to an end. Song Wu asked what kind of ability it was, and Kim told the boy to open the box and see for himself. Song Wu followed Kim's instructions and saw a knife in the box. The boy thought it was a bad joke, but the manager was not kidding. Kim wanted to give Song Wu his ability. Song Wu suddenly jumped to his feet and overturned the chair. Kim found only five of the nine keys. Song Wu had to find the rest using Kim's memory. That hateful voice crept into Song Wu's head again, telling the boy to take away Kim's power, but Song Wu tried to resist it. 
Song Wu tried to abandon this plan, but the manager asked him to do it. The man was very tired of this life and wanted to get rid of this senseless loop. The boy's heart was overflowing with blood. Song Wu brought the knife in, ready to strike, his mind flooded with memories from his childhood when Kim had just brought him to the area. Song Wu was forced to take this terrible step against his will. When it was all over, Song Wu fell to his knees. The knife fell from his hands. Song Wu began to absorb Kim's ability, and along with it, the memories of not only the manager's past lives, but also of Song Wu himself swirled around. Song Wu's consciousness could not withstand such a large amount of information and memories, and the boy fainted. Song Wu stood up abruptly. The boy did not know how much time had passed before he was unconscious. Memories from the past hit Song Wu. He thought he was in the city, but immediately dismissed the thought. For some time, the boy sat trying to figure out who he was. Seeing the final proof in front of him, the boy realized that he was Song Wu. Tears welled up in his eyes. After looking at the manager for the last time, Song Wu thanked him for everything and covered him with a blanket. Song Wu heard the voice again, but this time it was kind and warm. Song Wu looked at Kim's body. The man was silent. The boy suddenly became afraid that he would no longer be able to be himself. But Song Wu was determined to follow the choice he made himself. The boy bowed to the manager one last time and left the office, leaving his owner there. Song Wu started looking for Jamie, calling for her at the top of his voice, but the girl was nowhere to be found. When Song Wu came outside, he was met by a group of thugs. One of them was holding Jamie. At the head of the group of bandits was the already famous hunter Kong Hyun Su. The man stepped forward and introduced himself to Song Wu. Kong invited Song Wu to join him. Khan decided to take over Area 17 and offer Nod a deal, as the hunter knew that the manager had been branded a traitor. Song Wu could barely contain himself. Song Wu didn't understand what Kang wanted to achieve, because he was sure that Nod didn't need people, whom they themselves died without needing. Kang was angry, but he understood that Song Wu was right. Kang wanted Song Wu to give him a manager. In return, he would let Jamie go. Kang pushed Jamie towards Xiong Wu, who told her to hide in the building. Kong thought that Song Wu would agree to join, but he also wants to come to Nod empty-handed. The bandits pulled something that was covered with a sheet. Bandits removed the sheet and placed the cross vertically. Song Wu looked in shock at Leader Li hanging tied to the cross. Khan wanted to denounce that Noda as a traitor. Song Wu didn't answer, just laughed out loud. Khan did not understand what was the matter. Song Wu reported that neither Li nor Kim had any value to Nod anymore, as they had already been punished. Kang didn't understand how Song Wu knew this information and just stared at him in shock. The boy's heart sank and anger surged through his body for Khan rebelling while the others perished. Khan couldn't stand the boy's audacity any longer and approaching him, grabbed his collar. Song Wu only looked at him for a moment, but the boy's voice suddenly changed. All this time, Song Wu thought that he could absorb the power of metahumans only when they were already dead, but he was wrong. Khan looked at the boy in confusion. Song Wu grabbed Khan and started draining his power. When Song Wu was done with Kong, he let him go. The hunter backed away from Song Wu with fear in his eyes. Song Wu didn't pay attention to Khan anymore, but after receiving his power, he just exhaled indifferently. Kong didn't know exactly what Song Wu had done, but he took out his sword and pointed it at the boy. After a second, Kong's hands began to shake violently and the sword pulled him down. Song Wu calmly informed Kong that he had lost his ability to hold a sword of such weight in his hands, but Kong did not believe him and raised the sword high above him. There was a crunch of bones and the sword brought Kong to his knees again. Song Wu took advantage of this and quickly approached the hunter and knocked him to the ground, breaking his jaw. The bandits just stared blankly. Bandits decided to take revenge for the leader. For Song Wu, they became the perfect target to test his previously sealed skills. With the help of the memory that came to Song Wu from Kim, the boy decided to call on his past abilities. Gathering all the energy in his body, Song Wu connected it together. Song Wu stood still, concentrating hard on his skills. Song Wu's eyes began to glow with a bright light. Releasing an unknown dark aura, Song Wu directed it at the rest of the bandits. The bandits tried to run away, but the tentacles released by Song Wu easily and quickly reached their targets. All bandits died. Song Wu suddenly bent over. 
Strength was quickly leaving the boy. This skill was draining Song Wu a lot, and he simply did not have time to absorb the energy to compensate for it. Someone's vague voice suddenly distracted Song Wu. The boy turned his head to hear the voice and saw Khan walking slowly towards him. Song Wu looked indifferently at Khan and took out his sword. Without leaving his seat, Song Wu swung his blade and cut Khan in half with one swing. Now the boy could completely take away his power. Song Wu breathed a sigh of relief after finally finishing off all the rebels. The next morning, Song Wu and Jamie buried their friend and loved one with full honors. Jamie covered herself with her hand, barely holding back tears. Song Wu broke the silence and asked the girl what she was going to do next. Jamie still has some work to do in the area, which the manager assigned to her. Song Wu, on the other hand, had a task assigned to him by Kim. After leaving the 17th zone, Song Wu returned to the city where his journey as a meta-human began. The boy had come to see the senator, but he was not let through. Marie, who luckily for Song Wu was in charge of the senator's schedule, came to his aid. Old acquaintances used the elevator to climb the tower. Standing next to Song Wu, Mari felt that his energy was much stronger than last time. Song Wu was very surprised that Marie was able to feel it without touching his hand. However, Marie felt something else. She carefully examined Song Wu and was somewhat surprised to feel several different types of energy in him, but she couldn't believe it herself. There was silence. Marie wanted to grab Song Wu's hand to confirm her guesses, but the boy impassively hid his hand and promised to scream if Marie tried to grab him again. When the colleagues finally got to the right floor, Mara almost whispered to Song Wu to keep the meeting with the senator a secret, because some people might see it as an unwanted change of heart. Marie and Xiong Wu entered the room where the senator was sitting. Cables feeding the sphere were screwed to the girl's body. The girl slowly got up and returned to the guests. When Song Wu greeted Beatrice, he said that he was glad to see her again. Beatrice replied that she was glad to meet him for the first time. Marie looked at them both in surprise. From the boy's manner of speaking, Beatrice could tell that Song Wu had absorbed Kim's ability. Song Wu just stared sadly out the window. Beatrice was deeply affected by the news of Kim's death. Song Wu just came to say that he will continue Kim's case. Beatrice smiled faintly and thanked the boy for that. However, Song Wu was now more interested in Beatrice's condition and how long the girl would be able to maintain the dome risking her health. Beatrice was ready to defend the city as long as the people needed her. When her time comes, Beatrice will join the keys without hesitation. Song Wu did not expect anything else from the first key. The boy had already turned to leave, but Beatrice asked him about winter. Beatrice had hoped that Song Wu would bring winter to Quan Muin, but the boy had plans for something completely different. Hearing that he would most likely lead the key to the headquarters, Beatrice was somewhat frightened. Song Wu was about to use Nod's infrastructure, but Beatrice panicked even more, fearing for Kim's plan. However, defeating the named monsters was more important to Song Wu. Song Wu wanted to create an independent squad to fight the monsters. Song Wu respected the manager's plan but wanted to do his own thing, even if he had to join Nod. Before leaving, Song Wu asked Beatrice not to forget about the dream, otherwise she will not live to X day. Beatrice promised to take it into account, but her look was sad. It's evening. Song Wu eventually caught up with his team. Kim and Song Wu sat lit by a single lamp. Haiyan covered his face with his hands because in one moment he was left alone. Song Wu didn't say anything because he understood Kim's feelings. For Hyun Li, he was a teacher and a leader, but he died. And now Kim thought that he would not have a very bright future. Song Wu knew that Nod had also proposed to Hyun, but he didn't know if he should trust them. Song Wu pondered. The boy understood that Nod was cruel to the manager and Lee, but they did not kill them. Just like in the past, Nod was doing justice now, and Song Wu understood that. The guy said that even Lee thought the development program was worthwhile. Kim raised his head in surprise. Kim directly asked Song Wu if he was going to join Nod, but Song Wu wasn't exactly sure. Kim thought that Song Wu was thinking about it because he cares about Aaron. Song Wu only thought about his team as a whole, and what they would have to do at a critical moment to gain an advantage. Kim did not miss the word critical, and Song Wu bit his tongue. The boy understood that he had said too much and had to partially share the plan with Yun, 
but he could not tell the whole truth. Remembering Lee's grudges about Song Wu, Hyun asked to be accepted into the team. Song Wu thought for a moment but understood that it would not be bad for him to have more allies in order to win. After considering everything, Song Wu accepted Hyun's request. Kim was beaming. Song Wu thought of Aaron in passing, hoping that he was able to find what Song Wu asked for. Unexpectedly, Aaron appeared and confirmed that he had succeeded in fulfilling Song Wu's request. The team went on a hike again with the dawn of a new day. Before the boys stood the ruins of an unknown place. Kim asked Aaron if he was sure he was able to find this woman. Song Wu took a closer look at the ruins and noticed a barrier that was able to hold back low ranked monsters but could have difficulties against mid ranked monsters. Song Wu understood that the people inside were only able to hold on because of one of the eight keys. Aaron wanted to go inside, but Song Wu stopped him to check something. Song Wu raised his hands and slowly began to approach the ruins. The guy wanted to check the zone protection system. Several arrows flew past the boy, but none of them hit. Song Wu understood that these were all just warning shots, so he wanted to really test what the defense system was capable of. The boy deflected all single arrows without problems. But Song Wu understood that this was not all that the system was capable of, so he decided to strike back accordingly. Song Wu turned to Aaron to fire some arrows. Aaron did not have time to properly pull the bow when suddenly a volley of arrows was fired at the boys from behind the wall. The team watched with wide eyes as the arrows were about to hit them. Hyun managed to cover his friends from a volley of arrows at the last moment. Song Wu hurried Aaron to load his weapon faster and fire back. Song Wu pointed at the helmeted guy but asked not to kill. Aaron shot an arrow and it hit the boy's helmet and easily removed it from his head. Song Wu pointed to the next target, and Aaron shot the second boy without delay, and the arrow flew between his legs. With a burning look, Aaron asked for permission to fire an explosive arrow at Song Wu. Song Wu only hoped that Aaron wouldn't hurt anyone. Aaron shot an arrow and it flew high up. The arrow flew over the heads of the enemies and forced them to hide. The boy's eyes were burning with delight. Song Wu noticed the resemblance between Aaron and Min, and before the boy saw him he breathed a sigh of relief, thankful that Aaron was on his side. Enemies began to flee, realizing that a group of metahumans was against them. Aaron was somewhat indignant at such an assumption by strangers. Now the friends were free to go behind the fence. When the team was inside, they were met by a group of strange people. A middle-aged woman was walking ahead, but she was not dressed like a warrior. Although the woman didn't introduce herself, she immediately apologized for giving Song Wu's team such a rude reception. Song Wu also apologized for having to use force. Without further objections, the woman promised to prepare a place for the guests to rest. The woman turned and went to lead Song Wu's team to their resting place. Song Wu obediently followed the woman. Looking around, the boy saw only tired, silent faces of people. Song Wu was surprised at this picture because even in such a place, life should be more stable. The woman led the team into the room and placed modest guests in front of the guests. The boys looked around warily. The woman finally introduced herself. Young In Suk was Yok Sangil's supervisor. The woman asked about what issue Song Wu came to see her about. Siong Wu immediately got down to business and told Miss Young that he was looking for a meta human named Kim Gi Wool. The woman's hands began to shake. She did not understand how the strangers found out about her. Song Wu only told the woman in a serious tone that they were from Nodu and already knew about everything. In addition, every metahuman had to go through registration. The woman became even more nervous. Song Wu noticed the woman's reaction and continued to press without stopping. After placing a whole bag of kernels in front of the woman, Song Wu admitted that he would like to recruit Jiul. Mrs. Chong could not understand the boy's thoughts because the amount offered to her was even more than she expected, but it was not about the price. Giovel led the only combat unit in this place. Without her, this shelter will be doomed. Song Wu rushed to comfort Jung. The guy just wanted to test the girl's skills and make a note of them. Mrs. Jung promised to talk to Gyul about it as soon as she got back. The woman bowed down and begged not to take the girl by force. Song Wu promised that it wouldn't happen. Finding themselves alone, the boys were finally able to breathe a sigh of relief. Acting like a boss was a real challenge for Song Wu. A warm atmosphere prevailed in the room. 
Although the woman took Song Wu's offered kernels without objection, the boys hoped that Miss Jong would not resist. Aaron was sure that everything would go smoothly. The team was treated to alcohol. The boys took turns pouring drinks into their cups, but Song Wu suddenly became suspicious because alcohol was a rarity even for the city. Sung Wu abruptly knocked the cup out of Hyun's hand and yelled for them not to touch the liquid. Aaron and Kim looked at Xiong Wu in surprise because they thought there was poison. Song Wu was quick to report that there was no poison in the cups, but it was the blood of a garg demonic beast that looked like a dog. The blood of this monster had the effect of alcohol intoxication. Blood could be filtered like alcohol, but it was not possible to drink it in the same way as regular alcohol, because long-term consumption of blood accumulated poison in the body, which eventually became fatal. Song Wu now understood what exactly was suspicious about this shelter. Song Wu was sure that the barely alive people that Song Wu met in the shelter must be drinking this drink. Song Wu wondered whose idea it was to bring such a drink to the asylum. A strange noise outside the door brought the boy out of his thoughts. Song Wu thought that Aaron and Kim had returned. Opening the door, Song Wu did not see either Aaron or Zion. A very angry girl stood before him, Kim Gyul. Giovul had a sinister look. Song Wu was sure that this girl would easily beat him if he did something wrong. Gyul found out that Song Wu was looking for her and offered to go out. Memories of his past life engulfed Song Wu. The boy was glad to see the girl alive. In the past, she was the best melee fighter who lived and died as a soldier of Nodu. Song Wu and Gyul stood facing each other. Many people gathered on the street and formed a circle, as if they were in an arena. Jian Wu found Song Wu pretty cute in this life, albeit more wild. Huel was angry that Song Wu was looking at her for so long and smiling. The girl bent down and prepared to attack. If Song Wu lost, he should have left the shelter. Song Wu just shrugged innocently. The boy wanted the girl to listen to him first, but Gyeong Wu was confident of her victory, so she did not consider it necessary to conduct a dialogue. Gyul easily released her energy and started to move like lightning at Song Wu. The boy prepared to repel the blow and concentrating the energy in his hand, made a ball out of it and shot it at the girl. The girl fell to the ground and never got up. A dead silence reigned around. Aaron suddenly realized that he shouldn't falter in front of Song Wu. The fight was over. Aaron couldn't understand why Song Wu would do all this, unless he wanted to take Gyul by force. But Song Wu was sure that showing off his strength was the best proof. Song Wu confronted the team with the fact that they would be staying in the shelter for a certain amount of time. The boy wanted to go hunting with Gyovul. Aaron was very surprised, but Hyun accepted the idea. Hyun knew that if they took the only metahuman out of the shelter, the people inside would die quickly. Aaron remembered how his loved ones died and, without saying a word, left the room. Song Wu remembered the words of the manager who had once informed the boy that the shelter where Jewel was staying would soon be destroyed. There was nothing Song Wu could do for shelter except to give time. The next morning, a small group of people gathered to fight off the monsters. Gyeong Wu was among them. A man was at the head of the group and was instructing. The man was suddenly cut off by Song Wu. The boy corrected the man, saying that although the demonic insects were vulnerable to fire, the killer bees that lived in the ruins were not. But there was another problem, because one bee was equal to the 17th rank in strength, and ordinary people were forbidden to hunt such bees. Song Wu asked the guide to step back. Yovel suddenly spoke. The girl could not allow the monsters to take over their territory. Song Wu suggested that the girl go hunting with him alone. People wanted to riot, but Gyeong Wu quickly calmed everyone down. The girl didn't really like Song Wu's idea either, but she understood that he was right and didn't want to risk people's lives. Song Wu smiled with satisfaction that he had managed to convince the girl. Gyeovul was still very angry with the boy, and without looking at him quickly stepped first. Gyul knew why Song Wu had come to her shelter, but she wasn't going to go anywhere with him. However, Song Wu did not insist. Song Wu only wanted information as payment. The girl looked sideways at him. The team continued to move on. Song Wu briefly told the girl how to fight against the bees and warned her to avoid getting hit, because even a meta-human would die if she was stung more than three times. 
Huel asks what will happen after defeating the monsters, and Song Wu mentions alcohol and tells people to bring water. The girl stopped abruptly. Song Wu explained that when the bees are drowned, the poison that will come out of them is almost like real alcohol, and within three months the poison will only weaken. It was worth the wait. Giovul only laughed nervously. Song Wu looked at her suspiciously but said nothing. For some time, the team walked in silence. The team reached its destination. A strange picture appeared before Song Wu and Gyul. Killer bees have turned the entire ruins into their swarm. Song Wu and Gyul quickly ran to the monster's hollow and hid among the ledges. Song Wu raised his head and noticed that only two bees were guarding their home. Xiong Wu told Haya Wu his plan and retreated away. Thanks to the knowledge from his past life, the boy used the enhanced moonlight sword skill and destroyed most of the hive in one fell swoop. Huel peeked out from behind Song Wu with an admiring look. Song Wu was somewhat disappointed because he didn't say the name of the spell with the necessary sincerity. A loud noise woke up all the bees and they started crawling out of the destroyed shelter. The bees buzzed loudly trying to stun the uninvited guests. Song Wu and Guel covered their ears in pain. The entire bee army gathered together and flew high into the sky. The team was preparing for a battle where everyone was on their own. Song Wu wanted the girl to demonstrate her skills. And although the girl did not yet have all the skills she knew in her past life, Song Wu never ceased to be amazed at her talents. Jovul released the energy of the Golden Core, which took the form of a lioness. Giovul screamed loudly and flew up, meeting the enemies, sweeping away everyone in her path. Bees tried to sting the girl, but she blocked the blows without any problems. Song Wu just stared at Gyul, standing on the ground as she destroyed her enemies one by one. The boy looked at her skills and thought that Gyul was roughly equal in rank to Leader Li. Song Wu turned to the other side, leaving that part to Gyul. Song Wu also mercilessly defeated the monsters one by one, but the feeling that something was wrong did not leave the boy. Sleep In the released skill, tentacles and enemies hit instantly but the boy regretted it almost immediately because it consumed too much of his energy, which he could not afford right now. Having partially recovered his spent energy, Song Wu thought that in order to regain the glory of his past life, he needed to increase his internal energy, but there was no time to think about it now. Damaging his energy, Song Wu continued to kill the monsters one by one, though he regretted it. Song Wu suddenly heard Gyul's voice and was distracted for a moment. Jovul was lying on the ground barely fighting off the bee, but it had already managed to sting the girl in the leg. Song Wu immediately ran to help her. The bee cut off the bee with one blow, but the stinger was still attached to the leg. The girl could feel the poison slowly spreading through her body. Song Wu reproachfully looked at Gyul and scolded him for his imprudence, because this action could have left the girl without a leg. Jovul sarcastically thanked for the information. Song Wu thought that maybe this was the reason why his anxiety was growing, because Jewel was still far from the skills of her past life. Song Wu asked if she knew how to use her inner energy. Song Wu briefly told Gyul how to use the energy. Gyovul's face was crooked from incomprehension. Time was short, so the mana girl quickly used energy to remove the poison from her body, while Song Wu covered Gyul and quickly got down to business. And although Huel didn't really understand what Song Wu told her about, she did as Song Wu told her. Giovul continued to use her energy while maintaining her skill. The wound began to tighten and the poison to evaporate, but the girl felt a strong, burning pain. But Xiong Wu understood that he could not be angry with Haya Wu for this imprudence because she, in relation to Xiong Wu, did not get any experience from her past life. Song Wu understood that Giovul needed training. Song Wu saw that Yul still needed protection, because the girl was still in the healing stage. The boy thought about using the tentacles to destroy more of the enemies. But Song Wu understood that the tentacle skill would take most of his energy, and he still didn't know when the queen bee might attack. But there was no time to think about it. The crowd of monsters was already flying towards Song Wu. To protect himself and Yul, Song Wu used the skill of unknown power but all the bees instantly dissolved from the bright flash. Song Wu lowered his blade and leaned on it. The guy was breathing hard because he had spent a lot of energy. 
According to his calculations, he had about 45% left, but this was not enough against the queen. High Wool, unexpectedly even for herself, praised Song Wu. The boy approached Hai Wool and looked at her wound. Song Wu was amazed that the girl was doing quite well for her first time. Song Wu stood up and turned towards the hive to find the queen bee. The guy left Gevil outside and told her to concentrate on the treatment. Song Wu went inside the hive and, releasing a bit of energy, lit his way and at the same time wanted to make sure that there was no one left inside. Song Wu sped up and quickly ran through the rest of the hive and ended up in a lighted square. Song Wu stopped abruptly. The queen bee was lying in front of the boy. The queen immediately followed Song Wu and rising a little above the ground, began to send an echo that should have stunned the boy, but he covered himself with a shield. Using the power of the crescent sword, Song Wu directed the skill at the queen, and in an instant she exploded like a ball, scattering the eggs that were inside her around. Right after that, Song Wu released his energy and burned all the eggs lying around. Song Wu slowly approached the dead enemy and cut open the belly and began to extract the cores. But ordinary kernels no longer interested the boy. Digging deeper, Song Wu eventually found the core of the queen bee. The core, which looked like a diamond, glowed with a bright golden color. But Song Wu did not want to exchange this treasure. Instead, he concentrated and extracted all of the core's power, regenerating his own instead. Having finally dealt with all the enemies, Song Wu managed to save Yoksangul's shelter for a certain time, as Gyul herself thought about it. But thanks to his memory from his past life, Song Wu knew when and how the shelter in Yoksangul was to meet its end. Song Wu's heart became very heavy, but the boy could not back down. Gyul leaned on Song Wu and slowly walked home with him. The girl felt a little humiliated, but Song Wu felt the same about himself because his body parameters did not match the experience. Huel suddenly became very embarrassed and asked Song Wu if he would not mind splitting the core's 50 fiftieths, but Song Wu let her take them all because he only needed information. But the girl did not understand what information Song Wu wanted to hear from her and that she rarely left the shelter. Song Wu only wanted to know the real reason why Gyul didn't want to leave Yon Sagol. When the team finally returned to the shelter, Haya Wool suddenly invited Xiong Wu into her home. The boy was somewhat surprised by such an unexpected invitation. Entering the middle, Song Wu was surprised by the darkness. Having led Sun Yu a little further, Gyovil approached the bed, from which an unpleasant smell could be felt. Throwing away the blanket, Jival revealed the true reason why she could not leave the shelter. Under the blanket was an ugly creature, the younger brother Giovul, who became a zombie and was addicted to dog blood. The girl understood that taking care of her brother was her duty. Song Wu could not understand the intentions of a girl who wanted to give up her future for the sake of taking responsibility for her family. However, this was not the reason. Giovul was to blame not only for what happened to her brother, but also for the rest of the residents of the shelter, because she was the one who brought the dog blood alcohol into the shelter. Song Wu could not be found with an answer. Song Wu sat at the table under the light of a single lamp that barely illuminated the documents that the boy was holding. Xiong Wu reread all the information his manager had left him regarding Jewel. According to the documents, it was known that in her past life, Giovul was the only survivor after an attack by demonic beasts. The girl was seriously injured, but was saved by Nod. Song Wu continued reading. After her sudden recovery, Giovul joined Nod's military forces. Song Wu tried to remember something else by digging into his memories, but it was all in vain. Judging from what Song Wu saw in the battle against the bees, Jewel had rebooted to a state of a novice who does not know how to use her abilities. Song Wu's task was not an easy one, because Sina, Lexi, and Minnie were under Nodu's supervision, and Gyul needed special training. Song Wu put the papers away and leaned back in his chair. Song Wu understood that he would not succeed without joining Nod. The thoughts in Song Wu's voice were suddenly interrupted by Aaron and Hyun, who returned after completing the task. Shaking off the snow, Aaron wanted to report on his task, but Song Wu interrupted him for a planned meeting. Aaron was comforted that they would finally call Gevil. Song Wu did not share the boy's joy very much because in the near future, Yaxigal was to become a place of slaughter. 
Arin and Hyun looked at Sung Woo in shock. Song Wu said that the orc should arrive here in four days, but the boy did not want to reveal where he got this information from. Song Wu already knew that the horde of orcs, with the number of several dozen people, which will pass through the seventh and eighth zones, will soon find themselves in the shelter. There will also be a rank three orc king. The team understood that they would not win the battle against a level three monster. Hyon also noticed that 30% of the shelter's residents are infected with dog blood, so this place will soon disappear by itself. Hyun still thought that if Gyul saw that there was no hope of saving the asylum, she would eventually agree to go with the team, but Song Wu quickly dashed Kim's hopes. Hyun started to drop his hands. He didn't know what to do anymore. Song Wu invited everyone to the table to explain his plan of action. After the conversation, there was a little silence. Song Wu offered to avoid the fight and save Gyul. Hyun was somewhat shocked by this. Aran offered to evacuate the residents of the shelter to another area and to ask Gyovel to go with the team. But this was a mistaken idea, because the shelter was located outside of Nod's possessions. Moreover, the inhabitants of Yoksangol were addicted to dog blood. Song Wu tried to reassure Kim that they would not be able to stand against the orcs. Song Wu only wanted to choose the lesser of two evils, but Kim did not want to sacrifice other people's lives for their plan. Hyun poured salt into Xiong Wu's wound, saying that such actions are more suitable for Nod. Song Wu sank because he understood that it was true, but after the return of his memories, he was overcome by a sense of duty. Song Wu's way of thinking had also changed a lot, but Song Wu still tried to think differently than Nod. However, in the plan to destroy the demonic beasts, Jiu Wu played an important role. Song Wu only asked Hyun to trust him. Kim only thought for a moment but finally agreed to help Song Wu in everything. After listening to the end, Aran asked Song Wu what his role was in the plan. Song Wu was depressingly silent and invited Aran for a private conversation. The boys were standing on the street and snow was constantly falling around them. Aran stood alone on the street, his heart aching. This was the extreme point that Aran had reached with Song Wu. Song Wu wanted Aran to leave the shelter before the orcs arrived. Aran could barely hold back his tears. Song Wu's confession that he had accepted the offer to join Nodu struck the boy deeply. Mini and Sina were also accepted. Song Wu knew Aran's fear of being useless because he was a simple person. Song Wu understood that he was the one who inflicted the strongest wound on Aran, but the boy only wanted to protect Aran. Aran returned to the room, but the boy did not say a word but went to his bed in silence. Song Wu averted his gaze, not daring to look at Aran, realizing how painful it was now. Song Wu woke up early and opened his eyes to look around the room. Aran was nowhere to be found, and Song Wu realized with regret that he had left the shelter. In his thoughts, Song Wu sincerely wanted only one thing, that the boy would survive. Suddenly, Song Wu heard a loud noise and jumped out of bed. Hyun was already waiting for Song Wu on the roof, looking at something through binoculars. When Song Wu went up to the roof, Hyun quickly handed him the binoculars so that the boy could see everything for himself. Song Wu began to look carefully. Song Wu saw a horde of orcs slowly advancing on the shelter. There was alarm in Yoksangol. The man rang the bell loudly, trying to warn the residents about the invasion. In her home, Giovul tied her brother to the bed more tightly so that he would behave more quietly until the trouble passed. Outside, someone was desperately calling Giovul for help. When Giovul came out, the entire shelter was already engulfed in flames and destruction. People ran everywhere trying to save their lives. Giovul began to ask the local guide about the situation. Everyone who could was on the defensive, but the girl understood that if Nod did not intervene, then they had no chance. Gunnel sent a guide to help Miss Jong while she went to defend the east wall. All this time, Hyun watched over the girl, hiding behind the wall. The girl jumped up on the wall and looked down. Outside, chaos reigned in full swing and the enemies were getting closer. Song Wu and Hyun, meanwhile, were preparing to execute the plan. Hyun sincerely hoped that Aran had managed to bypass the orcs and make it safely to the 17th zone. Song Wu hoped deep in his soul that Aran would wake up. Song Wu gave Hyun a vial of a lethal insect-type pheromone. 
Song Wu told Kim to spray the pheromone every ten minutes so his enemies wouldn't notice him. Song Wu continued to monitor the situation in the shelter. All who remained to defend themselves perished in groups. Mrs. Chong was badly injured. Song Wu gritted his teeth, but he couldn't help it. The walkie-talkie crackled, and Haiyan informed Xiong Wu that Gyul was single-handedly holding back the orcs, and her part of the shelter was still somehow holding. But all the other sides had fallen. Gevil killed the orcs one by one. The girl moved like lightning, not paying attention to anything. The girl jumped off the wall right into the middle of the group of orcs. One of the orcs hit the girl hard, but Gevil managed to block the blow. The orc pressed the girl with all his might and pushed her into the ground. Jevil looked up and saw the orc king in front of her. Haiyan reported this to Song Wu. The boy jumped off the wall with all his might and rushed to Haiul's aid. Song Wu understood that meeting the orc king was the worst case scenario. Gevil, meanwhile, tried to confront the orc king. The girl wanted to strike, but the orc was faster and hit Gevil. The girl flew away, punching through the walls. Javul did not have the strength to get up. The energy slowly began to dissipate. With the help of strengthening his legs, Song Wu almost flew past the shelter, begging to himself that Jewel would hold on for just a minute. Jiovul lay leaning against the stones. The girl could barely look up and saw the orc king in front of her, who was slowly approaching the girl to finish what he had started. The orc had already swung his weapon to finish off Gyovul, but Hyon suddenly jumped out and blocked the blow. Hyon understood that he had done something very wrong, because he should not have allowed Gyul to meet the king of orcs. The original plan went a bit wrong, as Hyon was supposed to use a vial of pheromone to move inconspicuously between the orcs, and at a certain point bring out Gaiwal to avoid the king. Hyun only had to hold on for a minute. That's how much time Song Wu needed to get to them and somehow influence the situation. While Song Wu was flying, trying to get to Hyun and Gyul as quickly as possible. The guy has 45 seconds left. Haiyan, meanwhile, tried his best to repel the Orc King's blows. The Orc hit Haiyan hard and he flew away, finding himself in the very center of a group of Orcs. Haiyan looked at the King and realized that he was already barely able to stay on his feet. The King had already swung his weapon to finish off Haiyan. But Song Wu came to his comrade's aid in time and deflected the blow. The Orc King saw a new target in front of him and swung to strike the boy, but Song Wu pushed away from the enemy. Song Wu yelled at Hyun to take Gyul and run away. Not daring to linger any longer, Hyun quickly ran in the other direction. The Orc King wanted to run after them, but Song Wu did not let the Orc move. The Orc King looked at his opponent and muttered something. Song Wu moved away a little. An Orc Mage entered the stage behind the King. Song Wu already knew that the probability of encountering an orc mage was in every group, but this monster was very rare, so there was not much information about it. One thing Song Wu knew was that he was using telekinesis. The mage turned to the group of orcs and said something. A couple of orcs riding wolves jumped out of the group and raced to catch up with Hyuna and Gyul. Song Wu realized that the plan was starting to crack like a wall. The boy did not know that there would still be orc hunters in this group. Song Wu wanted to detain them, but the Orc King did not allow him to do so. The Orc King struck Sun Yu with a blow, but he dodged. The Orc only wanted to show that the opponent Song Wu was in front of him. The boy realized that he would not be able to help Hyun. Hyun, meanwhile, seemed to have run away to a sufficient distance from the shelter. Kim wanted to catch his breath. Hyun wanted to check if Gyul was okay. Suddenly, Hyun heard someone approaching them. Kim turned at the noise and saw two wolves. The boy tried hard to break away from his pursuers, but they quickly caught up with him. Hyun tried to think of the right way for him to act, but he understood that he could not enter the battle alone. One of the orcs had already swung to throw a spear at the boy. A quick explosion was heard, and one of the orc hunters was knocked over along with the animal. The second orc was also distracted, trying to find an invisible opponent. Hyun heard a familiar voice yelling at him not to stop and to keep running. Hyun raised his head to the roof and saw Aran. The boy prepared to fire another arrow. Meanwhile, Song Wu confronted the Orc King. The rest of the Orcs and the Mage himself gathered around, but, as expected, no one dared to interfere. Song Wu concentrated on the battles, but it was difficult for the boy. Song Wu struck to distract the King. While the orc was deflecting the magic blow, Song Wu quickly ran up to the king and injured his leg. 
But Song Wu himself set himself up by falling into the very clutches of an orc. The king squeezed the boy hard, almost breaking his ribs, and pressed him to the ground. Blood gushed from Song Wu's mouth. The orc king swung to deliver a vicious blow to Song Wu, but at the last moment the boy jumped out of the way. Song Wu was breathing heavily, trying to catch his breath. The boy dejectedly remarked that the blow he had given the king was of no importance to him. The orc mage suddenly started casting spells. Song Wu couldn't even think that any of the orcs would dare to interfere in the king's battle. The mage used telekinesis to lift up the whole house behind Song Wu. The boy quickly covered himself with a shield. But Song Wu suddenly realized that the mage was not aiming at him at all. Explosions were heard again. Aran managed to divert the attention of the orc hunters to himself. While the orcs were distracted, Hyon quickly broke away from them, continuing to run away. Aran did his best to hold back the orcs. One of the orcs wanted to run after Hyon, but Aran quickly knocked him down. Aran already stretched the bow to aim at the second orc, but the latter, noticing the boy on the roof, shouted something loudly while looking into the distance. Aran stopped, not understanding such an action. The orc fell silent, staring expectantly into the distance. Aran could not understand what was happening. Suddenly a huge shadow covered the boy, and Aran raised his head, seeing a house above him. The house fell on the boy. It seemed to simply crush him. Coughing up the dust, Aran barely restrained a scream from severe pain. His leg was broken. Aran could no longer stand up. Footsteps were heard behind the boy, and Aran turned his head to meet his doom. Aran understood that he would meet his death here, but he simply did not want to appear like that, wanting to take one of the orcs with him to the other world. In his mind, Aran asked Song Wu to look after Minnie. Song Wu was still fighting against the orc king. The king was not going to let Govel go, and for this he used not only his hunters, but also the mage. The boy nodded. Song Wu prepared to use a skill that he used for the first time, because even for Leader Li it was given with difficulty. The boy uttered a spell, and golden lightning swirled around the orc. The orc king looked at Song Wu in surprise. But the boy had not planned to use this skill against the king from the very beginning, instead getting rid of the annoying mage. With this spell, Song Wu raised his sensitivity in exchange for strength. The king shook slightly with anger and looked at the boy. Song Wu slowly approached the orc, swinging his blade. The orc king was furious after losing his mage. The monster furiously pounced on Song Wu, but the boy was ready for this by preparing to repel the blow. Song Wu quickly absorbed the cores, replenishing his energy. Looking at the Orc King, Song Wu realized that he was no longer interested in a simple battle and was seriously aiming to kill the boy. But the boy was no longer going to fight against the king. Song Wu bought enough time for Haiyan to break away from the horde. Song Wu used the explosive sword skill. Strong fire and smoke arose all around. Song Wu prepared to run away taking advantage of the fact that the orc king hadn't seen him yet. But suddenly an orc hand shot out from under the fire. The orc king squeezed the boy so hard that his spine began to crack, and Song Wu could clearly feel it. With a trembling hand, Song Wu brought the blade over the king and kissed him in the face, but the orc caught the weapon in his mouth. The king closed his mouth and Song Wu's blade shattered into small pieces in an instant, the king laughed out loud, but Song Wu did not want to give up. Song Wu aimed the broken blade at the orc, and it bit him again. This is exactly what Song Wu expected, as the blade carried concentrated energy. Song Wu used a shield, and it exploded. Song Wu managed to do enough damage to the king to let him go. There was a lot of dust around. Using the veil, Song Wu used one of the orcs and climbed high up. The orc king's mouth was wide open, but he tried to give an order to his army. The orcs aimed at Song Wu and started firing their bows, but the boy dodged the blows with his shield. One of the arrows managed to break through Song Wu's defense and hit the boy in the shoulder, piercing him through. Song Wu knew that his shield hadn't recovered yet, so it was weak. Song Wu saw only one way out of this situation. The boy concentrated the rest of his energy in the lower part of his body, which enabled him to break away from the horde. Song Wu followed Hyun's footsteps and reached the place where the battle against the orc hunters took place. Song Wu looked around and noticed traces of explosive arrows, which surprised him greatly. Song Wu walked a little further but stopped abruptly. A dead orc hunter lay before him. Song Wu thought it was Hyun's work and started calling him. Hyun answered the call and Song Wu quickly found him and Gyul. The girl was still lying unconscious because she had spent too much strength. 
Hyun was slightly wounded. Song Wu was glad that Hyun had managed to avoid being hit by the building that the orc mage had targeted, but Kim didn't understand what was going on. Suddenly, Hyun thought of Aran. Song Wu couldn't believe it, because he thought that Aran did as the boy asked. Song Wu jumped up and ran to find Aran. Song Wu ran to the place where the tracks of the orc hunters split. The boy carefully studied the tracks and followed one of them, begging for Aaron to be alive. Song Wu climbed to the top of the building where the wolf's paw prints led him. The boy looked around, but there was silence around, which was broken by the wind from time to time. Song Wu kept looking for Aaron. Even though it had little energy left, Song Wu calculated that it should be enough for one orc. A soft sound was heard behind Song Wu. Looking around, Song Wu saw a giant wolf in front of him, but his rider was nowhere to be found. Song Wu prepared for battle, but suddenly heard a strange voice. Someone was slowly approaching Song Wu from the darkness. The boy's familiar voice commanded the wolf, and it obediently turned to face Aaron. Song Wu couldn't believe it. Aaron woke up. Aaron began to tell about the very moment when, in the face of death itself, the boy managed to wake up. It all happened when Aaron took aim at the orc, but missed. Aaron's hand shook violently. He did not understand what was the matter because he should not have missed. The orc approached the boy and knocked the gun out of his hands. Aaron desperately tried to reach for his weapon, but the orc had already brought his weapon over him and pierced the boy's skin. Aaron screamed in pain. The orc turned away for a moment, glancing at Aaron. The boy turned his gaze to the orc and looked into his eyes, determined that he himself would not die. The boy's eyes lit up with green light. In an instant, Aaron's body glowed with a bright light. The boy felt a strong burning pain in his chest and could not understand the reason, because he was wounded in the shoulder. Surrounded by a strange glow, Aaron heard a strange voice in his head that wanted to help. Aaron stood holding his head, not understanding where this strange voice came from. Aaron realized that not only was he hearing a voice in his head, he was also beginning to understand what the orc was thinking. But Aaron could not understand whose voice he heard for the first time. Looking around for a moment, Aaron noticed a wolf staring at him intently. The wolf again began to send his thoughts into Aaron's head, offering him his help. The orc had already raised his spear to kill the boy, and Aaron let out a loud cry as he accepted the beast's help. When Aaron opened his eyes, he saw how the wolf attacked his master. While the wolf restrained the orc, Aaron quickly reached for the gun and shouted at the beast to retreat to the side. Aaron aimed his gun and shot the orc in the head. While Aaron was telling his story, Song Wu was meanwhile trying to heal the boy's wounds. Aaron gave a sharp cry of pain as Xiong Wu touched his broken leg. Song Wu thought about Aaron's awakening and realized that the boy's power was in subduing evil. Although the ability was one of the six main ones, it was the rarest of them. Song Wu congratulated Aaron on waking up. Song Wu understood that Aaron would be useful in battle even against named monsters with his ability. But Song Wu warned the boy that the training would be tough. Song Wu offered his hand to Aaron, hoping that he would accept it and join his plan. When Song Wu touched the boy's hand, he was very surprised, because he did not hear the same familiar voice. Song Wu was somewhat wary. Did the voice not work on some metahumans? Did Aaron still have an awakened ability? Song Wu pondered. Song Wu had already felt something similar to what he had just felt with Aaron. However, Song Wu had yet to meet that person in his current life, but the boy saw nothing in common between the two. Jiovul suddenly woke up as if from a terrible dream. The girl looked around and quickly ran outside. It was deep night outside. Gyovul looked back at the joyful voices she heard next to her. Song Wu stood silently looking into the distance, while Aaron and Hyon chatted happily about something. The girl thought that Song Wu and the team had left the shelter a long time ago and did not expect to see them around. Gyovul asked what kind of place it was. Song Wu reported that they were on Nodu's ship. When the girl finally calmed down, Song Wu invited her for a light conversation. Huel seemed to guess that Xiong Wu knew what was about to happen to the shelter, but the boy avoided answering. Xiong Wu tried to reassure Hia Wu that it wasn't her fault that she couldn't save the shelter, but his. The girl did not expect this at all. Song Wu didn't try to calm Gyul with his words, which comforted her a little. The guy tried to convince the girl to join his team. 
Jovul accepted the offer. The ship's captain interrupted Jewel and Song Wu's conversation and pointed to the island where Nod's headquarters in Korea were located. All of Song Wu's team gathered and bravely looked at the island, preparing to meet the tiger himself. Song Wu told everyone to be ready. Three months have passed since the past events. Song Wu stood on the shore looking at the setting sun. Sini quietly approached the boy and called Song Wu. Song Wu and Sini started the briefing. All members of the team listened carefully to their commander in the person of Song Wu. Without taking their eyes off Song Wu, the people who became his close friends looked at him. The plan for tonight was to clear the island of lizards. This should be the first real battle against monsters for the rookies who were part of the 304th team. Song Wu warned that this task was quite difficult because there were frequent fatalities. Gyul thought it was cruel, but Song Wu assured her that it was necessary to test their abilities. As Song Wu said, Nod believed that if the rookies couldn't handle normal monsters, then they had no place in a real battle. Song Wu approached the bunker, which was built even before the cataclysm, and from which the first of the named monsters appeared. All the rookies panicked a little, but Song Wu calmed them down. Today's challenge for newbies will be against other monsters, namely demonic mermaids of the 10th rank. It was expected that there would be quite a lot of enemies. Song Wu reminded all the newbies that they should be grateful to Nod for such tasks, because he had selected monsters for them that corresponded to their rank, also allowed to take trophies from monsters. Hyun raised his hand and asked a question about mermaids. Kim thought that it would be very difficult for them to fight against rank 10 monsters. Song Wu hastened to assure him that mermaids are much weaker on land. Aaron hastened to ask the next question. The boy was worried that there might be an S-rank monster inside the bunker, but Song Wu assured the boy that Nod got rid of it several years ago. Song Wu and Sini were the first to enter the cave and the boy noticed that the cave was quite wide. Sina understood that five people would be needed to keep order. Song Wu turned to the two rookies who could control the fire and ordered the boys to fire forward. The boys lit the way. Song Wu was the first to move, drawing the attention of the newcomers to be careful and inspect the walls and ceiling in search of insect monsters. The newcomers looked around carefully. Song Wu stopped abruptly and Seni came closer to find out what was the matter because she did not immediately notice that there was water in the cave. The girl was nervous because there was no information about this. Song Wu went into the water, assessing the situation. Returning to the team, Song Wu told the newcomers to strengthen their positions. Song Wu called two of the team and asked one if he could run across the water and assess the situation. The boys were somewhat frightened. Song Wu wanted the boys to go scouting to check the water level. If they noticed something strange, they should immediately inform him about it. Song Wu pointed to his arm, which had a bracelet hanging from it. The boys went on reconnaissance, disappearing into the deep darkness. Song Wu was a little worried about the fate of the team members. Song Wu turned to the others to be ready. A squealing sound was suddenly heard from Song Wu's bracelet. Sun Wu shouted orders for the boys to go back. A faint light from a flashlight was seen in the distance. The boys desperately tried to get back to the rest of the team, calling for help at the same time. Immediately after the boys, the water rushed quickly. Seni thought it was an ordinary wave, but Song Wu saw that a whole horde of mermaids was approaching. Song Wu split the team into separate groups. One boy ordered to set up a protective barrier, and the other to attack the mermaids who passed beyond the protection. The rest of the team had to cover the rear. Without further ado, everyone in the team prepared to carry out the leader's orders. The team concentrated and began to erect the shield. Monsters could no longer go inside. The monsters tried to break through the defense, but one by one they died barely touching the shield. The mermaids were not going to retreat and pressed even harder against the shield, trying to break through it. Song Wu saw that it was quite difficult for the newbies to maintain the power of the shield and tried to encourage them. The team tried their best to concentrate on maintaining the strength of the shield. But the team began to surrender positions and the shield slowly began to crack. Song Wu noticed this and shouted to the fifth group to prepare to fight off the mermaids. The team, which included Minnie and Aaron, prepared and targeted the monsters. At Song Wu's command, they shot flaming arrows together. The arrows went past the shield, hitting only the enemies. The next group also prepared to attack and fired a bunch of shots, killing the enemies. But the monsters eventually broke through the shield's defenses. 
Mermaids rushed inside attacking people. Giovul entered the battle, saving one of his team from certain death. The boy thanked Giovul for saving him, but the danger still continued. Song Wu ordered one of the groups to engage in battle. While the guys on the front lines were trying to restore the power of the shield, it was impossible to allow any of the mermaids to get inside. The team, led by Giovul, rushed into battle to protect those who restored the shield. One of the monsters managed to get inside, but Giovul easily destroyed the monster. Giovul killed all the mermaids who dared to go beyond the shield with unstoppable power. Song Wu looked at Giovul and couldn't stop marveling at the girl's incredible melee skills. Song Wu looked at Hyun, and even though Hyul had already reached the eighth rank of her strength, Hyun also raised his skills to be equal to the eleventh rank. Hyun took out his swords and prepared for battle. Song Wu knew that Hyun wasn't special, but even so, the boy was able to make up for it thanks to his rigorous training. Kim proved this without problems, sweeping all enemies from his path. Song Wu could see that it was still difficult for Hyun to get used to the fact that there was much more power and skills in his body, and he did not yet know how to use them well. But that time would come. Gyovul was already visibly tired. Looking up, the girl noticed that the mermaids did not want to give up, and their number did not decrease. For a certain time, they managed to protect the penetration of the shield. Gul turned her head and saw Xiang Wu talking to Aran dispassionately. This made the girl somewhat angry, and she made a remark to Song Wu because the rest of the team was already running out of strength. Xiang Wu slowly approached Hai Wu and patted her on the shoulder good-naturedly. The boy walked forward a little, and taking out his sword, prepared to enter the battle. Song Wu began to release energy by strengthening his body. Quickly moving individual groups to places, the boy ordered one of the groups to prepare for battle. Song Wu was already level with the team holding the defense and ordered them to lower their shield and retreat. The first group, along with Song Wu, prepared for the battle against the mermaids. While Song Wu was on the front lines protecting the rest of the team, Sini quickly went to all the wounded to tend to their wounds. An incredibly large number of mermaids gathered in front of Song Wu and his group. The monsters stood for some time preparing to attack. Song Wu stepped forward and pointed his sword at the mermaids. Behind him, Gyul and Hyun held their position. At one point, the mermaids all attacked Song Wu together. Song Wu soared upward and instantly killed the two mermaids. But the boy did not stop there and destroyed the enemies one by one. The mermaids could do nothing. It seemed that Song Wu did not feel the power of the enemies at all. He did not care how many mermaids were in front of him. Song Wu found himself in the thick of the monsters, but they all fell dead before him as one. Jewel and Hyun could only silently watch over Song Wu. Gyul didn't really understand Song Wu's words about protecting the backs. Song Wu gathered energy and used the moon sword skill. The whole crowd of mermaids was instantly wiped out, but the cave suddenly shook violently from such a force. Song Wu understood that he had to be more careful, otherwise the cave would simply collapse and everyone inside would end up underground. Song Wu tried to carefully release the energy. The cave shook even more and particles of earth fell on Gyul and Hyun's head. Song Wu noticed this and regretfully realized that he would not be able to use the explosive sword. Although the cave was quite large, Song Wu couldn't use his skills to their full potential, otherwise everything here would collapse. Song Wu understood that they needed to get out of the cave because there were so many enemies. Song Wu was suddenly alert. A voice was heard in his head and the boy could not understand for some time. Who spoke to him? Mermaids voiced. Song Wu continued to fight back. One of the monster's eyes lit up with a strange light. The mermaid began to slowly approach Song Wu, pushing the other monsters away. One of the monsters didn't like it very much and tried to attack his relative, but he bit his neck. A strange fight began among the mermaids. The monster's eyes glowed red. The mermaids were very angry, but they no longer paid attention to people. Meanwhile, the monsters arranged a bloody fight among themselves. The whole team just silently watched what was happening but no one could understand what was the matter. Gyul climbed onto Hyeon to get a better look at the situation. Song Wu turned and looked at the back rows of his team and searched for Aaron with his eyes. The boy stood behind, holding his head. Thanks to the ability, Aaron managed to capture the mermaid and arrange a massacre. Only Song Wu knew about the plan to capture the minds of the mermaids. Before entering the battle, 
Song Wu asked Aran to try to capture the mind of one of the monsters. This somewhat surprised Aran. Song Wu wanted Aran to test his control skills. If the boy could manage to do this, then his ability could be used to control named monsters in the future. Aran concentrated hard and continued to control the mermaid. Song Wu was happy that the plan had been successfully executed. As expected, the mermaids began to fight among themselves. Now was the best time to attack. While the mermaids were not paying attention to the humans, Song Wu raised his sword high and ordered everyone to join the battle. Song Wu was the first to charge at the monsters. Following him, the rest of the team began to exterminate the mermaids. In the near future, all the mermaids were destroyed. Song Wu let out a sigh of relief, but suddenly heard a noise behind him. Looking back, Song Wu noticed the last monster slowly passing in his direction. The mermaid's eyes glowed. Song Wu began to approach the monster. The mermaid was trying to say something, but Song Wu couldn't understand her. The boy raised his sword above his head and impaled the mermaid with a single movement. Aran suddenly shouted. Communication with the mermaid was lost. The boy clutched his heart and fell to his knees, breathing heavily. Sina heard Aran's cry and came to his aid. Still holding on to the affected spot, Aran reported this to Sini. Examining Aran, Sina did not see a single wound. Sun Wu, meanwhile, rallied the people and sent some to the defense to control the movement of the monsters. He sent others to collect the bodies of monsters. Everyone got to work. Song Wu came to Aran and informed him about the success of the mission. But Aran suddenly bent over, as if in great pain. Song Wu was very scared for his friend, even though Aran said that he would be fine. Song Wu became very worried about Aran's well-being. Song Wu thought that the boy's ability could be used against the named monsters, but the boy noticed that things were not that simple. Song Wu left Aran so that he could rest. Song Wu thought with great concern that if the death of the controlled monster was harming Aran himself, then it should be handled with care. The team led by Song Wu continued exploring the cave. Song Wu suddenly stopped looking at the strange sign. Xiong Wu suddenly asked Xiong if she had looked at the previous training records. The guy asked if Sina noticed anything strange in the recordings. But the girl relayed everything that was recorded. It was as if there was nothing strange. But Song Wu had never seen the records regarding the lair that was behind the boy. Song Wu concluded that the 60 mermaids they had killed was not yet the limit. There could be many more of them. Gyul and Hyun were alert. The team began to suspect something, because what Sina said was somewhat implausible. According to Sina, the cave they found was a place where monsters bred, but there was no evidence of this. It was also strange that the monsters were recorded to always return to the same place, despite the fact that their offspring might be in danger. Hyun eventually understood Song Wu's train of thought. The boy thought that the mermaids might not have come to this cave just for the purpose of breeding. Song Wu slightly illuminated the path that was shrouded in darkness. It seemed that there was something else that made the mermaids come to the same place every time. Song Wu didn't want to risk the lives of his men, so he quickly led everyone outside. At the first opportunity, the boy contacted the instructor of the training center via video link and reported on the situation. Olivia thought, the woman went through all possible scenarios and tried to understand where and who made a mistake. Olivia thought that the underground walkers might have returned and dug the tunnels. Olivia was brought out of her thoughts by son W. The boy asked about further action, but Olivia said that according to Nod's rules, he should have stayed put. Until the situation is resolved, otherwise the mission will fail. Sina approached Song Wu and asked about the situation. Song Wu said in a serious tone that they would most likely have to go back to the cave. While Song Wu was waiting for the instructor's answer, the helicopter sent by Nod was slowly approaching them. A helicopter landed and dropped off four people from Nod. Song Wu looked displeased at the trail of the helicopter flying away. It was almost impossible to find oil in the desert, and here is a whole helicopter. Song Wu extended his hand and greeted the new arrivals. The commander of the arriving team, Li Dong Min, shook hands with the boy. Lee also introduced his team. Song Wu looked at Lee's team and was very surprised at this division of forces, as most of them were melee fighters. Song Wu tried to be as friendly as possible. The boy introduced his team and said that the instructor had assigned them to provide rear support for Lee's team. Lee somewhat ignored what Song Wu said, but let the boy make up his mind about the help. 
Song Yu and the rest of the team didn't say anything, but they got the feeling that Lee was mocking them. Song Wu led Lee's team to an unknown tunnel that he and his team had found during the mission. Giovul was waiting for them on the spot. Lee's team began to carefully inspect the unknown place, and Song Wu thought that they were here for the first time. But Lee said that their training took place in this place even before the appearance of mermaids. The team continued to explore the cave, and Sakura noticed one strange thing. The passage through which they walked was artificially made, but it was not the work of a demonic worm. Examining the cave, Dix found something and hurried to report it. The man pointed to a sign hanging over the passage. Lee looked at her but couldn't read the writing. Sakura translated the inscription as first. Lee thought that this tunnel was dug during the occupation and then blocked. Sina noticed that the passage was no longer blocked, so someone had opened it again. Song Wu became wary. The two teams had long since lost contact with the outside world as they descended into the tunnel, and there was no connection with Nod. Someone suggested going upstairs to contact Nod HQ, but Lee dismissed the idea as a waste of time. They didn't have any information yet. Lee picked up a small rock and threw it deeper into the passage and listened, waiting for it to fall. Hearing the thump, Lee noticed that the stone flew about 100 meters unimpeded. Lee said that there was a risk, but they were ready to take it. Lee assumed further command. No one was against it. Lee was at the front of the procession, followed by his team. Song Wu and his men were the last to go. The further the teams advanced, the stronger the strange heat felt. Song Wu's team paused a little. Hyun didn't like it all. It was all too strange. The team moved on. Suddenly, Lee ran into something and abruptly stopped everyone. Looking around, Lee saw a human skull. Lee assumed from the condition of the skull that it was a worker from a bygone era. The teams moved on, leaving the skull and guesses about its appearance here far behind. Song Wu thought about the situation, which was getting weirder and weirder. The hot, thin air and darkness began to take a toll on everyone, making the teams more nervous. Song Wu suddenly realized that they would be in big trouble if they encountered a high-ranking monster here. The teams continued to move on. Suddenly, Lee noticed a huge gap in the ceiling. Lee offered to stop for a while to catch their breath and the teams almost died from fatigue. Song Wu was overcome with anxiety, and he drew a map in his head of the path they had already taken. Song Wu was also glad to rest a little and regain his strength. Lee sat down next to the boy and started a seemingly innocent dialogue. Anxiety did not want to leave the boy, but he hoped that anxiety was in vain. Lee wanted to somehow hurt Song Wu, but the boy did not succumb to the provocation. Lee somewhat appreciated Song Wu's concession. Song Wu stood up abruptly and listened. Lexi felt something too. The girl slowly walked past Lee and Song Wu and began to look into the distance. Song Wu stepped closer. It seemed that the boy also felt something strange. Sun Wu warned everyone. In a moment, Lee also felt something strange. When the man realized that it was magic, he jumped up and ordered his squad to get ready. Lee's team quickly took up arms. A voice was heard, and Song Wu recognized it easily. A horde of mermaids was approaching the two teams in a powerful wave, but they were much larger than the previous ones. Song Wu gritted his teeth, knowing that the battle would be more difficult. Song Wu took out his weapon and had already prepared for battle, but Li stopped him. Song Wu looked at the commander with an uncomprehending look, but Li only replied that these monsters were under the control of his team. Li began to emit incredibly powerful energy and everything around him was filled with it. Song Wu only took a couple of steps back. The mermaids were fast approaching and Li was the first to charge. Giving orders to his team, Li rushed at the enemies. The rest of his team immediately followed him. Li moved with lightning speed. The man quickly approached one of the enemies and waving his weapon cut him in half and ran away. Li's team destroyed the enemies one by one without any hindrance. They worked as a unit, striking again and again. Song Wu just looked at them with admiration. But one of Li's team stayed behind to protect Song Wu's team. The man said that while they were here, they couldn't let the rookie team get hurt. Although Song Wu appreciated Team Lee's noble concession, something bothered him. The boy fell silent and just continued to watch the battle. Lee's team didn't seem to have any problems so far. Looking at the battle, Guan thought for a moment and finally allowed Song Wu's team to enter the battle, 
on the condition that there was an urgent need to do so. Everyone in the team quickly agreed with him. Lee, Sakura, and Deeks continued their battle. Team Song Wu watching over them was greatly impressed by Team Lee's strength. Song Wu thought at first that the team was assembled incorrectly, but he was wrong. One of the monsters managed to fight off the horde and slowly began to crawl towards Song Wu. The boy turned his attention to the monster and prepared to strike, but Guan instantly killed the beast. The battle was over in a few minutes. Li held out his hand and exhaled softly. For him, this fight was a good stress reliever. Li looked up to see Song Wu and Hyun standing over the bodies of the dead mermaids. Li came up and asked what they were doing. Song Wu only replied that he needed it for the report. Li laughed at Song Wu's actions but knew that he was right. This is the first thing Nod taught Song Wu, so the boy was just following the rules. Li looked at the boy, impressed by his coolness. The teams again set out to inspect the caves. Song Wu was walking behind and casually gave Li's team an assessment of their strength. The boy was sure that these four were no less than the second and third ranks. And Li, and that first. Xiong Wu was pulled out of his thoughts by Haiyan. The boy was a bit worried, but now he could definitely see that Song Wu's plan to destroy the monsters was not a dream. However, Hyun didn't know his place among such strong people. Li again found something strange and called everyone to look. The teams went inside and were covered from head to toe in a golden glow. Li saw again that the cave was not at all like the ones they were in before, but this time the cave was natural. Fireflies circled around and Haiyan thought they were monsters. Song Wu quickly reassured Hyun and said that they were just insects that lived before the cataclysm. They had no idea of danger. But the danger was in the place where the fireflies were. Song Wu pondered. The boy drew attention to the fact that the rocks in this particular cave were different from those they encountered in the very first cave with the mermaids. The teams still didn't understand. Song Wu also noticed that fireflies are inhabitants of the Pacific Ocean, so they shouldn't be here. Song Wu was sure that this cave hid the power of another continent. Suddenly, Deeks's voice was heard. The boy found something and called everyone to take a look. When everyone raised their heads, the language seemed to be taken away. In front of the teams was an unknown creature of extremely gigantic dimensions covered as if in white armor. The monster seemed to be sleeping wrapped in the walls of the cave. Sakura thought it was the Mermaid King, but no one could say for sure what kind of creature it was. Lee was frightened by the thought that such a monster had been right under Nod's headquarters all this time. Lee already wanted to turn everyone outside and report on Nod's find. Song Wu stared at the monster in utter horror. The boy already knew who was standing in front of them. Regia, named Monster. Song Wu understood that they were in great danger. The boy ordered everyone to quickly hide in the rocks and be ready. The teams paused for a moment, not understanding what was happening. Song Wu's team ran to follow the leader's order, but Li's team was still standing there, not understanding the rush. Dust fell on Deeks's shoulder and he just shook it off without paying attention to anything else. Deeks looked up to see the creature's eyes begin to burn. The cave suddenly shook violently. The monster eventually woke up and tried to get out of his cell. Regia opened her ribs, revealing the monster's purple body. Regia released a tentacle and it headed towards Deeks. Song Wu quickly ran to Deeks in hopes of saving him. A tentacle grabbed Deeks and pulled him up. Song Wu didn't have time to catch him. Dixa wanted to put up a shield, but he didn't have time. Regia grabbed the man's leg and held it for some time without letting go. Lee looked at the monster and was very surprised when he realized that the chest was a mouth. Dixa tried to escape from captivity in Regia. With his hammer, Deeks hit the monster hard on the jaw, and the creature finally let go of the boy. Dixa fell to the ground without one leg. Lee saw that his comrade was very seriously injured and called Song Wu's team for help. Sina was already heading towards Dixie, but Song Wu stopped her. Song Wu ordered Sen to heal Dixa from a distance. Lee did not understand this behavior of Song Wu because the situation was critical. Song Wu didn't even look at Lee. Sina stopped and began to follow Song Wu's order. Lee was very angry because he was currently the leader of the two teams. Song Wu had to apologize, but there was no other way out. Sun. In the end, let them know that before them is not a simple monster, but Regia and S 
rank demonic beast with the ability to control the mind, which first appeared in New Zealand five years ago. In the past, only with the help of the OA organization was it possible to destroy this monster. Lee was very surprised to hear the name of the organization, because OA and Nod were enemies. Perhaps this is why Lee had never heard of such a monster as Regia, because it was under the jurisdiction of the AO. Lee did not understand how the newbie knew all this information. Song Wu was still expecting more blows from Ruja, but the demon was no longer moving. Song Wu didn't understand why the monster didn't attack anymore, but he saw this as a great opportunity to escape. But Lee saw that it was too late. Raja's eyes shone brightly again, but this time stronger than last time. Lee ordered his team to distract the monster while it attacked. Guan quickly began to obey the order and rushed at the monster, swinging his hammer at it. Regia turned his gaze to Guan. Before Guan could get close enough to the monster, Regia fired a deadly beam from his eyes and pierced Guan right through. The man fell dead to the ground. With panic in his voice, Li began to question what kind of monster it was. Song Wu realized that things were getting worse and worse, as even Rank 1 and Rank 2 hunters were beginning to worry. Song Wu could see that Li's team was already exhausted from the trek through these caves, so they couldn't even fight at half strength. Song Wu wrapped himself in a shield and ordered everyone to remain calm. A monster tentacle suddenly flew past Song Wu. Regia grabbed Guan's body and pulled him towards him. Li tried to get the situation under control. The hunter prepared for battle by releasing energy, but it was clear that Li was very worried. From that, everything fell into the abyss. Regia turned his head on Li and used his laser. Li stopped suddenly, and the next moment his upper part fell to the ground. The monster began to devour the bodies of the dead. It seemed as if the panic that had begun to reign among the last of Li's team was drawing the attention of Regia even more strongly. Sakura finally succumbed to fear and began to run for her life. Regia reacted to this noise. Death did not pass Sakura either. The laser passed through the girl and she fell down dead. Dixa was the last one left. Dixa screamed in shock and tried to move away from the monster, but he didn't have time to do anything. Regia also pierced him with a laser, cutting the poor man to pieces. Lee's team was completely finished. Lexi, Sina, and Hyun watched the situation in mute fear. Song Wu ordered the team to stay still and remain calm. Song Wu looked at the monster and couldn't understand why he was still alive, because Regia could have easily killed him too. There was another reason why Lee's team was the first to die. Song Wu began to quickly look around, trying to come up with a plan for the entire team to escape while avoiding the monster laser. Song Wu saw that Regia was distracted by devouring dead bodies. It seemed to the boy that this was the perfect moment to escape. Song Wu turned to the side and quickly ran, thinking that the monster would not notice him. Regia turned his head towards Song Wu and fired a laser. Song Wu managed to partially block the monster's blow with his shield, but it instantly collapsed and Song Wu was thrown back a couple of meters. Regia fired the laser at Song Wu again, and he managed to partially cover himself with a shield. The laser bounced off the shield and flew in the other direction. Song Wu took advantage of the monster's hold behind one of the stones. However, even the blow that Song Wu seemed to be able to parry caught the boy. Song Wu started coughing up blood. The boy understood that he would not be enough for a long time, but he understood that he had no right to make a mistake. Hyun noticed that Song Wu still got a little bit and wanted to approach the boy. But Song Wu refused, realizing that it could cost the boy his life. Song Wu spent 20% of his energy blocking Regia's lasers. The guy just said that they needed to hold out until that moment, until there is a good opportunity to escape. Hyun thought of putting up a shield and trying to escape under it. Song Wu looked around and realized that there was too much distance from the place where they were hiding to the exit. There were no other shelters. Hyun just sat on the ground weakly. Despair began to overtake the boy. Song Wu understood his team's emotional state, as this was their first encounter with such a monster. Not only that, Lee's team was killed so easily. Kim did not understand how Song Wu could remain so calm in a situation against an S-rank monster, which he also saw for the first time. But Song Wu only smiled sadly, because he had met them many times in his past life. Song Wu remembered how Regia appeared in his past life right under Nodu's headquarters, 
taking the lives of almost forty regular troops. At that moment, Song Wu was in the desert. Song Wu did not know at what exact moment history had turned its course of events. Perhaps the premature awakening of Regia provoked this campaign, but Song Wu knew for sure that everything depended on him now. Sina suddenly realized a strange situation. If Regia is S rank, shouldn't it have been destroyed five years ago in New Zealand? What was this monster doing in Korea? Song Wu noticed that Sina had asked the right questions. The boy told Sina to carefully look through the crack. The girl obeyed and saw a strange magic circle behind the monster. Magical ability was extremely rare, so even in Sina's training, she and the group only theoretically passed it, because none of her teammates had such an ability. The more Sina listened, the more it seemed to her that the magic was like something fabulous and unreal. Song Wu also thought so, because magic itself is the strangest of the other six abilities. Sina thought harder. The girl concluded that the only one who could carry a monster of such a high rank was also a rank no less. Song Wu liked this thought, but that was not all. Both Song Wu and Sina thought together that another organization that would have such powerful metahumans was the OA. Sina couldn't understand why another organization would seal a regia on another continent. Song Wu said that it was all just a guess and the OA could have done it by accident. Even though Nod and OA were almost enemies, handing over an S-rank monster was tantamount to declaring war. Sina thought that the monster should have been in the Pacific Ocean in the first place. Even an S-rank mage would not be able to accurately convey the coordinates when transporting something as bulky as Regia. In short, the address was wrong. A cheerful atmosphere reigned for a moment. The team laughed at the suggestion that the OA mages might have made a mistake with the delivery. Suddenly there was a noise and Song Wu saw Regia start to break the magic circle that was holding him back. It was necessary to act immediately because as soon as Regia will be able to walk, there will be no more blind spots. Song Wu needed to find Regia's weak spot and quickly. Song Wu noticed Regia grab a part of the body and begin to swallow. The boy thought that this was the perfect moment to attack. Song Wu came out of cover and took aim. The guy shot an arrow with a core and it flew straight into Regia's mouth. There was an explosion, but it only drew the monster's unwanted attention. It seemed that Regia was indifferent to this primitive attempt to attack. The monster just got angry. Regia quickly shot a laser at Song Wu and he managed to jump back at the last moment. But the laser still caught Song Wu's hand. The boy hid behind a rock again, breathing heavily. It seemed that the wound was quite serious. Sini wanted to heal Song Wu's hand, but he stopped her so that the girl would not waste her energy. They still needed to get out of this place alive. Lexi let out a soft breath and pointed to the wall behind Song Wu. After the laser hit, there was now a huge gaping hole. This was their chance. Song Wu approached the exit and looked at it carefully. The team looked like they thought Song Wu was going to leave them. Song Wu thought that his appearance at that moment was exactly like this. Song Wu turned back and leaned closer to the stone. The boy told the team to get ready to run while he distracted Regia. Song Wu took out his sword and prepared for battle. Song Wu instantly jumped out of his hiding place and flew high into the air. After casting the Moonblade spell, Song Wu directed it at Regia. Regia was distracted for a moment, watching the skill that flew straight at him. Song Wu noticed this and shouted to the team to quickly run to the exit. Everyone instantly jumped up. Regia deflected Song Wu's blow with his laser. The laser missed the skill and headed straight for Song Wu, but the boy managed to avoid the impact by using his lower body enhancement. Song Wu noticed that the power of Regia's lasers were getting stronger and stronger. At this rate, the cave will soon collapse completely. Song Wu turned his gaze back to the exit to make sure the team had managed to escape. Song Wu saw the team in the passage and was surprised to see them standing still. Hyun shouted at the top of his voice that it was now their turn to distract Ria so Xiong Wu could join them. Song Wu felt strange feelings, but understood that it was time for the team to escape. Song Wu used the explosive sword skill and single-handedly closed the passage. The boy understood that his team would not be able to do anything against such a monster as Regia. Song Wu turned around. The cave began to rain even harder and Song Wu thought it was because of his skill. Regia suddenly screamed and Song Wu hid, covering his ears. 
Song Wu listened and realized that the cry was similar to the cry of mermaids. Song Wu now knew how to manipulate mermaids. But if Regia continues to scream like this, soon all the mermaids will rush to Song Wu. Song Wu understood that he was in great danger. The boy noticed that Regia continued to devour what remains of Li's team. Regia regained his strength by absorbing human bodies. Song Wu now understood why Regia didn't aim his lasers at them while they were hiding behind the rocks. For so many years in prison, Regia lost a lot of energy. As soon as Regia regains her energy, she will definitely destroy the seal to break free. There was little time for sleep, and it was necessary to run now. Song Wu paused for a moment. The boy realized that the monster became stronger by absorbing other people. Song Wu had a similar ability. In a past life, Song Wu absorbed the abilities of metahumans. Song Wu decided to try to turn the tide of the battle. The boy gathered his strength to try to steal power from Regia. Song Wu used the power of the absorption skill and began to extract energy from the monster. Regia, it seemed, did not expect this, but this greatly angered the monster. Regia aimed a laser at Song Wu, but Song Wu managed to bounce back. Song Wu hid behind a rock and realized to his disappointment that the skill didn't work on the monsters. Regia targeted the last body left behind by Li's team. Song Wu had to restrain Regia at all costs, otherwise the monster would be completely freed from the seal. Song Wu prepared to strike, waiting for the perfect moment to attack. When Regia grabbed Sakura's body, Song Wu quickly rushed into battle. Song Wu managed to cut off Regia's tentacle. The monster screamed in surprise and anger. Song Wu quickly hid behind a rock. Regia took aim with the laser, and this time he managed to break through the stone behind which Song Wu was hiding. The guy managed to cover himself with a shield because the laser was already at full power. Song Wu looked at the exit of the cave, but it was very far away. Regia will not let him escape so easily. Song Wu concentrated and scanned the cave to find the best way out. Song Wu prepared to run away. The guy has about 40% energy left, so he needs to use his shield and leg boost as carefully as possible now. Regia aimed a laser at Song Wu, and he dodged the first blow without wasting much energy. Song Wu continued to run. On the way, Song Wu noticed the first turn that he found out about while scanning the cave. The boy ducked and ran even faster. Regia fired a second laser, and Song Wu covered himself with a shield. The laser aimed at Song Wu's back and hit the boy hard, even though the boy was covered by a shield. The shield disappeared instantly. 25% energy left. Song Wu continued to run. Song Wu saw the second twist. Song Wu was sure that the laser wouldn't be able to get him anymore. The only thing Song Wu was afraid of was the explosion. And the explosion happened. Song Wu's team had already managed to run away from the Regia cave. There was a noise behind Haiyan, and the red eyes of the mermaids began to glow in the darkness. The cave began to shake even more strongly as if from an earthquake. The team started moving faster through the tunnels. Suddenly, a crowd of mermaids burst out of the wall. Sina went ahead of the team, but a terrible picture opened up in front of the girl. The passage was divided into three exits. The girl did not know which of them was true. The mermaids were getting closer and closer. Hyun stopped abruptly and prepared for battle. Sina tried to convince the boy to keep running, but he was determined to take the fight here. There were at least twenty mermaids. Hyun couldn't back down knowing that Song Wu was risking his life for them right now. The boy couldn't afford to give up the slack. Sina also decided to stay. Hyun fought with all his strength. Using his skills, Kim managed to overcome enemies one by one. But distracted for a moment, one of the mermaids caught Hyun and inflicted several wounds. Hyun killed the monster that had wounded him, and Sina quickly healed his wounds. Hyun was amazed by the girl's strength, because she had already healed the boy more than once. A large group of mermaids pounced on Hyun again. Kim tried to cover himself with a shield, but it was too weak. Hyun understood that he had little strength left. Sina was also visibly tired and the girl had very little energy left. She realized this when she noticed that Hyuna's wounds took longer to heal. Sina suddenly felt someone's hand touch her. Sina felt a new surge of strength. Hyun noticed that his wounds began to heal even faster than before. Lexi began to approach the boy. Hyun used the shield and was very surprised when it was back to its former strength. Hyun felt Lexi's hands on his back. The girl used her power and restored all the energy to the boy. 
Hyun charged into the battle again with renewed vigor. The guy instantly scattered all the enemies around. Hyun killed enemies uncontrollably. Sina suddenly realized that Hyun didn't just get his powers back. He also got a boost. Sina began to guess Lexi's true power. Sina walked up to Lexi and gave her a hand. Lexi gratefully accepted it and rose to her feet. Sina began to remember Lexi's true power. Lexi could not only relate the strengths of her colleagues, but also enhance their skills at the expense of her energy. Now Sina understood why the girl was moving so little and talking. Sina remembered how she once asked Song Wu about Lexi, and he was strangely silent. But that didn't mean that he wasn't interested in her power, more that Song Wu appreciated her ability. Senya suddenly wondered what was going on between Lexi and Song Wu, that he didn't want to talk about the girl. And what was Song Wu really hiding? Haiyan swung his swords one last time and let out a sigh of relief as he lowered them. The last mermaids were finished. Sen and Lexi slowly approached Hyun. Everything was fine with the team. The walls of the cave shook with new force and this time stronger than previous times. Hyung looked around and realized that Song Wu was still fighting Regia. When Regira's laser almost hit Song Wu and exploded, the boy managed to make a big jump with his last strength and jump as far away from the explosion as possible. Song Wu continued to run, but the earthquake only intensified. The ceiling above the boy's head suddenly began to collapse and huge stones began to fall directly on Song Wu. Hyun noticed that the ceiling of the cave was about to collapse. The boy shouted to the girls to be careful, but it was too late. Stones began to fall on the girls. Hyun ran toward Sana and Lexi and tried to use a shield to parry them from the blows. But Lexi realized that she would not be able to dodge the stones because she had spent too much energy. With the last of her strength, Lexi pushed Sina away from the rockfall, saving her life. Sina tried to grab Lexi's hand to take her with her, but she didn't have time. Hyun caught Sina and quickly shielded both of them. Sina tried to help Lexi, but Hyun held her, preventing her from falling under the collapse. The earthquake stopped, and the stones stopped falling. There was a lot of dust around. In the place where Lexi was recently standing, now there was a whole pile of stones.